Joseph Knox was one of the most prolific and well-known serial killers on the planet. A person considered so demented and manic that even trying to reason with him was believed to be a waste of time. A man so far gone that he seemingly didn't deserve any pity even on his deathbed. So why? Why would a man like him receive a second chance? And why did the world around him seem so familiar? What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to a remastered version of one of my earliest series, What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as a Blind Natural Sage Samurai? Part 1 Like, Share and Comment on the Video Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. It was a sunny day in Florida. A perfect day to go out on the beach, a perfect day to have fun with your friends. A perfect day to do whatever you wanted. But not everyone enjoyed that freedom. There were people that had no choice but to sit in a dark room, contemplating their lives. Joseph Knox was one of them. And he wasn't there by choice. No, he had finally been caught. From a young age, he had always loved to see how other living beings bled, to see the light get snuffed out from their eyes. It was a strange thing, and he knew that it wasn't right. But the rush he felt whenever a little bird fell from its nest, or the calmness of mind he gained from seeing rabbits being hunted down by hawks. It was cathartic. His parents could have been described as uninvolved, as they had abandoned him not long after his birth. He was an orphan, and no one truly wanted to give him a home. Maybe it was due to his gaze that sometimes managed to creep out most of the people near him. Or maybe it was simply the vibe he gave off, which made people behave strangely around him. But a foster house wasn't all that bad. No one cared about him, and he cared about no one else besides himself. That was how he was brought up. And day after day, his desires grew, more and more out of control. There was no one there to help him deal with that, he had no one near him that could understand his thoughts. So, at some point, he stopped holding back. Like most killers, the need to escalate his actions became more and more pronounced as time passed. His usual vices no longer being enough to satisfy his mind. He went from killing small animals to killing slightly larger animals. It wasn't difficult, and it wasn't hard to get away with it. Then he eventually upgraded to humans, whenever even that couldn't quite scratch the itch. He went on a killing spree that completely shocked the world. Starting small, but ending up. Not quite as small, some would even say that he went global. Traveling all around the world and killing a lot of politicians, he always aimed high, not satisfied with just killing prostitutes or regular people although he did kill plenty of those as well. No, he wanted to kill people that could make a difference in the world. For a few years, he was believed to be the deadliest assassin in the world, known in the underworld simply as Joseph. He never bothered hiding his identity, as he had never bothered living a normal life after he flew off the handle. He spent most of his time in the lawless zones of the world, traveling undercover and even getting cosmetic surgery a few times. Although he was simply called Joseph, people had another name for him. His epithet that he earned after killing so many people and escaping so many times. The Faceless Ghost. He worked with such efficiency that he only needed weeks to do something that would otherwise take months for an entire assassin organization. But that was because he never cared about cleanup, he didn't care about witnesses, he simply took his shot, or slit a throat, and left. No one could stop him, and Joseph was racking up bounty after bounty, with little to no regard for his own safety. He was a rabid dog, biting at everything that he could and ripping apart as many people as possible. But, in the end, his recklessness caught up to him. He decided to take a mission with a few people he had worked with in the past, others that could roll like him. But, he had made too many enemies with his reputation and his lack of secrecy. Turns out, there was an even larger bounty on his head than the reward of the mission they were doing. Joseph was a bit shocked at first, but he never really cared much about his own safety. Even when changing his face, he only did it for convenience, to keep his spree going for longer. Even when he was caught by the police as he was bleeding out in an alleyway, with knives sticking out of him in numerous places, and with the corpses of his teammates surrounding him, he didn't care. In the end, he was linked to some of his crimes, it was impossible to link him to all of them, but even the ones that were linked to him were enough to make the case blow up worldwide. As one might have guessed, the fact that Joseph was relatively handsome, made him gain quite a following, as many serial killers did. But Joseph didn't really care for the fan letters he received, he simply felt tired. 
and a bit weirded out by a few of the letters he received. Seriously, some of the people writing me should probably also be in a cell. He hardly understood why the guards even gave him those letters. Still, he wasn't exactly dissatisfied with his capture, even when being led to his execution. Joseph was also given a last meal. He only asked for a Big Mac and some fries. A regular meal, for a regular day. After all, life wasn't something so precious, that he'd make a big fuss about losing his. After taking so many lives, he had finally had his fill. He felt content. He had seen the worst and the best of humanity, for someone like him, there was no better ending. He had always known that his crimes would catch up to him. But sitting in the electric chair, while surrounded on all sides by armed security certainly wasn't what he had envisioned. Even while restrained, Joseph was still considered extremely dangerous, as he had ripped out a policeman's throat with his teeth while he was under custody and cuffed. So extra precautions were taken. To the policemen in the room, it was a stressful process, they all detested the man sitting on the electric chair, and they just hoped he'd die faster. To Joseph though, it was just strange, staring death in the face while feeling so many cold gazes on him. In a sense, he felt a sense of regret as the policemen were preparing for his execution. Have I really lived this life? Did I truly throw away everything in order to give in to my desires? What could I have become, in this life, had I stuck to a stronger set of morals? Joseph looked at the light bulb hanging over his head with a strange smile. What's the use in thinking about that now? Someone like me simply was never meant for this world. He looked back at the ground as he heard the policemen finish their preparations. And, with that, without any more courtesy, and without any other formality. The policeman in charge simply pulled the lever. Joseph looked at the one-way window that spectators were supposed to be behind. He was able to see his reflection without any issue, only slightly obstructed by his overgrown black hair. The next thing Joseph felt was pain, he felt as if he was being burnt alive, but he couldn't move. Out of reflex, he struggled against the restraints placed on him. He managed to break the restraints from one of his wrists after putting enough effort into it. But it was already too late. Joseph could feel his heart stop as the officers around him also prepared a firing line, just in case. He simply looked at the ground for a bit, blood dripping out of his mouth and eyes. It was a painful few seconds for Joseph, but it wasn't anything he wasn't used to already. And with that, Joseph Knox was pronounced dead. Executed by electric chair. Joseph didn't know what to expect when he opened his eyes again. The fact that he could open or feel them was about what he expected though. In the first place, he didn't think that opening his eyes would even be a possibility, why was he even conscious? Executions were usually the permanent type of change in life. At least that was what Joseph thought. But, this was also somewhat within his expectations, as he tried once more to open his eyes, only to not see anything at all. It wasn't difficult to realize that he had no eyes to open. In complete darkness, he could only make out sounds around him. It felt odd, but he could hear talking. Humans around him were talking, they seemed to be speaking. Is that? Japanese? Joseph was able to recognize it rather easily. He was proficient in many languages, as his adventure had him strung around the world repeatedly. He wasn't prone to spending a long time on his missions, but he had multiple missions in some countries, and Japan happened to be one of them. Now, Joseph wasn't exactly fluent in that language, but he could still understand what was being said, to some extent. We can't, twins, we have to, adoption. Joseph could hear a male voice speaking out with a rather cold tone. The woman wasn't any warmer in her way of speaking. Yes, this child, blind, can't raise. Joseph, at this point, was able to put the pieces together. Wherever he was, he was now a child. He couldn't speak, only releasing small cries when attempting. And he also couldn't see most likely born with a birth defect of some kind. It was also rather easy to tell from what he could pick up in the conversation of his parents, that he wasn't about to be accepted in a loving family. How or why he was now an infant, hardly mattered. Still, Joseph didn't know what to make of the situation at all. He was simply flabbergasted as he waited around and tried to gain his bearings. The world around him wasn't waiting though, as he was eventually carried away and given into adoption. On a mountain. Joseph was rather frustrated at that point, being helpless wasn't something that he was excited about. Especially the situation he found himself in now, not being able to do anything other than scream and cry, as he felt the cold around him slowly erode his small body. It wasn't hard to guess that he was somewhere on a snowy mountain, the worst type of mountain to abandon a baby on. Joseph almost found it amusing, as his second life was about to end just as quickly as it began. It didn't even feel to him like a full hour had passed between him coming to consciousness and being thrown in the wild. He didn't quite know what to do at this point. So he only resigned himself to his fate, believing that he wasn't deserving of anything more. 
That was when he heard it. It was faint, in the distance, he could hear it. Footsteps, the sound of marching men, most likely soldiers by their rhythmic and determined strides. There was also the smell of blood, one that he was very familiar with. Joseph could feel the vibrations of their footsteps, he couldn't quite locate them though. So he decided to do the only thing he could do at the moment. He started screaming and crying as loud as his little lungs could allow him to. In truth, Joseph didn't expect much to happen. If anything, he hoped the men would just put him out of his misery. After all, if not even his parents wanted to be burdened with him, a group of soldiers would certainly not want him there. But that wasn't exactly quite what happened. The group of runaway samurai were scared to shit when they heard a child crying in the distance. They were simply looking for shelter, having just done something irreversible. They were deserters, not samurai and brave warriors like their forefathers had been. They had shamed their lineage. Thrown mud on their family names, all of that for refusing to die. They had just fled from a battle, running away was completely against their code, and they knew that returning home would only get them executed. So they planned to simply become mountain nomads. Still, deserters or not, they were samurai at heart, they weren't the type of men that could simply ignore a child's cry. They approached the sounds with caution, as they were afraid of it being a shinobi trick that they had heard so much about. Shinobi didn't interfere with the land of iron, but there were exceptions, and the group of runaway ronin weren't going to start testing faith. Eventually, they reached the source of that sound. Looking down, the ten of them could see it. A small child crying on the snowy ground. The child was not even wearing a blanket, it was simply unceremoniously thrown out there. The deserters didn't know what to even say when seeing that. One of them quickly acted, picking up the child and using his vest to cover it. To them, the life of such a young child was sacred, many of them had families that they needed to protect at home, and they would likely never be able to return to those families, but the notion of killing a child in such a brutal way simply made them gag. It wasn't uncommon in their culture for a family to abort unwanted children in this way though. Still, they weren't pleased with what they saw. To see such a sacred thing tarnished made all of the people present angry. Especially when seeing that the child's limbs were frostbitten. They had quite literally gotten there in the nick of time. Were they even four or five minutes late, the child would have definitely died. All of the men acted quickly, they knew they didn't have the time to build any type of shelter, so they rushed toward a small cave and built a fire somewhat close to the entrance. They quickly started clothing the child with whatever they could, as they holed up from the cold night in that small cave. The former samurai had no idea what to do though. They couldn't simply leave the child in the mountains, as they weren't willing to let an infant die. But they also couldn't return to a city and give him for adoption properly, as they were wanted men by now, and they'd be hunted down everywhere they went. In the end, the group of men decided to just keep the child. They knew that it was going to be rough, they knew that this decision could cause a lot of trouble. But they knew that, at the end of the day, they were making the right choice. Simply hearing the child's satisfied laughter filled them with more warmth than the campfire they had just made. And so, their minds were set. They were going to raise that child to become a great man. And, for Joseph, this was the first time in his life he had ever received help from others. And he was not the ungrateful type, he wasn't going to throw away the chance to live that he had just received. Maybe this life, I can turn it around. Maybe I don't have to spend my whole life running away. With that thought, he let his small body rest, as the former samurai around him did their best to maintain the fire and keep him warm. So, his new life in the mountains started. POV Joseph. The years flew by as I grew up. It didn't take me long to realize that I am not exactly in a modern time. The people that saved me are all samurai, deserters to be exact. At first, I wasn't sure where I am exactly. But after listening to some conversations, I heard names like Shinobi and Kage being dropped. It reminded me of a Japanese cartoon I used to watch when I was in the orphanage. About a kid that dreamed of becoming the Hokage. At first, I thought it was absurd, but that would explain the energy I can feel in my body, and around me. I don't know how, but I was reborn in this world. I don't know where exactly, but it's certainly not in any major city. Shinobi are also not common around these parts. From what I was able to pick up, this country's military only consists of samurai. I am now thankfully able to speak Japanese perfectly, I picked up whatever words I didn't know during the years. My benefactors also did their best to teach me how to talk. It was rather clumsy, but they tried nonetheless, and it did help me in the end. In the end, I even received a name. They decided to call me Kiyoshi Ken, which would literally translate to Silent Blade. I think I'll go with that name from now on, purely out of respect for my saviors. They took inspiration from the fact that I didn't really cry at all as a child, not even when starving for several days. That instance was rather common, although my benefactors did their best, it wasn't all that easy for them. 
I don't blame them at all though, they were the ones that gave me a second chance at life. I don't know where I would have ended up if I died again, maybe I would have just gone to hell as I deserve. These men, although not innocent angels, gave their best to protect me and preserve my life. Maybe they are, in some way, trying to repent for their sins through me as well? Regardless, the ten deserting samurai that adopted me all went through so many hardships. Four of them passed away in these five grueling years. The first one to pass away, and someone that I learned the name of later, was Nakata Isamu. He passed away because he wrapped me in his winter clothing. A cold of all things got to him, whatever medicine they had, they used it all on me. The warmth of the fire wasn't enough to cure his ailment. They couldn't afford to go to a settlement, as they'd get hunted down and killed. In the end, Isamu told them to shut the fuck up and let him die. From what the others said, the man went out with a smile. The other three were brothers. They only went by Ryu, Juro and Ken. They passed away in quick succession, as a group of samurai had managed to find our hideout. Since my saviors were deserters, they were simply treated as criminals. The three brothers were the ones to hold back the samurai, while the rest of us fled. Well, I was still a baby, so I was carried. The fact that they had to die made me rather angry, but there was simply nothing I could do as a baby. Now, I've grown quite a bit. I am around 1 meter, 3.2 feet, in height, and I have been doing my best to train my body ever since I could walk around. Well, as much as one can train as a baby. Which is not much, but I at least gained some coordination faster as I got used to my body. As described by Daisuke, the leader of the deserter group that took me in, my appearance is extremely strange. Jarring even, some people would be terrified if they aren't prepared to see it. I have long spiky black hair, that's not the scary part though, obviously. Thing is, it's not that I am blind. I am actually missing the upper half of my face completely. Anything above my mouth is gone, only appearing as swirls of flesh apparently. At least my nostrils are intact. One of the samurai that had some knowledge in medicine did try to see if my eyes were covered by patches of skin. A birth defect that was possible, and they thought slash hoped that they'd be able to help me if that was the case. But he only ended up discovering that my skull doesn't even have eye sockets at all. Which makes me feel a bit strange. How much radiation was my mother in this world exposed to for me to end up like this? Well, it was enough to fry her brain and destroy any sense of morals she might have had. I didn't let that discourage me though. Even without eyesight, my other senses seemed to be able to make up for that. Smell, hearing, even feeling vibrations through the earth. Although I can't see, and I won't ever be able to see, I am able to use my enhanced senses to make up for that. It took actual years of training and acclimating, but now I am able to feel whenever people are nearby. It's odd, but it's likely due to this strange energy inside me. I thought it was chakra, as that was what I remembered being used in the show. But it wasn't as simple as that. Koji, the doctor, was able to confirm that my chakra networks are different than usual, but he wasn't able to tell me much more than that. Apparently, we'd need a diagnosis from a much more skilled medic Nin to be able to tell what is actually going on with my body. But, even without that, I can sense what is inside my body. After feeling around a bit more, there seem to be two different energies always present in my body. I assume one of them is chakra. But what is the other one supposed to be? I never paid much attention to important things when I watched that show. I was just a small kid, and I only watched a bit, barely even remembering the names of the main characters. That doesn't matter anymore though. I can pretty much ignore that show, for now, I can focus on survival first, and worry about everything else later. Now, I have reached an adequate enough age to actually start training my body. There is still some baby fat on me, but I can start somewhat developing some strength. Currently, we are just sitting in a wooden hut, built in the middle of the thick forest. Daisuke and Koji are the only two people present for now, the others are out hunting. It won't be easy to convince either of them to train me, but I do need to try to persuade them. Daisuke, Denten. I could sense the leader turn his head towards me in surprise. I guess I don't talk a lot. What's wrong Ken? He asked as he patted the snow off his lap. He just came from outside, we're still in a land that seems to have an everlasting winter. I want to become strong. I tried my best to sound as serious as possible, but that is extremely hard to do with a child's voice. I can't really sense Daisuke's expression, but I'd guess it would be looking a bit confused right now. Um. I don't know if that's a good idea. Where did this come from anyway? He asked, the confusion in his tone is rather evident, I can also feel the change in his heartbeat, indicating that he is panicking a bit. I guess it makes sense, I am still blind, and they probably don't want me fighting in the future. Teaching me how to fight, would be like putting me in danger to them. At least at first sight. Daisuke, one day I will grow up. And in this world, for people like us, living peacefully isn't a choice. I need your help. 
please. I said, bowing my head in his general direction. I've never been against doing things like this. Pride has never meant anything to me anyway. I am also a child now, there is no shame in bowing to someone that took it upon himself to raise me after I was abandoned and left for dead. I could hear Daisuke's breathing become a bit slower, I guess he needs a few seconds to think about it. It might be a bit strange to hear this type of talk from a five-year-old, but they haven't exactly raised me to think like a regular child. They raised me teaching me that the world isn't a kind place, preparing me for the worst. I guess he just didn't think I'd ask to be trained so soon. To be fair, they did try at first. To raise me like a regular child. But the deaths of Ryu, Juro and Ken made them realize that innocence would only get me killed in the future. Especially with my constitution. Still, I get why he's hesitating so much. Not being raised as a naive child and learning to fight are two different things. Very well. Daisuke ended up saying, gaining an odd look from Koji. Can't exactly tell, but I could feel Koji turning his head towards him, so I'm just assuming here. We start tomorrow. I will teach you to the best of my ability. I could feel him nodding his head to Koji just like that, I now have a sparring partner. POV narration, Daisuke didn't quite know what to make of the child they had been raising. For all the five years the child had been alive, Daisuke had never seen him actually cry, besides the time they had found him in the snow. So many months passed by with them doing their best to look after the child, it was strange how easily they got attached to him, but it also made sense. Kiyoshi Ken, the small child, was part of their group. He became one the second they decided to pick him up. Currently, they had nothing left in the world, no one left besides each other. That child, much like them, had nowhere to go, no one to turn to. Without them, the child would have been nothing more than another slowly decomposing corpse in the winter wilderness. Daisuke had spent many nights pondering what would have happened had they not saved Kiyoshi. Would they even have the motivation to survive for as long as they did? In the beginning, they were all defeated by the prospect that they'd never see their loved ones again. Daisuke was also one such example. If they returned, they would be executed. Their families were most likely disassociating from them, in order to avoid punishment, so returning might even put them in danger too. So, all they had now was the bonds they built with each other. Currently, Daisuke stood in the middle of a clearing with a stick, teaching a small Kiyoshi a proper stance. Surprisingly, Ken seemed to at least be a bit of a natural when it came to holding a blade. At least to Daisuke. To Ken, he was just getting used to holding a blade again. It wasn't his first time. He was no master, but he wasn't exactly a novice either. He hadn't exactly been sword fighting opponents in his past life, but he was somewhat familiar with executions and had used small blades consistently throughout his career. But he had never had a proper teacher, all of what he knew was found out through trial and error. Now he had Daisuke, giving some semblance of balance to a style that would otherwise only shape up to be wild and bloodthirsty. Daisuke was genuinely shocked, although Ken was weak in body, he seemed to be an extremely fast learner. His lack of sight didn't seem to bother him either, as he slashed away at falling leaves with frightful precision. The only thing that was lacking currently was speed. There was no way for a small child to showcase speed impressive enough to make Daisuke astonished though. Ken's current blade moved at a speed that Daisuke could track with his trained gaze, but it also seemed to whiz a bit in the wind. The more time passed, the faster Ken seemed to get, and the more leaves he seemed to be able to hit with his wooden stick. This training went on for a few months, the other samurai also noticed how determined Ken was. So they all imparted parts of their respective styles to him. There were no such things as secret styles among them, they were all family, and what they had they shared. The sword training then shifted from Ken hitting falling leaves, to Ken sparring with Daisuke or whoever was available. The adults were obviously going easy on the blind child. At least at first. But by the time Ken turned six, they had no choice but to block his strikes in earnest. At this point, it was rather obvious that Ken could see. Everyone could tell that his sight was likely related to chakra. So they also started trying to teach him how to use it in fights. They thought him a few chakra control exercises, which Ken was able to complete perfectly in very minimal time. Constantly controlling and feeling the energies inside of him since birth had gifted him with a huge advantage when it came to controlling said energies. At this point, the samurai realized that they had a prodigy on their hands. They had no idea just how major their child's accomplishments were, as they were merely samurai. But most children at Ken's age could barely sense their chakra, very few could control it, let alone perfectly. Ken didn't have anywhere to learn jutsu from though, he simply learned the samurai ways. And a samurai's main ability, and their most powerful, was infusing their blades with chakra. After realizing that the small child could already almost perfectly control chakra, Daisuke was quick to try and teach Ken how to perform chakra flow. 
They didn't have any way of finding out what type of chakra Ken had, but they would as soon as Ken managed to perform it properly. Chakra flow usually required one to know such things, but they simply had no way of gaining those types of training supplied out in the mountains. And, regardless, they bet on the fact that Ken was a prodigy, that the small child would manage to forge his own path. And, the very first day Ken reached the age of seven years old, was the first time he managed to infuse chakra into his blade. His small tanto sparked with lightning, and a blue coat seemed to cover the edge of the blade perfectly. From this, Daisuke was able to tell that Ken had a lightning attribute, that much was obvious, but he also had the wind attribute, that one was a bit less obvious, but a trained eye could tell. Ken was excited when he had finally achieved the state of chakra flow, he quickly rushed to the nearest tree, the tanto in his hand seemed to be completely covered by a blade of chakra. With a single swipe, Ken was able to cut the tree in half instantly. The wood was cut cleanly, to the point where the wood felt smooth to the palm when Ken touched it. It was around that time that Daisuke and the others realized that they didn't have much else to teach Ken. He had learned everything too quickly. Two years was all that it took for him to come to that point. It made them feel a bit inadequate. But they had never been especially powerful, they were mere soldiers, cannon fodder born to die and be buried in mass. At least Ken had demonstrated that his talent put him above the rest. The samurai were confident that he would be able to handle himself in the future, but there would still be some time before little Ken would develop an interest in the real world. Until then, at least the samurai could rest easy. Even if some of them were rather salty about the fact that Ken could already beat them in a spar. POV narration, Ken was sitting in the common room, his katana resting on his legs as he sat cross-legged. The rags he wore were ripped in many places, now that his body was somewhat bigger, he was also given pieces of red samurai armor, which he put on underneath his tattered rags. Ken slowly got up, deciding on his activities for the day and also starting to look around their camp for a bit. After walking around the forest, he drew a large map on the ground near the front door of the main building of their hideout, using his senses to draw the tracks and openings that he could feel around him. Daisuke noticed him doing so rather quickly. Ken! What's all of this about? The older samurai was rather confused by Ken's decision to randomly start drawing on the ground. I've mapped our surroundings, I'm just drawing it into the dirt for now. Ken said as he continued dragging the hilt of his katana on the ground while humming in a low voice. Daisuke stopped a bit, blinking a few times as he tried to question himself why the only blind person in the group was suddenly interested in drawing maps. Is there really a need for this? I mean, we are likely just going to move at some point anyway. Daisuke rolled his eyes a bit, still looking at the drawings on the ground with a bit of interest. Are we really going to find a better place than this? I don't think so. I think it's time we settled in one place permanently. Patrols don't come this far into the mountains anyway. Ken spoke without holding much back. They were currently using an abandoned shrine as a base, its walls needed repairing, and it could use some roofing, but Daisuke had made it their temporal base. Many were rather excited about not sleeping in leaf tents and small cabins for once. So Ken decided to start planning out a way to turn the shrine into a permanent home for their wandering group. I get your point, but Ken, we really can't afford to get caught by them. Even if they don't travel this far out, they might spot our hunter's tracks, which will lead them to us eventually. Daisuke's concerns weren't exactly baseless, as that had happened a few times in the past, each time they were forced to flee. There are ways to avoid detection. With a map, we can start planning out routes for our hunters to take. We need to establish proper boundaries, and with some luck, we won't have any invaders anytime soon. Ken continued to scribble on the ground until it became a clear image, one that he couldn't quite see but could feel. Daisuke was rather surprised at the detail in Ken's map, it seemed to take into account every crevice of the mountain range, it was as if Ken had been living there his whole life. But Daisuke knew that such a thing wasn't possible, they had only found the shrine a few weeks back, so all that exploring was done in a rather short time frame. Daisuke looked a bit at the child in front of him. Who had now turned his gazeless face towards him in an odd manner. Ken waited a bit for Daisuke's reaction. Until finally. Fine. Don't give me those eyes. Ken smiled a bit at that joke, grinning as his sharp teeth glinted in the sunlight. Joking about Ken's situation was something that only Daisuke did, and Ken only found it amusing, as he knew it wasn't in poor taste or ill-intentioned. We'll give this a shot, but we must also have escape routes prepared. Just in case. Daisuke relented in the end, giving Ken's idea a chance. The first thing the two of them decided to do was to draw out some paths for the hunters to take back to camp. The designated hunters were Juru, Isamu, Fumio and Arida. All of them were trained rather extensively and knew their way around a forest. 
Still, sometimes it was simply difficult to hide their tracks due to different circumstances, like being caught up in storms or patrols attacking them. Ken and Daisuke were quick to draw up different territories for hunting, with each hunting territory having at least two different retreat paths in case of emergency. Where the hunter group split up and led the pursuers through a planned array of traps and pitfalls that they would need to set up beforehand. The hunting group would eventually meet up again, after which they were to circle around the place for a bit, before heading directly to a pre-planned decoy base, which they also needed to build. After that, they were to come to the shrine, the actual home. Ken already had planned to build a few different decoy bases throughout the mountain. This plan was bound to make hunting a bit more laborious, but they were a group of former samurai, they knew how to deal with complicated tasks. All of them needed exact coordinates at all times, so Daisuke planned to give each of them a copy of that map to keep with them. The plan itself would take a lot of construction work and trap laying, but they were thankfully not a lazy bunch. Ken had also already started planning to repair the old shrine into a more livable place. By the time the hunters got back to base that night, Daisuke had already managed to draw the maps for their new hunting routes. But their jobs were far from done, the hunters seemed rather excited at the prospect of having a permanent home, so they quickly got to work designing different traps and sharpening sticks. Ken also went off to build a decoy camp. At this point, he was big slash strong enough that the samurai mostly let him do whatever he wanted. And so, their group now had plenty of work to do for the following months. But this time they were building something different. Not a temporary shelter from wind and rain. No, they were finally planning to build an actual home. Something that all of them, even Ken had been longing for a long time. Their sweat was spilt as the seasons changed. Slowly but surely, the paths they were taking days were filled with traps, all leading to dozens of decoy bases all around the mountain range and even beyond. It was an intricate web that spanned as long as possible. And the shrine became the heart of it all. All of them gathered there at night after a hard day at work and shared more and more stories. Ken told them of his trips in the forests, of how the birds sometimes landed on his head as he was meditating on tree branches. Daisuke told them of how he once had to cut up a wolf pack while carrying wood for one of the decoy strongholds. Juru, the physically strongest of the group told them of how he was once forced to wrestle a bear in order to protect the meat he had hunted. Isamu and Fumio were mostly together at all times, most of their stories consisted of dunking on patrols and laughing their asses off while running their pursuers in mazes of traps. Arida had a few stories of getting caught in the nets they had set up. He had always been the less dexterous one among them. Koji, the doctor, unfortunately, didn't have many interesting stories, he mostly kept to himself actually. But he did smile a lot when hearing everyone else speak so openly. It was seemingly enough for him to just listen. He was one of the people that didn't leave the shrine much, only gathering herbs nearby from time to time. He handled making medicine and had rebuilt most of the shrine by himself. He also handled most of the cooking. Everyone cleaned their own shit though, all of them were men and no one had any fun cleaning another man's garments. Even Ken cleaned his own clothes, as the samurai wanted him to grow up to be responsible. Just like that, with their blood, sweat and tears, they had finally built a home. A place where they could return and rest. Ken was satisfied, finally having a place he could call his own, with people that cared about him and that he could call family. But the world he was in wasn't a peaceful one. How long would his happiness last, I wonder? The months flew by quickly, with the samurai and Ken all doing their best to survive in their new environment. Although at this point, they were not just surviving, they were thriving. They were the kings of that mountain range. Slowly but surely, they had received a name from patrols within the land of iron. They were known as the Mountain Hyenas. The hunting group was well known for leading patrols into traps in the area, they were called the Hyenas due to their propensity to laugh at their pursuers from a distance. A few of the decoys had been raided, but nothing major had happened, and Daisuke was just able to build a few more to replace them. The paths that the hunters took through the mountains also constantly changed, Ken, spent some time making more traps for their retreating paths. The authorities were not any closer to finding the shrine as they were when they started hunting them though. The shrine was a lot deeper inside the mountain than the decoys and hunting paths were. So their home was relatively safe. Daisuke had scolded the four hunters a few times for their careless attitudes. Getting a reputation was not exactly a good thing for them after all. But it was already done, so there was nothing they could do about it, besides be more careful in the future. The hunts became more and more restrained, as the attention they received also started dying down. During this time, Koji was also able to slip into one of the cities. Enough time had passed for him to be mostly forgotten, he looked completely different to the posters they had of him anyway. It certainly helped that he had never left the base to hunt. This was mostly Daisuke's plan though. 
to have at least someone capable of going into a city and sometimes buying supplies slash spices. Returning to the shrine was done through the same paths that the hunters took, just for added precaution. And, when Ken's eighth birthday came, Koji brought Ken a gift, not one that he had bought, but one that he had made. It was a wooden mask, painted white with a red dot in the center of the face. It was reminiscent of what Sumumbu from the Shinobi villages wore, but this one didn't have any eye holes. He also had managed to acquire the three beginning jutsus that most ninja villages practiced. This was bought off a peddler, and he gave them all to Ken on his birthday. One can guess that Ken was rather pumped with the gifts he received, he especially appreciated the mask, as he now could finally cut off the bangs that he had always been using to hide his deformed face. Unfortunately, it seemed that none of the jutsus were all that useful for Ken. He couldn't use transformation or clones, as he found it difficult to envision how other people looked. He could tell some features with his senses, but details such as clothes and even facial expressions were impossible. The substitution jutsu also required one to use an optical illusion, which once again, Ken turned out to be unable to do. It was rather tragic, but Ken just decided he'd stick to his swords for now. In the first place, Koji had to read him the techniques and teach him the hand signs. As Ken had no chance of understanding a book. His written Japanese was nowhere near his spoken one, and he also couldn't feel the words on a printed book. In the end, Ken ended his birthday with a smile on his face. Even if the techniques turned out to be a bust, the effort was certainly there, and Ken knew that the samurai had likely spent a good portion of their savings on him. So he started planning out a gift to give the other samurai, as thanks for all of the hard work they had put into raising him. The gift he thought about was also a meaningful one. Ken planned to quickly start building a small memorial for all of the people in their group that had fallen. He didn't even wait more than a few more days before deciding to gather all of the materials needed to build a small altar. He hid them somewhere near camp and proceeded to go on with his plan. He wanted this to be a surprise to everyone, so he pretended to be sick, pretending to have a sickness that would he require some herbs from a bit farther away from the shrine. Kenji had read him some medicine books that he had kept around when he had been little. And Ken's memory was extremely good, so all he had to do was imitate some symptoms from that. The herbs weren't far enough for any patrols to appear, but far enough that it would give him enough time to build the memorial place unobstructed. So, Koji and the hunters formed an expedition. Ken needed a bit more to convince Daisuke to go with them, the leader was obviously a bit suspicious, but he ended up going with the herb gathering team as well. He was happy after finally having the entire shrine to himself, so he quickly started building the memorial place using the materials he had gathered and hidden beforehand. He spent around an hour, and the construction was mostly done. Ken was rather proud of himself. He hoped it also looked pleasing to the eye, but he couldn't quite judge it himself when it came to aesthetics. Ken was still satisfied with the work he had done. So, he simply walked over to the front gate, and sat down, waiting for his family to arrive back with the herbs. He simply waited and waited. Another hour passed by, and that was when Ken was starting to think that maybe something bad had happened. But he waved away those thoughts, knowing that it was most likely just that they were having issues finding the herbs. At least that was what he thought at first. The silence didn't last long, unfortunately. Boom, that was when he heard it. A deafening sound, Ken could feel the trembling ground at his feet. Ken could feel the trees shaking, the snowy mountain trembling as a small avalanche was formed. The sound instantly filled him with concern, as his greatest fears were manifesting quickly. Confusion overwhelmed his senses, as he quickly ran inside and grabbed his blade, a regular katana, and ran into the forest at inhuman speeds. The more he ran, the more concerned he grew. His steps became heavier and heavier, as he eventually could feel people moving in the distance. But with people moving, he could also smell it. The extremely familiar stench of blood wafting through the air. The burning smell of a smoldering cadaver was a thing he had been somewhat used to at some point, but he didn't think he'd sense it in his new life. His senses flared, as the movement died down by the time he got closer. In a small clearing, surrounded by blown up trees and cut down bushes, Ken could clearly feel six bodies lying on the ground, as the mountain winds flowed over them. They were all missing their heads, but Ken could still tell who they were. He knew them by smell at this point. With steady steps, he reached the clearing and stood right in front of the body pile. The grip of his hand weakened as his blade fell to the ground, and his knees simply buckled as he felt something he hadn't thought he'd ever feel in his life. Rage. Pure and unadulterated rage. The former assassin had never felt that emotion before. Now, he got to experience it in its full glory. Whoever did this. I will find out. Ken started speaking as he placed his hands on the ground, the blood flowing from the bodies coating his gloves directly. I promise. That I'll make sure they join you. In hell. 
Ken said as he clutched the hand of a headless corpse whom he had formerly called Daisuke. Ken didn't know what to think, his mind was filled with thoughts of revenge, but he still took a moment to regain his bearings. He stood there for a few seconds, seemingly staring into the abyss. If he had any eyes, they would most certainly be both empty and bloodshot at the same time. The six corpses that stood in front of him, the way they were just unceremoniously thrown after being decapitated. It simply didn't sit right with him. They were his family. The only family he had ever had in both of his lives put together. They were the first friends he had made, the first people that he had actually cared about. His mind was simply having a hard time registering the image his senses were describing for him. At the same time, he felt conflicted. For the longest time, he had placed almost no value on any life, human or otherwise. Yet the people in front of him, he couldn't deny their value to his life. The first four samurai that died Ken hadn't gotten that attached to, but the six before him had been there with him through thick and they had all experienced countless hardships together. All of them had been simply surviving in that cruel world that Ken had ended up in. He had been far more attached to Daisuke and Keiji than the others, but they had all still been his family, and all of them treated him with care. They had been the first ones to ever do so. And now they were gone. Ken knew he now had to cope with that. But, at the same time, he didn't know any healthy ways of dealing with loss, as he had never experienced it to such a degree. So, Ken didn't mourn for long though, getting up from the ground, straightening his back and grabbing his blade. Whatever bastard did this is sure to still be nearby. He had heard the explosion just recently, the blood was still fresh, and the bodies were still warm. All signs pointed Ken towards the obvious reality that the killers were near. Very near. With a deep breath, the young swordsman managed to find the smell of seven different people besides his family and immediately started dashing into the forest, tracking them down as best he could. The mountain-raised child now had the nose of a wolf, and the agility of a cheetah as he leapt from branch to branch with the grace of a leopard, not making a single sound as he got closer and closer to his prey. The smell of blood that was wafting from behind him got further and further, as he now could feel the culprits clearly within his senses. Stepping from tree branch to tree branch, and eventually landing on the ground. He could now discern some of the features of the men as the air around them fluttered around them. Seven people, all of different heights, all seemed to be carrying strange blades. Ken couldn't tell much else about their appearance, as he couldn't exactly see how they were dressed or discern any facial features. With a leap, he pounced on them like a hungry predator. Just as reckless as he always had been in his last life. His blade was already drawn as he stabbed toward the one dragging behind them all. It was the largest man among them, with a blade large enough to match that seemed to be oddly round in shape. The man in question didn't even turn around his hands didn't even move as he simply tilted to the side and dodged Ken's stab. Ken was a bit surprised by that, his technique had been flawless and he didn't think he'd be detected, still, he didn't let that dissuade him, as he quickly turned his blade and slashed at the man. The swordsman in question quickly grabbed at the blade on his back and blocked Ken's sword strike, shocking Ken with his reaction speed and agile movements. Ken immediately used chakra flow, his blade flickering with electricity as he tried to dig into the man's blade. But the second the chakra came in contact with the man's sword, it seemed to be absorbed. At a speed Ken could barely react to, the tall and bulky man kicked toward Ken, aiming right for the young child's stomach. Ken managed to put up his guard, blocking the kick and getting sent flying backwards, smashing into a tree and breaking it. As the air left his lungs quickly. What the hell is wrong with this brat? The large man said as all seven of the swordsmen looked at the young attacker with different expressions. They were none other than the seven swordsmen of the mist, a group of jonin that had been going around the world in order to make a name for themselves. They had specifically come to the land of iron after hearing about a rather elusive bandit group, the mountain hyenas which had somehow racked up a rather high bounty from the daimyo of the land of iron. The swordsmen of the mist had decided to take up that bounty, stalking the mountains for a few days before finally finding a trace of one of the usual routes that the bandits took. It just so happens that six people came down the mountain after only a day of waiting, two more than what the group was reported to be. But the swordsmen didn't bother much, swiftly killing all six of them without much issue. All seven of them were jonin after all, and they were even stronger than the vast majority of other jonin so the runaway samurai slash mountain bandits didn't even get to react before they died. The strike that sealed the deal had been from Jinpachi Munashi. He was able to use his shibuki slash blast sword, which was quite literally a scroll filled with explosive tags on a handle, to blow up and disorient the samurai, which allowed the others to decapitate them swiftly. They gathered the heads in a sack and started making their way back to the daimyo's palace to collect the bounty. That was when a small child attacked them out of nowhere. More specifically, Ken had tried to kill Fuguki Suikazan, 
the current wielder of the Samahada. The most monstrous blade of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Ken's assassination techniques were top-notch, the way he had approached them was truly frightening, as not one of the Seven Jonin had noticed him in any way. He had made no sound, and they could feel no chakra or bloodlust from him, it was as if they were attacked by a ghost. The only reason Fuguki managed to survive, was the Samahada, the sword had wriggled in panic when sensing Ken's approach, alerting its owner that something was indeed wrong. Had it not been for the sword's sentience, Fuguki would have most likely been stabbed and killed in an instant. Fuguki's brow was filled with sweat as he looked at the small brat that had almost just killed him. Hm? A little kid just snuck up on us? Juzo Biwa, the current wielder of the Kubakirabocho, decapitating carving knife wielded by Zabuza in the future, said as he grasped at the blade on his back. Be cautious. He seems rather dangerous. Kushimaru Kuriorer, the tall blonde swordsman that wielded the new Ibari, sewing needle, said as he also took out his long, needle-shaped, blade in one hand and his wire in the other. What's all the fuss, it's just some random brat? Jinpachi said as he put his blast sword on his shoulder and started walking toward the kid. Oi, did you get lost? The second he reached in front of Ken, Ken leapt towards him. Ken knew that he wasn't likely to be treated as a child since he had just ambushed them, so he wasn't planning to wait for them to attack first. Jinpachi smiled sadistically as he swung his blast sword towards the child, not showing any mercy as his blade released an explosion large enough to shake the earth underneath them. Ken was sent flying by that explosion, breaking a few more trees with his back as he stabbed his blade into the ground to stop himself. Ken didn't even get the time to breathe, as another swordsman was already on him. This time it was none other than Juzo, who had followed Ken at breakneck speeds and swung his sword towards him. Ken barely got to raise his sword in time to meet the incoming strike, shocking Juzo with his reaction time. Unfortunately, reaction time couldn't make up for the difference in weapon quality and strength, Juzo's blade broke through Ken's small katana rather quickly, slashing the young swordsman across the chest horizontally. The bones in Ken's hands cracked due to his opponent's strength, making the situation even worse. Ken fell backwards, his hand losing its grip on the broken katana as he hit the ground. Juzo couldn't help but laugh out loud when seeing the blood spill from Ken's lips. Ha 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 ha. I can't believe this brat. Did you guys see the way he blocked that? Juzo said as he turned around and looked at his colleagues. That was a huge mistake on his part. Ken slipped the mask off of his face and Ken quickly jumped onto the man's back, crossing his legs around his torso and instantly biting at his throat with his sharp teeth. Juzo was shocked, quickly grabbed onto the child's hair with one hand, and slipped his fingers onto his lower jaw with the other. His fingers bled as he struggled against the rabid child's teeth. He eventually succeeded in what he had planned, breaking Ken's jaw with his superior strength and kicking Ken into a tree once more. Juzo was no longer in any mood to laugh, he clutched at his throat as he gasped a few times, spitting some blood as he realized that he had actually been injured rather seriously. I told you to be careful? Kushimaru walked over, he would have stabbed Ken through the head, had Juzo not been able to break his jaw. S shut up! Juzo said as he still clutched at his bleeding neck. He must have been related to the bandits from earlier. Most likely out for revenge. Another one of the swordsmen walked towards the downed Ken. This time, it was Jainan Akabino, the wielder of the Kabutawari, which was technically a hammer and an axe tied together. Such a pathetic little thing. Jinpachi said with his blast sword still slung over his shoulder. No need to ridicule him. Kushimaru said, giving his companion a long look before staring back at the down child. At this point, all of the swordsmen noticed something. Their opponent, the one that had almost killed two of them and that managed to block so many of their strikes, was completely blind. Not only blind, but completely missing the upper half of his face, it was honestly jarring to look at even for the trained jonin. I think it's better we kill this one here. Kushimaru said as he raised his needle blade and stabbed the child directly in the chest, right through where he knew the heart would be. The other swordsmen also seemed rather weirded out, ultimately, they all agreed with Kushimaru's decision though, seeing no issue with getting rid of a future powerful enemy out for revenge. Still, their jobs were done, so they went back and collected the sack filled with the heads of the mountain bandits and continued going down the mountain. Ken didn't have any bounty on his head, so they didn't bother with him anymore. Simply leaving the corpse behind. The seven swordsmen were left a bit humbled by the experience, especially the two that had almost lost their lives in the fight against a blind mountain child. As they were leaving, Ken's fingers twitched a bit. Not one of them had noticed it though. After all, who would think such a thing was possible, right? Ken didn't know what to feel when he recovered his senses. He could smell plenty of his own blood in the air, he could feel the swordsmen departing, but he didn't have the strength to stop them. 
They didn't turn around either, only kept going until they were completely out of his range. That was the only moment Ken was actually able to calm down momentarily and focus on his own body. He could feel both of his energies. One of them was his chakra, weakened as some of it had been absorbed by the blade of one of the swordsmen. The other energy was now the dominant one, at least briefly. It was revolving around his entire body in a way Ken had never felt before. Ken had never actually managed to control it himself, but it seemed to naturally strengthen his body at all times for some reason. Ken could feel his body mending, slowly, he would surely be immobile for a few hours at the very least. The energy was running rampant in his body by itself, he could feel it clearly. The more it dissipated while healing his wounds, the more of it seemed to be automatically absorbed from his surroundings. Yet, it seemed to automatically balance itself to match his chakra. Which now would have technically slowed down his healing if it was not constantly being absorbed from the air around him as he powered through the pain and breathed as much and as deeply as he could. Ken had no clue what that energy was, it seemed to be related to nature from how it was being absorbed from around him, but Ken still had no clue as to what it was. Although, it was pretty clear that it had saved his life. Another thing that had clearly saved his life was the fact that, unlike most people, his heart was actually located slightly more to the right, a bit covered by one of his lungs. It was likely related to his birth, as he was pretty hideously deformed at the end of the day. Kushimaru had only slightly grazed his heart instead of piercing it. Had it been pierced, Ken would have likely died regardless of that energy. Who knew? That a human can actually get that strong. Ken pondered on the people that had almost killed him while simply enjoying the wind beating on his broken body. Ken had thought himself relatively powerful. The strange nature-related energy had made him stronger than most adults despite only being 8 years old. He didn't remember or know much about the world he found himself in, but he had felt that cutting down one or two trees with a sword swing was already powerful. It seemed that he wasn't all that great after all. At least not yet. He had the technique forged in the blood of tens of thousands from back in his world, he had the surprise attack on them, and yet he had still ended up in his current state. From the beginning to the end, Ken had trouble following the movements of his opponents. He could initially tell that they were stronger than him from their strides, and the way they carried themselves, but he thought he would be able to make up for the difference with skill. It seemed that the seven adults were also plenty skilled. This isn't acceptable. Ken felt clenched one of his broken arms with a frown on his face. He simply felt inadequate, the ones that killed his family were simply able to walk away despite his best efforts. That was when it hit him. No. In the first place, I've just turned eight this week. These people seem to be talented people that have trained their entire lives. That train of thought managed to raise a different emotion in Ken. A wide, crazed and toothy smile rose on his lips, his sharpened teeth somewhat red from the blood that he had just spit out. Seven swordsmen all carrying special swords, not exactly a low-key group. Next time we meet, all of them will die. No. I won't just kill them. I'll make sure to get strong enough to crush them. Ken's wide smile didn't disappear at all, not even when wolves had gathered around him, cautiously circling around him as if they were waiting for him to die or pass out. They had likely smelled all of the blood in the area. While they were approaching, Ken was in his own mind, thinking of the ways he would go about killing the swordsman. With those thoughts in mind, he simply let out a small laugh. All the wolves reared back when hearing it. Then the small laugh turned louder and louder, becoming more and more demented by the second. Ken's aura flared up, he released a wave of killing intent so baleful and vile that all of the wolves seemed to freeze up instantly when it passed over them. Ken's laughter resonated throughout the clearing he was in, the wolves instantly turned tail and ran away, not wanting to get any closer to the thing laying on the ground. After all, no matter how wounded it was, a predator would always be dangerous prey to hunt. Ken didn't really bother with the wolves, he merely sat there for the next few hours, running simulations in his mind about how that fight could have gone had he been just a little bit stronger. Eventually, though, his bloodlust had calmed down, as he regained his bearings and painfully sat back up. The bones in his arms were still cracked all over, but they were slowly mending. It seemed that most of his flesh wounds were already healed up. With his hands hanging limply by his sides, he started walking back towards the place where his family was killed, and by extension towards his only home. He stopped by the corpses of his family, he wasn't the type to put an emotional value on corpses, but he still valued their memory greatly, so he used his broken arms to grab onto something important from each of them. He dragged his broken body back to the temple, his home, which was now empty. Ken could feel the air flowing through it, as he realized just how little the house meant without the people living in it. The previously warm enclosure and safe space they had built, was now nothing more than a cold and desolate scenery, 
The fire that was usually kept alight by Koji had also gone out while Ken was out. Ken at this point realized that he wouldn't be able to live there for long. It was no longer a home, it was just a residence now. And, it was also a graveyard. Ken approached the shrine he had built, the little memorial place he had made for the people that fell before them. Now, six more trinkets were placed on it. Daisuke's hairpin, the man had always had long hair, and his hairpin always held it in place, even during training. Koji's favorite kunai, which he also used as a scalpel. It wasn't exactly a sentimental item, but Koji was not the type of person to keep trinkets and to give meaning to items. Juru's necklace, which was made out of wolf fangs, from wolves that he had hunted as a young man. Isamu had his favorite pair of sandals, one that Ken had actually made for him. The samurai had cherished it quite a bit. Fumio had a small tanto, the first blade that Ken had used as a small child. It was a family relic of sorts, and Fumio had given it to Ken for a while to train with a sharp blade. And Arata's cracked glasses, as the less dexterous member, he unfortunately also had some eyesight problems. But that never deterred him. Ken stood there for a bit, carving away at a few pieces of wood with his less broken arm as he made the shrine a bit larger. After spending a bit of time on that, Ken dropped his tools, which were just sharpened stones, and went on inside the temple. Falling asleep on his futon almost instantly as tiredness took over his body and mind. The last thing he thought about brought an honest smile to his lips, as he remembered the recent celebration of his birthday. A warm moment. One that he would no longer have the luxury to experience. And with that, Ken blacked out. Underscore POV narration underscore the seven swordsmen of the mist managed to collect the bounty successfully, but not one of them had forgotten the strange child that had attacked them. Especially not the two that had almost died to him. Fuguki walked forward in a robotic manner, trying to play out a scenario in his mind, where he would have survived that encounter. But had it not been for his good luck, as well as having Samahata, he would have died there, instantly. He, a Janin, and a powerful member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, would have died to a child had his luck been any worse. Why was he able to hide his presence so perfectly? It was as if he was blended with his surroundings, I couldn't even feel him when he was in front of me. Fuguki's back was filled with sweat as he remembered the cold feeling he got when that sword came for his head. No sound was made, and no killing intent was leaked for even a second. Those were not the movements of a child. Those were the movements of a highly trained assassin. Not a single academy child would be able to come close to that kind of skill. While Fuguki was thinking about stealth skills and assassination techniques, Juzo Biwa was thinking about something else entirely. Juzo was a person known for his brutality. He had played with his opponents mercilessly before, he took the slightest bit of pleasure in seeing his opponent squirm. He simply couldn't understand it. How could a child be even more brutal than him? Usually, he was playful with his victims, his brutality only extending as far as his actions did, as he preferred to mock his victims. He wasn't against biting an opponent's neck in order to win, but the way it was done this time was simply. Creepy? He could tell that the child was far from disgusted when biting into his flesh. Rather, the opposite, he still remembered the corners of the child's lips pointing upwards. The muffled giggle as he crunched down tighter on Juzo's neck. Juzo could only rub his bandaged neck as he remembered that moment with cold sweat on his spine. It was as if he had been attacked by a rabid animal. He hadn't even heard a grunt of pain or a shout of any sort, even when almost ripping off the child's jaw. He refused to believe that a child of all things would be so. Feral? So he no longer thought of the child as a human being. Good thing it's dead now. None of the swordsmen felt the need to look further into the matter, only sending in the heads and receiving the reward for the bandits. They also told the daimyo the location of the paths that the bandits were taking. Someone had to clean up the mountains after all. And a squad was sent eventually, a few days later a squad of ten samurai was sent to clean up the mountain of traps and corpses. As they knew that the jonin certainly didn't bother to clean up after themselves. The squad was also led by a high-ranking samurai. A hatamoto, a banner carrier or a guardian of the banner, direct guards of the daimyo and considered vassals that owned mansions of their own. Technically, each Hatamoto was just as powerful as a Jonin, but they were not experienced in any form of assassination personally. Some could recognize them and protect themselves from them, but none could perform them, as they were considered cowardly tricks. This Hatamoto in particular was told to go there personally in order to scout out the situation and find the original hideout of the bandits. The other men with him were nothing more than gate guards, only there to handle the cleanup as a Hatamoto was not to get his hands dirty cleaning up coppices. The Hatamoto eventually managed to find a thin trail of blood. He followed the trail in one direction, and managed to find a pool of blood in a clearing with cut and exploded trees. A fight definitely happened here. 
But this was not in the report those Jonin provided. Just goes to show that you can never trust Shinobi. The Hatamoto looked at the pool of dried blood on the ground with a skeptical gaze. No one would survive losing that much blood. Someone else might have dragged the body away. He quickly came to that conclusion and decided to trace the blood in the other direction. He told the gate guards in his squad to keep cleaning up the scene before following him. He was confident in dealing with one bandit. And if there were more he could always simply escape and inform his lord. Thankfully, the trail of blood had also not been covered up by snow, as there hadn't been any storms on that mountain recently. He followed the trail of blood all the way to the site of what appeared to be a patched up abandoned temple. This must have been the actual main base of the mountain hyenas. He drew his blade silently as he walked into the compound slowly. He could see the patched up walls, the building was maintained. But the fire in the yard seemed to have gone out. It's possible that they have moved out. But I need to be cautious. The Hatamoto grasped his blade with a serious gaze as he looked at the main building of the temple. He also noticed what seemed to be a small shrine near it. He was able to notice that it hadn't been built all that long ago, and some of the items on there were bloody. This is certainly recent. 10 memorial items, 10 missing deserters. It's been 8 years, but I guess Daisuke didn't make it in the end. The Hatamoto remembered Daisuke and his squad, he had been the one to give them the initial order that caused them to become deserters. Their orders had been rather simple, Daisuke himself was a Gokunin at some point, two ranks below a Hatamoto, but still a vassal with his own land. So he was the squad leader. They were tasked to send a message to the five Kage of each shinobi village, to force them to end the war. It was basically a suicide mission. They likely wouldn't even make it past the first Kage before being killed. That was why Daisuke decided to save the lives of his squad and become nomads. The Hatamoto looked at the small shrine with a scowl. I still remember getting scolded by our lord for his betrayal. He would have slashed the shrine in half from hatred, but dishonoring the dead was in poor taste, so he simply moved on. The Hatamoto couldn't sense anyone inside the building, but he knew that there was a possibility for the one that had built the small shrine to still be inside. So, instead of entering the temple he simply imbued his katana with his chakra, making it glow in a deep blue light. It was a legendary blade gifted to him by his lord for his extensive service. It was made out of chakra conductive metals and sharper than any regular blade said to even be on par with the with legendary blades such as the Sword of Tatsuka. It was officially called the Severing Sword. With an upward motion, he sent a flying slash towards the temple, splitting it in half rather easily. He then swiped his sword a few more times, cutting the temple more and more until it collapsed completely. He then sheathed his blade and looked at the rubble with expectation in his gaze. Preparing for a quick draw technique as soon as any assailant showed himself. He stood in that position for a few minutes, then he noticed that there was simply no movement in the temple ruins. He narrowed his eyes as he proceeded to turn around. The Hatamoto walked a few steps, before drawing his blade and slashing behind him at speeds that could barely be followed with the naked eye. Quite a bit of sweat was present on his brow as he looked around, a foreboding feeling simply made him shiver. Something isn't right? He felt as if he was intruding into a lion's den. As if a predator had its gaze locked on him. He was being hunted. That was pure instinct that he had forged through countless battles, in comparison, the seven swordsmen of the mist were still beginners to him, who had been a Hatamoto for a few decades. His instincts were more honed, even if he was weaker in strength. S show yourself. The fact that his voice trembled a bit only made things worse, and he knew that. Showing your fear to a predator was a sure way to die. Unfortunately for him, he was not a sensory type. Even if he was, the odds of him sensing Ken were extremely low, unless he was on the level of an actual Kage. From behind him, he could suddenly hear movement. He turned around quickly, only to see dozens of Senbo and Shuriken coming his way. His mind panicked slightly, as his fear materialized, but his body moved as if on instinct, his blade swiped at impressive speeds, protecting his body perfectly from the projectiles in front of him. As he was blocking the projectiles Thoga, he felt something strange as if something cold had slipped into him. Looking down, he could see two blades sticking out of his body, one from his stomach and one from his chest. He had already bled quite a lot, so he didn't even know when it had happened exactly. W what? He looked forward, where the projectiles had been coming from, only to see a poorly set up spring trap at the entry of the temple. And no. He tried to turn around, to slash his blade behind him, but by now his body had already lost a lot of blood. His slower than usual slash was dogged perfectly as the blade seemed to slip out of him without any issue. In front of him was a short masked figure. Nothing more than a child wearing ill-fitting red armor and tattered black rags around his shoulders. A white mask with a large red dot in the center, with no visible eye holes. 
that figure seemed to be staring into his soul. The Hatamoto immediately collapsed to the ground, as he felt the strength leave his body by the second. His blade was also dropped at that point. Ken simply picked it up, looking at it with interest. Flowing his chakra through it while completely ignoring the dying man at his feet. A great blade. I'll be taking this. The Hatamoto felt more and more horror when hearing the nonchalant and young voice that escaped that mask. I don't appreciate you destroying my house, but I guess it's no longer home when I am alone. He said as he walked over to the Hatamoto, who was currently trying to crawl away. I must warn the others. They need to flee and inform the Lord. The man was concentrated on his duty, he felt it was odd that he unintentionally rolled around on the ground. At least that was what he thought had happened up until he saw his body, a few meters away. Only his head had rolled off. He could see in his last moments, Ken scavenging the scabbard from his corpse. Ken then looked at the path that led down the mountain, as he knew there must have been more people there. I feel the need to blow off some steam now. These are the same people that forced us into the mountains in the first place anyway. Ken then looked at the corpse of the man he had just killed. His opponent had been strong, even able to cut down the large temple with ease. Still, in Ken's eyes, he seemed weaker than the swordsman that had almost killed him, at least he had less awareness when it came to assassination techniques. Maybe he was a great fighter? But Ken wasn't out to fight him, he simply wanted to kill him. And that was much easier. After all, he was an assassin by profession. Even if he was dressed as a samurai. They must be here to clean up after the swordsman from earlier. He then continued down the mountain, to clean up the rodents that had infested his former home. Ken walked down the mountain as he ran his hand on his newly acquired blade. It was an extremely sharp sword, Ken touched the razor edge carefully, his senses heightened to an extreme. The katana didn't seem to have a crossguard, so the sword handle connected seamlessly with the sheath. It was a simple blade, not ornate, for it was an object of murder, not a centerpiece over a fireplace. But more importantly, it was a much better blade than what he had previously. With this, I can at least compete with those swordsmen in one department. He still remembered the way his blade had snapped in that fight. The way he was betrayed by his weapon. His body would have kept going, even with broken arms, but the blade falling apart had put him at a huge disadvantage and it led to him receiving a slash across the chest. Even now, Ken could feel the marks of his healed wounds on his body. It seemed that the energy in his body merely enhanced his body's natural regeneration, not magically healed him. The scars would remain, and Ken didn't mind that, he'd keep them as reminders. The blade itself was long, longer than Ken was currently in fact. But it was also surprisingly light. Ken knew that the length could be problematic, as it was a bit awkward to take it out of its sheath in case of an emergency, but he'd get used to it eventually. The fact that the blade was light might have also had to do with the fact that Ken was physically stronger than most adults. Well, the majority of adults and certainly all adults from Earth. The examples Ken had been running into lately had made him rather discouraged. If he had tried to fight that Hatamoto face to face he would have surely died, and that wasn't exactly acceptable. Ken had planned to question him, to find out more about the people that had almost killed him, but seeing him cut down the temple with a few sword swipes made him realize that killing him was the safer option. After all, it was highly unlikely that they had only sent one person for the mission when it likely included the cleanup of all of the traps they had laid out in the mountain range. The chances of these people being stronger than the man he had just killed were also relatively low, so Ken wasn't exactly worried. Although he was still vigilant, refusing to be as reckless as he had been with attacking the seven swordsmen. After all, if he had stalked them for a while and hadn't just rushed in, he would have managed to kill a few of them at least. It was a shame, but at least he was alive now, and he had plenty of time to try again. With a sigh, Ken strapped the large sword to his back, not having any better way of transportation yet. He kept the two smaller katanas that his family had been using at his waist as he also took some supplies like food and water from the collapsed temple. He also filled his backpack and pockets with as many sunbas and shuriken as he could. They didn't have all that many to begin with, so he ended up collecting the ones he had used for the improvised spring trap that he had used to assassinate the Hatamoto. And so, with large strides, Ken started dashing down the mountain range, knowing where he'd be able to find more people, the clearing that still held the corpses of his family. By the time Ken got there, the soldiers had already lit up a fire underneath the mound of headless dead bodies, after all criminals deserved no burial to them. Ken didn't react much to that either, instead, he quietly waltzed around the clearing from tree branch to tree branch, each step he took masked by the wind as he studied the situation. Nine men, all of them wearing light armor and thick fur coats, their attire was a lot less formal than the man he had killed. Ken judged that they weren't all that strong rather quickly. Not one of them seemed to have anything special about them, 
the amount of chakra they had even paled in comparison to his, let alone the jonin level fighters he had been facing recently. Ken knew a bit about shinobi rankings, Daisuke had made sure to educate him on plenty of things related to the world. At least he now had some assurance that he wasn't all that weak, and had just been competing with tough opponents up to that point. Without feeling the need to extend the situation and wait for assassination opportunities, Ken simply stood up straight on top of the tree he was on. None of the samurai had noticed him yet, Ken felt his weapons for a bit, wondering what he should use in the fight for a few seconds before deciding to use his newest blade. Now, taking it out of the sheath was currently physically impossible for him due to the length of the blade. So Ken simply took it off his back and unsheathed the sword slightly, after which he simply pointed it to the ground, letting the sheath slide off and land on the ground with a small thud. This had finally alarmed the nine warriors below, as they all looked at the source of the sounds and drew their blades. W who's there? One of them asked as he kept a perfect stance despite his panicking mind. Eventually, one of the men looked up, his eyes widening as he saw the blood-smeared figure of small stature. A blood-red samurai armor and a tattered cloak stained with blood all over, in his hands was a long blade, held in an odd stance as it was pointed at the ground slightly to the side. The strangest part of that costume however had to be the mask, all white with a blood-red sphere in the center. Up there! The warrior that had spotted him instantly shouted out, as all of them got into a formation, preparing for an enemy ambush. Ken then jumped down, his armor and blades clattering a bit, sounding a lot like a winchy more than anything. S state your business. One of the samurai said, hoping that they wouldn't have to face the person in front of him. Can you please die silently? Ken asked as he tilted his head slightly. His young voice startled many of the soldiers, his mannerisms could have even been called cute had the situation been different. As soon as he said that, some of the men reeled back, showing a slight gap in the formation. That was the exact second Ken dashed forward, the wind rolling around him as he brought his long blade around and slashed at the men mercilessly. The blade flared with blue light as electricity seemed to sparkle around it. The first swipe mowed through three people and three blades before it was stopped by the fourth. The three were all split in the middle section, their torsos flying upwards as their sword snapped and fell to the ground. The soldiers instantly panicked when seeing three of their own fall so quickly, but they still had training, all of the remaining members still rushed Ken while the one blocking his strike tried to keep his attention. Ken didn't show any reaction to this, as it was the obvious move to make. The remaining six warriors seemed to circle around him perfectly in the second that Ken had given them as breathing room. I need to give them some leeway. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to test this blade for long. Still, Ken quickly split the fourth sword apart, shocking the samurai that had been holding it as Ken slightly pulled his blade backwards as it passed through the man's torso. Instead of being cut in half, the man was simply gutted alive, Ken instantly twirled around raising the hilt of the sword to block a sword slash and twisting his body around its blade to block another. His leg raised up and kicked the hand of another warrior, breaking his fingers and making him drop his sword. Ken then kicked the sword while it was still falling, shooting it a bit upwards, and then kicked it again right into the stunned man's throat. More blades were rushing in as Ken decided that blocking all of them was becoming annoying. Instead of bothering to block them, he raised himself on the hilt of his blade, standing on one arm as the thirsts that had been directed towards him all passed by the blade. Ken then twirled around the sword, using it as a pole and kicking two of the men backwards. Then, with one hand grabbing the hilt of the sword, he kicked it with his leg, causing it to shoot upwards and throw some dust into the samurai that had been behind him. As the blade was going up, Ken put his other hand on it as well, bringing it down onto the warrior in front of him. The man only had the time to bring up his sword in order to try and block it, but he truly had no chance. This time, Ken didn't even bother with chakra, as his blade simply cut through the katana almost instantly, splitting the man in two with a downward slash. AA Monster The two warriors that Ken had kicked away had already got up, both of them seemed to have the same idea as they turned around and started running. Ken simply picked up the two sides of the blade he had just broken and threw them at their back, hitting them perfectly feeling them hit the ground with a small thud. At that point, the man he had blinded had also managed to rub the dust and snow out of his eyes, only to see that he was the last man alive. W wait. Please don't kill me. The man instantly got on his knees, knowing that he truly had no chance of fighting whatever the thing in front of him was. Don't worry. I won't kill you. Yet? Ken said with childlike joy in his voice as he once again tilted his head a bit and brought his sword behind him, stabbing it on the ground and leaning on the dull part while crossing his arms a bit. T thank you. Thank you. The warrior instantly banged his head on the ground a few times. All honor was forgotten in the face of death, it seemed. You're welcome. By the way. 
Can you tell me more about your mission? Ken asked as he continued to sense the man's heartbeat quicken with that question. Don't worry. I don't want anything with you or your lord. Can you tell me a bit more about the men that killed the mountain bandits here? Ken decided to rephrase his question, and he could feel the man calm down quite a lot after he had done so. Oh of course. The man instantly started giving Ken more information regarding the seven swordsmen of the mist. Ken simply smiled under his mask as he heard more of that information. Ken smiled as he walked, his long blade already sheathed and on his back. Behind him could be seen a headless corpse, a bit further away from eight other corpses and another pile of burnt corpses. The cleanup crew wasn't going to be having much fun, that much was for sure. It wasn't like Ken felt good killing the soldiers, but to him, none of them was all that innocent anyway. Ken also knew that he needed to kill them in order to keep his identity a secret. There wasn't much else to it. The man had come into his home and destroyed it, and he killed them all in return. The ease with which he had done it was a bit strange. But Ken knew that it was just because he was already extremely used to killing others. He had told himself that he would be different in his new life, that he wouldn't give in to his vices so easily. It wasn't difficult for him to control himself when his family took care of him, but it seemed that he was bound to slip into some of his old habits without them. Ken was well aware of that. But this time things were a bit different. Unlike before, when he killed people without a care in the world, now his mind seemed to wander in different directions. These men? Each and every one of them could have had families. I may have been technically defending myself, but I still willingly tore away someone precious to someone else. It wasn't like Ken was going to stop killing people, not as long as the group called the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist were still alive. But now he knew by experience what effects loss could have on humans. He used to laugh at the people that came after him for revenge at some point in his life, for he simply found it difficult to sympathize with them. It was rather ironic that he was now also out seeking revenge for the lives of his family. So Ken decided to make a promise, a vow, to the corpses of his family before he finally left the mountain range before he ventured into the wide world. If one day, I find my hands sullied with innocent blood once more. I will plunge my blade into my stomach and gut myself on the spot. Ken knew that not killing others was going to be difficult in the world he had been sent into, but he now vowed to only kill in order to survive, to only kill those that truly deserve to die. Unlike in his past life, where he killed for pleasure and gratification, this time he was doing it with purpose. It didn't matter that he slightly enjoyed it still, as long as he didn't harm anyone other than his enemies. After that vow, Ken proceeded to walk down the mountain. Thanks to the interrogation from the warrior he had decapitated, he now knew the identity of his targets, where they came from, he knew where he would find them. But finding them wasn't going to be the difficult part. The seven of them seemed to always move as a squad. So in order to chase after them and slaughter them, Ken needed to grow a lot stronger. Thankfully, at eight years of age, he still had a lot of room for growth, as his growth had only just started. Ken had interrogated the man from earlier about various things, including exactly how powerful shinobi could be and the way to tell them from one another. The warrior didn't seem all that knowledgeable himself, but he still knew a lot more than Ken, as Daisuke had yet to get to teach him much about the power levels of other shinobi. Ken had a benchmark for Jonin, with the Hatamoto and the Seven Swordsmen, but the rest of the lower rankings had been a mystery to him. The samurai was able to put things into perspective for Ken. Most people specialized in one or two areas. And each person was ranked on the degree of mastery or skill in the area they specialized in. The nine samurai that Ken had killed were all at Genin level, capable of taking on chunins as long as they were in groups of three thanks to their trained swordsmanship and formations. They couldn't do much against someone both stronger and more skilled than them though. Currently, Ken was physically at the level of a chunin while being more skilled in battle than the majority of Jonin out there. His energy reserves were also decent, easily entering the levels of Chunin. Being in the higher brackets when it came to density. Ken tried to ask about the second energy within him that was somehow related to nature, but the samurai seemed to have no idea what Ken was talking about. Still, Ken knew that his enhanced physical strength was thanks to that energy. Ken had noticed that he was able to use it to replenish his stamina as well. The energy was recharged automatically as his body absorbed more from the air around him which would eventually lead to Ken having endless stamina when his chakra reserves were large enough to balance a larger amount of nature energy. Ken had already done a few tests in his travels, he could run and remain energized for a few days on end without even feeling the need to stop. Well, he still stopped to eat or drink a bit of water, but his muscles simply didn't seem tired at all. Ken also found that depleting his chakra reserves was a rather good way of expanding them. It was a slow process, but it seemed rather efficient compared to doing nothing. Unfortunately, Ken didn't have any method of depleting his chakra efficiently. 
Using chakra flow didn't deplete a lot of it either, as the technique formed something akin to a closed circuit, flowing the chakra from his body into his blade and back. This was the method that Ken had devised in order to save as much as possible while he was younger. It was the only way he knew how to perform chakra flow. If anyone were to hear about it, they'd be beyond shocked that a child would be able to come up with something like that. But to Ken, it was just normal, as he didn't know how the technique usually went. Ken spent more and more time in between mountain ranges, training like a madman for a while. At least until he was confident enough to venture out in the world, to be prepared for most situations that might arise. Eventually, during the weeks he spent in the forest training, Ken managed to create a move that depleted his chakra rather efficiently. He had been aiming to find a method to increase his chakra depletion rate, he figured creating a new technique wouldn't hurt. Copying the Hatamoto he had assassinated, he coated his blade in a thick coat of lighting, with wind flowing all around it. Slowly but surely, he poured more and more chakra into the blade, making it sparkle with light as the wind bent around it violently. Ken then proceeded to add nature energy into the mix, which seemed to strengthen the technique even more. Then, with both of his hands on the oversized blade, he spun around, arms firmly holding the blade as he released a powerful slash all around him. The forest around him trembled, as trees were blown away, Ken himself was glad he didn't have eyes, as he was sure they would have been filled with dust. The technique name? Dragon Twister, it was simple, and it had everything to do with the state of the forest around him when he performed that attack for the first time. Everything around him was torn apart as if a tornado had gone through. The attack ruined everything around him in a 10 to 20 meter radius. The dragon part in the name came from the fact that he remembered Daisuke reading him legends about mythical animals and such, and he remembered clearly that it was his favorite mythical beast. Ken was satisfied with its strength. But he didn't quite like how slow it was. It had taken him an entire minute to flow chakra into his blade and mix in his nature energy. It wasn't a short process, and it required a lot of concentration. In an actual battle, such a move simply wasn't usable. In terms of depleting chakra, it sure did its job though. It took around half of Ken's reserves to perform it once. So, Ken decided that he would at the very least perfect the technique before heading out into the world. This would in turn only make him stronger, both in body and chakra reserves. Ken was prepared to camp for a while in that place. Good thing he even had a waterfall nearby, underneath which was a large lake, which went rather deep. Ken instantly decided on a training method, submerging himself in the deepest point of the lake, and performing that technique twice, before climbing back up and trying to split open the waterfall with a flying slash. And so, the training began. Ken looked at the lake in front of him with a smile on his face. The cold weather didn't bother him one bit as he took off his clothes, grabbed his large blade and dove into the lake, blade in his mouth as he swam to the bottom of it without any issue. As soon as Ken's feet touched the bottom of the lake, he poured chakra into his blade. A motion he had already been practicing for months. The water around him was electrified, as Ken resisted it without much issue. Then, the next second he added nature energy into the mix, and the water around him started revolving as he started swinging the blade at the greatest speed he could muster. Underneath the weight of the water, his body moved slowly, much slower than usual, but his speed was still comparable to most genin. Ken spun around, his body moving along with the blade, increasing its momentum more and more as the muscles in his arms flexed, veins appearing on every part of them. At that point, the water around Ken started to deform completely, all of it getting blasted away as he continued spinning faster and faster. A small tornado was created that blew away all of the water near him, Ken spun more and more, maintaining the tornado for as long as possible. The water raged on as waves started rampaging the shores of the usually calm lake. The tornado itself seemed to get bigger, but Ken knew he wouldn't be able to maintain it for long, as his chakra was already down to a fourth of his reserves after 10 seconds. Ken then stopped spinning, and the tornado around him raged on a little more, using the momentum of his spin, he turned sideways, raising his long blade to the sky. Then Ken proceeded to cut the air vertically with all of his strength, a flying slash materialized from his downward swing, cutting forward and splitting the small tornado in half, breaking it apart and continuing forwards. The flying slash cleaved through the waters and created a large gash into the shores of the lake. The tornado dissipated thanks to the flying slash, and the water started trying to fill in that hole in an instant. Ken's location was quickly flooded, as he took a deep breath of air and dove into the water, resisting the pull of the whirlpool that quickly formed in his previous location. This was the training method he had devised after a year spent on that mountain. Ken had thought he would only train for a few months at first, but the more he trained the more he wanted to train. His strength had grown exponentially in that one year, to the point where he felt confident in facing a jonin in battle, 
instead of just assassinating them. Ken had also developed a few more techniques and even improved whatever he had. The tornado creating one was the current version of the Dragon Twister. The Flying Slash was unnamed, but it was a finisher for Dragon Twister, using the built-up momentum from spinning and the cover of the tornado to send a flying slash at an unsuspecting enemy. Ken had put a lot of thought into using his powers in battle and their practicality. The largest problem he had was actually being underwater, and it was still a huge weakness to him despite training under a lake for a year. While underwater, most of the senses that he could use to feel and track others were basically turned off completely. Underwater, he didn't have a sense of smell, he didn't have hearing as his ears filled with water. He also found it more difficult to feel vibrations in the water than on the ground. Thankfully, he could still feel the energies around him, and he could still somewhat sense movement while within the water. Still, it felt unnatural for him to stand in water for too long. He had made plenty of other discoveries as well though. At this point, after an entire year of training, Ken reached a conclusion. I won't grow much farther if I keep blindly swinging my blade like this. It should have been obvious that he'd reach a roadblock at some point, one would never be able to endlessly grow stronger by doing the same thing over and over again. Ken had already perfected several techniques to use in battle. His control over both chakra and nature energy was perfect, and he could enhance every part of his style with nature energy at this point. He had also managed to notice that whenever his body ran out of chakra, it tried to expel the nature energy at an increased rate, trying to forcefully balance out the powers in his body. During one of those times, when Ken decided to experiment and attract more nature energy while continuing to consume his chakra, something interesting happened. Ken felt scales grow on his body a few seconds after depleting his chakra, and he noticed that his senses and strength sharpened greatly thanks to those mutations, somehow even greater than usual. So, when in a pinch, he could basically use up all of his chakra and enter that second form, where several changes happened to his body. He grew scales that seemed to give him protection against bladed weapons and blunt attacks. It wasn't a lot, but it was a lot better than regular skin. His fingers turned into claws sharp enough to cleave through rock and trees like hot knives through butter and teeth sharp enough to bite through a normal sword with ease. The best part had to be the tail though. In that form, he grew a long and pointy tail with an extremely sharp end that seemed capable of piercing through rocks like they weren't even there. Ken liked that form quite a lot, as it made him stronger in some aspects and allowed him to use moves that were even harder to predict. But it didn't last for too long, although he could somewhat extend the time by meditating and attracting more nature energy into him. It was also a bit dangerous, as Ken once tested it out and turned into a statue, rendering him completely immobile. Thankfully his form reverted whenever his chakra recharged slightly. But he was basically left helpless there for a few minutes, which wasn't exactly acceptable was he in the middle of a fight. So for now, his scaled form was to be kept for emergency situations only. It was better to keep it as a trump card in the first place. The year he had spent training was extremely fruitful. But Ken knew that he didn't have a lot left to improve on. He already knew what shinobi were supposedly capable of in that world. He knew that some could spit fireballs, some could raise huge steam clouds that completely took away vision from others. So, Ken knew that he had to get his hands on some of those techniques. Especially the ones that took away sight from his opponents, as he knew that if he managed to do that, then he'd most likely be able to assassinate even the toughest of opponents. So, Ken washed his red samurai armor and his tattered rags and left them out to dry in the sun for a few hours, before getting dressed and taking all of his belongings. Strapping his bag on his back, as usual, it was full of supplies, boiled lake water slash slightly burnt monster meat, and projectiles, shurikens and sunboss. He also strapped his large blade on his back once more, tying it tightly so it wouldn't slide off while he ran at high speeds through the forests. He also had one more katana strapped to his belt, as the other one had been broken during training. He was now standing at a healthy 1.3 meters tall, 4.27 feet, and his body was well defined, excessive training had gotten rid of any baby fat he might have had left. So, at the age of 9, people would hardly be able to tell whether or not he was a child or a really short adult. Ken was still nowhere near tall enough for his blade though, which was still around 1.6 meters, 5.25 feet, in length. Well, it was around 1.78, 5.84 feet, meters if one counted the hilt as well. But at this point, Ken was able to use it so smoothly that its length was no longer even an issue. So, with confident steps, Ken walked down the mountain as a smile rose on his face, putting on his mask and whistling a cheery tune. He had high hopes for his journey, he knew what he wanted to achieve for now, which was learning some jutsu that he would actually be able to use. He had a long way to go before actually getting to a city though. 
Ken traveled quite a while before getting a scent of other humans. More precisely, he managed to find tracks of quite a few people, leading through the woods in what seemed to be a clearing somewhere. Ken followed the tracks and the smell for a while, all until he started smelling more and more things in the distance, his other senses were also picking up movements and sounds. I must be close to a village of some kind. Ken jumped from tree to tree without any restriction, before eventually stopping himself. This blade on my back will definitely attract attention to me. Ken realized at that point that his crimes would be known if the long blade was recognized by others and if a wanted poster was made of him, the situation would be a bit more annoying. Ken had thought about taking his revenge on the Land of Iron and its lord, but he wanted first to kill the Seven Swordsmen before that. So he wanted to lay low for a while, to avoid alerting any of his enemies of his survival and or whereabouts. Therefore, Ken quickly decided on a course of action, jumping a bit away from the village and finding a large tree. Ken managed to climb it quickly, needing only a leap to get on top of it. He unsheathed his large blade, letting the sheet fall to the side on some branches as he directed its tip to the bark of the tree. His long blade slipped into the bark of the tree with ease, Ken burying it completely, including its hilt. With one finger touching the hilt of the blade, Ken flowed his chakra into it, widening the hole in the process and slightly burning the inside of the tree. Ken pulled the blade out with a thread of chakra, sheathing it again and sliding it right into the small hole that he had created. With his weapon hidden, Ken proceeded to walk towards the village, keeping his katana strapped to his belt for protection. It wasn't an uncommon thing to do in the Land of Iron, the majority of travelers carried weapons, and it was more uncommon to see one unarmed. He was still alone though, something that travelers used to avoid due to the constant presence of mountain bandits. Which meant people would still look at him weirdly. Ken walked by plenty of people, many of them turning their heads and staring at the strange ronin coming alone from the wilderness. At first, some thought it was a lost child, and wanted to approach it and ask about its parents and whether or not it was safe. The poor villagers didn't have any means to take care of a child, but they could at least report the appearance of one to the proper authorities, and make sure they are sent to an orphanage. But their thoughts about it being a child dissipated after seeing him walk a few steps into the village. The katana sheathed on his belt said all that they needed to hear. The confident gait and the controlled breathing that not one of them could even feel. The person in front of them was most certainly just an extremely short man. A short man that also happened to be a highly trained samurai slash ronin. His physique was hidden by armor and tattered hides, his hair was overgrown and spiky, reaching all the way to his lower back. His hands were covered in dirt bandages that looked old to anyone that saw them. One phrase could be used to describe the wandering ronin. And that would be a fine mess. Fine as in, his confidence didn't seem to be hindered by the fact that he looked as if he'd just come out of a war. But his confidence didn't really change the fact that he needed a new outfit. If it wasn't for his somewhat clean clothes, people would have actually thought he was fleeing a battlefield. But the rags he was wearing were clean, albeit ripped and torn in many places. Ken walked more and more, eventually finding what was essentially the only in slash tavern in that small village. He walked in without anyone stopping him, many already deciding not to get involved with him at first sight. Ken's appearance didn't exactly help him get along well with other people, his mask wasn't exactly a friendly sight, he simply had a troubling presence that prevented others from approaching. The fact that Ken was a wandering samurai meant that he could only bring trouble to a peaceful village, so a lot of the people inside the building went away as soon as they saw him enter, emptying the chairs around him as he took his seat at the bar. Give me some sake? Ken's voice was raspy, he hadn't used it in a long time, and the last time he had it was to laugh like a madman and or interrogate a victim. Right away? The barmaid looked at the ronin with a raised eyebrow. His voice sounded young, but she couldn't quite put a finger on it. Regardless, child soldiers weren't all that uncommon in their lands anyway. Many families sold away their children to lords in order to get rid of unwanted children. Those children were usually either just used as slaves for labor or turned into child soldiers depending on their talents. The world wasn't a nice place, everyone knew that, but everyone did their best to live a good within their own bubbles. Which was why getting involved with a suspicious-looking stranger wasn't quite ideal. Oi, you brat. Are you even old enough to drink? But not everyone was as reserved. Every herd had its black sheep, and drunkards wasting away their health by drowning themselves in alcohol wasn't all that uncommon. Unfortunately, alcohol had the side effect of dampening one's reasoning and thought process. Ken didn't bother replying to the drunk man's grumble, the barmaid placed down a cup in front of him and poured him a full glass of sake. Ha! Huh. Akino, didn't think you'd actually give it to him. Why'd you refuse to give me dash, the drunk man's words were more and more disjointed as the conversation went on. His demeanor seemed to weird out the barmaid, as she took two steps back. 
The drunk man just laughed, extending his hand to drink Ken's cup of sake. Before his fingers could even touch the cup, the hilt of Ken's sword was already shoved into his mouth, making some of his teeth creak as the drunk's gums seemed to bleed visibly. The drunk man's eyes widened as he quickly took two steps back and fell on his ass, grabbing at his mouth and screaming in muffled agony. Ken didn't do anything else besides that, he hadn't even moved his head during the altercation, making others think he wasn't even looking at the drunk man. The drunkard was injured and in a lot of pain, but he was also extremely angered by what had just happened. He was going to get up and show that arrogant Ronan his place. Thankfully, his suicide was unsuccessful. As two other men intervened and dragged the drunk man off before more problems rose. Sorry for that? Ken said as he tilted his head a bit. The scared barmaid also bowed a bit and muttered an apology. The rest of the clientele were also able to sigh in relief when hearing that. At the very least the traveler wasn't all that bloodthirsty. He also had decided not to deal any serious injury to the drunkard, although many other ronin in his place would have likely cut off a limb or two from the drunkard, merely as a show of power. At least the young man in front of them was not a violent individual. Ken then took off his mask, his head was forever facing his sake glass, many patrons were rather curious about the swordman's hidden appearance. He was clearly powerful, so it only made sense for him to hide his features. Usually, talented people were also the most beautiful, so some of the female clients present were watching the short man take his mask off with quite a lot of expectation in their gaze. Ken didn't bother to hide his face, but not many managed to get a glimpse of it, as his head was angled downwards, seemingly, staring, at his sake cup. Ken downed the glass instantly, then placed his mask back on just as quickly as he had taken it down. He released a satisfied sigh, as the familiar taste of alcohol filled his mouth and somewhat numbed his molars. Drinking was something that Ken had wanted to do for quite a while now. He had always enjoyed a good drink in his past life. It was a habit that he had given up. But after losing his family, he felt the need for one familiar taste of his past, to remind him once more of what type of person could thrive in that world. By now, Ken obviously knew it as well. A family man and a caring person would only be wronged in that world without proper strength. Even if they had strength, they would still be taken advantage of, as that was the way of the world. No, the ones that truly thrived in that world were the ones that were just like he had once been. Senseless killers, hunters looking to sate a sadistic kind of hunger. Be it money, fame or even pleasure, only those that were willing to kill for it would be rewarded. As that was the type of world Ken found himself in. Ken drank with thoughts of his enemy on his mind, as he reminded himself of something. From now on, the men I will be facing will all be just like I used to be. Those who murder must be in turn prepared to die, just like I was. Let's see if they have the same principles as I did. With that thought in mind, Ken got up and left, the familiar taste of alcohol still in his mouth as he hummed his way out of the tavern, leaving behind a rather mortified barmaid. The barmaid had been the only one to see Ken's face. Or what remained of it. It honestly looked like he had been mauled by a wild animal. She froze up when looking at that face for the few seconds that it had been in view. H how can someone live like that? No, scratch that. How can someone become a powerful samurai like that? Her thoughts quickly started jumping from theory to theory, as she tried to rationalize what was in front of her. The man had no eyes to speak of, so how exactly was he accurate enough to not only shove his hilt into the drunkard's moth, but how exactly was he navigating around so normally, as if nothing was different about him when compared to others. She was so shocked and entrapped in her own thoughts that she had even forgotten to ask Ken to pay for his drink. Ken had spent the last few days gathering information covertly within that village. He had managed to get some information in the village from listening to rumors while hidden on rooftops. Now, shinobi weren't exactly a subject matter for villagers of the Land of Iron. But this particular village happened to also be at the border with the Land of Lightning. So, the matters of shinobi did seem to concern them quite a bit. That was how Ken managed to find out more about the war that was happening outside of the Land of Iron, concerning all of the other elemental nations. It was titled the Second A Great Ninja War, apparently, shinobi were quite prone to starting wars with each other. The Land of Iron was a neutral land, so it was usually left out of the conflict. It was also a powerful nation, so no one tried to take advantage of it or start any war with it. But the villagers that lived at the borders of the Land of Iron were still in danger sometimes, as injured shinobi could sometimes flee to that neutral land out of desperation and bring trouble and conflict to the otherwise peaceful life of the villagers. Ken was very interested in hearing about the war. War caused chaos, and chaos was something he could easily use to his advantage. So he collected as much information as he could in the following days, scouting in the evenings and at night. Then he retreated to a random tree in the forest during the day to rest for a bit and think more about the information he gathered. 
Now was the time to reflect on the information he had gathered. From the start, Ken already knew that learning the techniques of the shinobi he heard so much about was going to be hard. But he only realized that it was going to be actually impossible as he sat there and thought more about the situation. The techniques of shinobi were mostly guarded by clans and hidden villages. They had a monopoly on them and only a few basic ones were out publicly. The ones that were out were the ones that Koji had bought him on his birthday. They weren't all that special, and all academy students ranging from 6 to 12 could perform them with varying levels of mastery. Ken heard more and more information about conflicts happening near the border, which made him hopeful about finding a few soon-to-be corpses and searching them for any scrolls with techniques. It wasn't uncommon for training shinobi to sometimes carry their training materials with them, so Ken was rather confident in finding something. That was where his biggest hurdle came in though? How exactly would he go about reading and learning them? The first thought that Ken had was to simply borrow a shinobi from the battlefield and lightly coerce him into reading out the scrolls for him. But the problem was that most shinobi were taught about interrogation techniques and how to act in such situations from the age of six. So Ken knew that it would be hard to tell if they were lying to him, unlike the usual gate guards that he had interrogated before, he now had to deal with trained child soldiers, so things were a bit more difficult. Ken also thought about paying one of the villagers to read the techniques out for him. But none of the villagers likely wanted to be implicated in anything related to shinobi, so it would be hard to find one willing to help. Rumors would also arise if he got refused too often, and his suspicious activity would get him reported to authorities and on the radar of the samurai and also the shinobi that infiltrated the land of iron. How do I find someone willing to help me? No, I'll think more about it after actually getting the scrolls that I need. Ken smiled underneath his mask as he started resting for the day. He would start traveling after resting for a bit. Ken didn't rest for long though, his sleep was also not deep, merely dozing off and resting his tensed up muscles and tired bones. He started traveling as soon as the sun started setting, collecting his main weapon from its hiding place and starting to jump towards the land of lightning. Ken instantly noticed the change in vegetation and weather in between the lands. The land of lightning seemed to always be cloudy, the temperatures there were a bit less arctic, although not exactly hot by any stretch of the imagination. Ken could hear the thunder in the distance as he traveled covertly. The clouds cast shadows in his surroundings, as his speed turned him into nothing more than a black blur that moved across the leaves. Eventually, after an entire week of traveling and scouting out the lands of the shinobi, he was able to find out more about the land of lightning. The nights were especially stormy, but the days were rather warm, so he had a nice warm blanket of the sun while sleeping in a tree. After traveling further into the land, Ken eventually found the tracks of a group of shinobi. He tracked group after group, looking for his intended target for days on end. He didn't bother to even try and attack groups with only adults, as they weren't exactly guaranteed to have anything related to training on their person. Three sets of lower-sized sandals and one with bigger sandals. Three child soldiers and one adult, likely the team leader. Ken proceeded to follow the tracks around for a while, shinobi weren't the easiest to track, all of them being adept at hiding their tracks and moving covertly. Hell, without his enhanced senses Ken wouldn't have been able to track them at all. Eventually, Ken found the group, camping in a small cave. Three young boys and one masked adult. Ken stalked them for a few hours while trying to decide on a course of action. From their direction, he could tell that they were headed even further inland, most likely going back to the hidden village. At that point, they were unlikely to run into any enemies, unless they were ambushed in the middle of their own territory. That wasn't exactly a matter with high probability, so Ken decided to take them first and take everything he could find. When attacking such a well-structured group, one would always strike the strongest enemy first, deal as much damage while taking them by surprise. Ken was confident in his stealth and assassination skills, confident enough to kill just about anyone with enough preparation. But the current situation made his stealth skills quite useless. The group were holding out in a small cave, on the side of a cliff. It was a strategic position and one that allowed the group to hold out easily. Assassins are always annoying to deal with. Ken knew that from his past life, the adult was likely also a skilled assassin, at least as skilled as the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Against an experienced assassin, one couldn't exactly just rock up to their front door and hope to be able to take them by surprise. No, the Jonin, leading the team of what were most likely Jenin, was already expecting an attack. He was in a state of high awareness even while on allied territory. Ken could respect that, the mark of a truly skilled individual was exactly that, not having your guard down at any time, in any situation, not even in your own home. That was also the reason Ken had managed to kill all of the assassins after his life when he was ambushed by his partners. 
He wasn't expecting them to do it, but he was prepared for it. Alas, he had only been strong enough to kill them, unable to escape afterwards. He was limited by the strength that humans could achieve in that world. Now he was strong, but he wasn't about to fight head-on against people that had such strange techniques. It didn't seem like a smart option at all. After thinking for a bit more, Ken started analyzing his enemy a bit more. The cave was a great position. One that allowed one to perfectly defend against attackers. But was that really it? Sure, it was decent for a knight, but it was a bit strange, not exactly what Ken would have chosen. No skilled assassin would ever leave himself this open. If an assault truly happened then they'd just be stuck in that cave, defending. This wouldn't be a good option. So, Ken started stalking around the small cave, climbing the cliff and circling around the forest for a bit. Eventually, he found it. A small hole underneath the trunk of a great tree, hard to notice with the open eye, but Ken was able to sense it, as the tree had already died because of it. This was definitely dug up in preparation. The Land of Lightning should have plenty of such camps around their territory. Ken quickly took a mental note of that, before slipping into the hole and landing in a small tunnel. He was forced to take his long blade into his hand, he contemplated bringing it with him, but it was far too long to use comfortably in a closed environment, so he decided he'd rather keep his smaller katana for now. Ken walked silently further in, by now he could smell his targets. He didn't have anything against them, he didn't hate them, but they were unlucky enough to be the first such group that he had found. It's kill or be killed. All of them are the same. Ken had no choice in the matter. He could either get strong or die trying. The people he was attacking wouldn't hesitate if they were in his shoes, so he wasn't exactly racked with guilt. After all, everyone he was facing was the same as he once was. And so, Ken unsheathed his blade silently and continued walking down the dark tunnel, prepared to do what he knew best. Now, Ken knew he couldn't simply approach the shinobi from behind and expect it to work perfectly. Any skilled assassin would pay attention to both entrances to their hideouts, even if one of them were technically a secret escape route. A jonin would likely have traps prepared for both sides, and methods to escape from assaults on both entrances. Ken knew that, but he also had absolute confidence in his technique and lack of presence. The traps weren't enough to hold him back, he was easily able to feel them as he didn't need to rely on his eyes. The cavern he was in was completely dark, and an intruder would only be able to see using a source of light, which would likely alert the jonin hiding in the cave. Thanks to those factors, he was able to get closer and closer to his target, crawling on the ceiling like a reptile. He was using an extremely small amount of chakra only on his fingertips and the tip of his shoes to stick to the rocky surface. It wasn't a difficult technique, Ken had mastered it during his training while looking for ways to better utilize chakra on his own. He was basically imitating a spider's movements, which was exactly what he had been attempting to do anyway. And, just like any spider, he was preparing to wrap his webs around his prey. Currently, the jonin and two of the genin were resting. All of them sat down with closed eyes. The third boy had his eyes peeled open at the entrance, sometimes also turning his head slightly towards the hidden escape path, likely having been entrusted by the team leader to do so. Now, usually, this would mean that it was a free game for Ken to just kill them all in quick succession. But he could easily tell that the jonin wasn't actually resting. He seemed to simply have his eyes closed and he was faking his breathing, making it shallower to imitate the one of a sleeping person. But Ken could distinguish it, as slight alterations still existed here and there. His enhanced senses were easily able to pick up any irregularity, no matter how small. The jonin had likely decided to rest when getting back to their city and to safety. Ken stopped just a few meters off of their spot, just a few centimeters off where they would be able to spot him thanks to the campfire's light. Well, at least the jonin would be able to spot him. The jenin weren't anywhere near skilled enough to notice him as long as he stood close enough to the rocks. Ken decided to do what he knew best. Create a distraction and go in for the kill. A technique as old as time, but still one of the most effective. Ken formed a hand sign with one hand, creating an imperfect clone right underneath him. It didn't have a face, and its armor was of the wrong color, but it was enough. The clone dashed towards the sleeping jonin, while Ken crawled further, passing through the light of the flame in the same instant, as the jonin jumped up and stabbed towards the clone with a kunai. The jonin was prepared for something to happen, his instincts had been telling him about something happening for a while, he felt watched. But he simply couldn't feel anyone or anything nearby. The second his eyes caught sight of that shadow coming from their built escape path, he instantly attacked it. He didn't stop to consider the possibility of it being a clone, it was impossible to discern with how little presence his pursuer had. Just as his kanai was about to pass through the clone, he saw it simply disappear as he felt a metallic string cutting into his neck. 
Instantly, the Jonin reeled back, substituting himself with a lighting clone which had its head swiftly cut off. The Jonin instantly started making more hand signs, preparing to spit out a large fireball in the direction of their escape paths. Just as his chest rose up, he felt the air leave his body. Ken was crouched up behind him, his blade already inside the Jonin's lung, missing his heart as the Jonin shifted his position slightly by reflex. The shinobi gasped, turning around quickly and spitting fire behind him. The Jonin by the campfire all quickly scrambled out of the way, most having just realized how dire the situation was. Run! The Jonin shouted, hoping that they'd at least escape and report the situation. Just as those words left his mouth, Ken stabbed a senbo toward his temple. The Jonin quickly ducked, avoiding it perfectly as he cursed the lack of lighting within the cave. His opponent was basically dancing circles around him. His previous fireball had only served to rise up smoke and take away even more of his vision. Ken jumped from wall to wall, throwing senbos and shuriken towards the Jonin in quick succession. The Jonin quickly made a few more hand signs, a wall of earth rising in front of him as he tapped the ground. Unknowingly, that move had already sealed his fate. The Jonin hadn't even managed to notice it due to the chaos, but he was already facing toward the entrance, and Ken had always been directing himself towards it. In raising that wall, Jonin had cut off what little light he had, and he had also managed to leave his students alone with Ken. The Jonin had no idea that had happened, still looking around warily as he waited for his ghastly opponent to show himself. Meanwhile, on the other side of the wall, the Jonin had barely managed to reach the cave entrance before Ken appeared in front of them. All of them quickly stalled, but they seemed to have plenty of training, as they all instantly started making hand signs. Ken could feel them, but they were much slower than the Jonin. Ken's katana was still stuck in the Jonin's chest, but he didn't need a sword to deal with Jenin. Before any of them could even finish their first jutsu, Ken was already in front of the closest one to him, his hand piercing through his chest cleanly. The one that had his chest pierced was too flabbergasted to do anything, his hands falling limply to his side, his body suspended in the air on Ken's arm. The sight of his quick and terrifying death managed to somewhat shake the still inexperienced Jenin. This led to one of them making a small mistake in his hand signs, as Ken threw the body toward them. The one that had also been flustered was hit head on, while the one still making hand signs managed to jump to the side. His jutsu finally being finished as he brought his hands together one last time and shot a smaller ball of fire toward Ken from his mouth. Ken shot from his position, jumping from wall to wall like a frog and appearing behind the Jenin in less than a second. The Jenin had taken out a kunai, but didn't even get to turn around before Ken grabbed his head and crushed it into the nearby cave wall. Ken then simply threw a senbo through the head of the last Jenin, who was still getting up and pushing his teammate's body from atop him. The entire confrontation with the three Jenin had only taken five seconds. Ken was rather pleased with the time, he was also pleased with seeing so many jutsu from the shinobi. He had remembered very few being used in the show, so he would have a blast learning more of them. Just a few seconds after he finished the Jenin off, the wall in the middle of the cave was blasted apart, with the Jonin jumping out, clutching his side, not even having removed the blade yet. Then he saw the scene in front of him, with all of his pupils dead and strewn across the floor near the cave entrance. Shit! The Jonin finally lost his cool with that, failing to notice the figure clutching onto the roof of the cave right near the entrance. Just as he was looking around, Ken's hands reached down, before the Jonin could even react, his gaze was forcibly moved behind him, forcing him to stare at the blown-out campfire he had just come from. W-wa-dash? Those were the Jonin's last words, as Ken landed soundlessly on the ground right in front of him. Ken then proceeded to start scavenging the corpses of the Jenin, as the squad leader simply fell on the floor, motionless. The blind assassin whistled happily as he found more and more supplies. Each of the shinobi had been carrying a pouch, each pouch had at least 20 shuriken and 3 kunais. Ken strapped all of them to his belt as he continued to search their pockets. Most of them were empty, only carrying some random pills that Ken had no clue about. The genin that seemed to have trained the most did seem to have three scrolls on him, which made Ken extremely excited. Ken also found a few scrolls on the jonin, and he basically took everything that he could carry with him. After that, he threw all of the bodies inside the cave, right over the fire. He sat down and warmed himself up for a bit, ignoring the smell of burning bodies as he went and retrieved his blades. With everything he owned back in his possession, Ken departed from that cave. Outside of it, he decided to cover his tracks a bit more, taking out his long blade with a smirk. His chakra flowed through the blade, flowing in as nature energy also started filling the blade, making it vibrate slightly with the wind. Ken didn't bother with much build-up this time, merely swinging his blade in a downward motion, sending a flying slash into the cave. 
The cave shook, as the rocks were cleaved and pushed aside. The flying slash kept cutting into the rock for at least 50 meters, as the cave simply collapsed. Ken then proceeded to just flee, not even leaving a footprint behind for evidence. POV Ken, so acquiring the scrolls wasn't all that difficult in the end. Well, I can only hope that they are scrolls with techniques and not just mission details. There should be something here though, how many mission detail scrolls can they even have anyway? I'll be able to discern them as soon as I get someone to read them for me. The problem is finding someone willing enough to do so. Traveling back to that village on the border won't take me long if I just take a straight line and don't try to find any shinobi tracks. I think I had my eyes on someone that should be capable enough to read shinobi techniques. Out of everyone in the village, his chakra reserves were the greatest. Even comparable to some chunin, I think. Well, better get to it, I should be able to convince him to help me. If he's talented, then I might even recruit him. He's a bit older, but it should be fine. I should be able to train just about anyone into a professional killer. I wasn't exactly a spring chicken when starting my killing spree either. Age doesn't matter much in this job, only limits the ones without imagination. I was 21 when starting my worldwide killing spree in my past life. They only managed to catch me at 42. Well, I'll see if I can salvage a warrior out of him. Building a small organization would help me quite a bit in this world. I especially need information. I need the organization to act as my eyes in this world. The more I see, the stronger I am. It will take a while to build it up. But I should be able to do so. Now. Let's see how he responds to my invitation. POV narration, it wasn't a great month for Tasho Jutomo. Especially the last two weeks. Ever since the incident at the bar where he had harassed a stranger carrying a blade. Not only were a few teeth on his mouth loosened, but the other villagers also started to hate his guts after that incident. He was the common village drunk, he worked all odd jobs that he could find in order to fuel his alcohol addiction. But all of that was ruined due to one stupid mistake on his part. He couldn't even blame the swordsman that had briefly visited their village, as he hadn't escalated the situation either, merely pushing him away with the sheath of his sword. But that incident led to the disaster that was unfolding in his life currently. Due to being deemed a troublesome individual, no other citizens were willing to give him any jobs. No one was allowing him to help in any fields, no lawns to mown down with his scythe, and no fences that needed fixing. So, he was now stuck drinking away the last pennies he had. His pouch was getting lighter and lighter every evening. He wasn't even allowed in the bar anymore, so he had to buy his drinks and get drunk in the field, all by himself. And I was set up to have such a nice future. Tasho could still remember the time when he had gone to school. The Shinobi Academy. Tasho was initially born in Kumogakure, the village hidden by clouds. He was young and hopeful when he finished his studies, he had been top of his class once. Only to be instantly thrown into a war the second he graduated. Still wet behind the ears and forced to kill people for his village. His luck hadn't been good though, running into a Chunin in his first confrontation. He was heavily injured and forced to flee to the land of iron. By now, he had completely integrated into life there, long since forgetting most of his techniques. Very few he could still remember, only those that he could use in his daily life and for convenience. His country had never looked for him either. Why would they ever care about a mere genin missing during a war? He was likely just written off as dead and forgotten about. As an orphan, he didn't have anyone to return to, no one to miss him. I worked so hard back then. What the hell happened to me? He was now laying in a field, drunk and dizzy while staring at the starry sky with glazed over eyes. Once dubbed a talented child, now nothing more than a 31-year-old waste of life. And, just as he was mulling over those thoughts, a shadow seemed to cover his face. Tasho blinked a few times, confused. Then he noticed a small figure towering over his head, staring down at him as if he was nothing more than a bug. Tasho was instantly alerted, but he couldn't get up, his body refusing to respond to his commands. So, he was stuck there, eyes wide open, staring at the red dot on the mask of the figure in front of him. S shit. It's him. Tasho instantly recognized the person standing over him, but he was too dizzy to do anything. Is he here for revenge? I guess I was nearing my end anyway. And just like that, Tasho closed his eyes, waiting for his death to come swiftly. You seem... tired? Instead of drawing his blade and slicing his head off, the figure spoke. A raspy voice seemed to scratch at Tasho's ears, as his eyes cracked open again. He could see the figure tilting its head slightly, its black locks flowing in the wind as its blood-red armor shined in the moonlight. Heh. Didn't think you'd be chatty. If you don't want to kill me, then what do you want? Come to laugh at me? Tasho scowled a bit, he wasn't really a fan of the situation. But he couldn't exactly move yet either. It was a miracle that he could even think straight with how drunk he was. So noisy. So helpless. 
so pathetic. Ken reached to his back, took out his long blade, still sheathed, and stabbed it into the ground right near Tasho's head. The former child soldier didn't even flinch, only narrowing his eyes once more as he started to regain feeling in his body, the fear sobering him up effectively. Wadash, Tasho's words were interrupted by Ken's own voice. Do you really want your end to be this pathetic? Tasho's eyes widened in shock when hearing those words, it had been a while since he had heard someone express such disappointment towards him. Is your silence a sign of you giving up? I guess you were nothing more than a drunk at the end of the day. The world won't miss you. Ken's raspy voice ground at Tasho's ears, and his eyes filled with rage when hearing Ken's tone and words. Ken then unsheathed the katana at his waist, bringing it over his head, preparing to decapitate the drunk Tasho. Like hell. I won't give up this easily. Tasho's voice sounded out as his body seemed to tremble in rage. Ken's sword came down slower than his usual speed, as Tasho rolled out of the way in an almost practiced motion, making Ken smile under his mask. I guess you weren't such a waste of time after all. That was the last thing Tasho heard, as Ken appeared in front of him and slammed the hilt of his katana into his chin, knocking him out instantly. Ken then grabbed his blade, pulling it out of the earth and placing it back on his back, and sheathed his katana once more. The blind swordsman then walked over to his unconscious new recruit and grabbed him by the collar, dragging him off into the night. I will start by training him a bit, after he's more familiar with me I'll be able to talk him into being my eyes from now on. POV narration, the next thing that Tasho knew when he woke up was that he was in a cave. At least he assumed so, as he couldn't see anything at all. It was pitch black, not a single thing could be made out. He couldn't recognize where he was, nor remember how he had gotten there, but he knew what had happened before that. That masked man? No, it should be a child. That tone of voice is too strange. Tasho could clearly remember almost being beheaded by that masked child, the hairs on the back of his neck stood when he remembered the feeling of cold despair that had washed over him in those final moments. Through newfound willpower, he had managed to somehow roll away. Most likely thanks to his previous life as a child soldier. Still, the masked child showcased a much superior speed to his own and knocked him out almost instantly. Is he a shinobi? Or maybe a samurai? The Land of Iron doesn't involve its young in warfare like the elemental nations, so that shouldn't be the case. Tasho quickly started struggling against his bindings. The rope around him seemed to be wrapped loosely, which allowed him to move his arms to some extent. Slowly but surely, his bindings came off, and he shakily got up. He was thankfully not hurting anywhere, he ran his hands across his body to make sure, so he was well aware of his own condition. While touching the wall, he started walking forward blindly, hugging the wall for as long as he could until he eventually reached an entrance. It didn't lead outside, and there was no light in that room, but Tasho could tell it was bigger, the temperature in it dropping a bit and the echo of his steps becoming a bit more noticeable. Tasho continued walking to a side, sticking to the wall, knowing it was his best bet at finding an exit and avoiding any holes that he could fall into. That was when it happened. Dodge? A raspy and low voice followed by something more, substantial. A loud thump and a burning sensation on Tasho's side, the sheath of a long blade hitting him in the side and sending him tumbling towards the middle of the large room. Do as instructed. Was the first thing Tasho heard when his ears cleared and he managed to catch his breath once more. He quickly got up, opening his eyes and trying to look around desperately, but the room was still pitch black, so he might as well have not opened his eyes at all. Dodge? He heard again, and before he could even react, another strike hit his leg, making him kneel once more. He expected a follow-up, so he put up his guard in a hurry, but nothing came. Tasho recognized that voice now, it was also the only person obviously looking to torment him in some way. Why are you doing this? Tasho asked with a frantic tone, still kneeling as he raised his arms around his head in a defensive manner. Drunk, useless, weak, pathetic. The words echoed in that cave as Tasho clutched at his head in fear. Do you want to go back to that? Or do you want to become strong? Ken's voice sounded in the cave, emotionless, uncaring, absolutely chilling for the scared former child soldier. Tasho tried his best to locate Ken using that voice, but he had no chance thanks to the echo in the cave. He looked around frantically again, hoping for something to happen, and then Ken's words finally managed to sink in. This. This isn't some form of torture or prolonged execution. This is training? Tasho immediately realized what was happening after that. Ken wasn't his enemy, but rather the opposite, the masked child wanted him to grow stronger. Tasho had no clue why that was. How was he, a washed-up drunkard and former child soldier, supposed to be of use to someone like Ken? Ken was an exceedingly young, talented and powerful swordsman slash shinobi. And he? 
Well, he was already past his prime, no one would even give him the time of day. So why? The more he thought about Ken, his masked attacker, the more confused he was. But there was also a feeling of awe slithering in the depths of his mind. Ken was even faster than Tasho's former Jonin teachers while being most likely younger than or just as young as Academy graduates. Tasho took a few seconds to mull over his life till that point, all that he had gone through and the humiliation he had suffered. After that, he started getting up again. If someone like him shows interest in my talent, then I will at least try not to disappoint him. Dodge? Another auditory cue was given and another blunt strike hit him. This time, his guard was up, so his arm took the brunt of that hit. He rolled on the ground, the force of that strike made it clear that it wasn't meant to be blocked. The second Tasho got up again, he heard Ken's voice again. Dodge. A bit louder this time, and he was struck in the back. This continued for a while, as Tasho slowly remembered the jutsus he had learned in his youth, that stressful situation managing to force them out of his mind in order to find some way to defend himself. He tried to use a sensory technique, but he wasn't able to get even the faintest whiff of a chakra signature beside his own. Then he got struck down again. Then he tried to use a defensive jutsu, raising an earth wall. The wall was broken instantly, and he was sent flying further, injured by both the sheath and the broken rocks. Making clones also didn't work. Tasho wanted to use a few more visual illusions, but each time he tried something he was struck to the ground regardless. With each word spoken, a strike was sent Tasho's way, and more and more pain accumulated. With each strike, Tasho grew calmer. The more pain he felt, the more focused he became. Eventually, nearing the end of that grueling training, he managed to sense one single strike. He could feel it approaching, a moment of pure comprehension, as his eyesight seemed to be forgotten completely. Tasho had no clue whether it was thanks to the auditory cue or a sickening sense of premonition after hundreds of strikes, but he managed to roll away in time. Ken's sheath hit the ground loudly. And that was also where the training stopped, as Tasho collapsed to the ground, unable to get up anymore. He was injured, to the point where he couldn't even move anymore. I can't. I'm too tired. Tasho felt his entire body burning with both fatigue and pain. There was not a part of his body that was uninjured. He was not passing out, holding on with sheer will. Then he started to hear a rock being moved, and a light shined into the cave room. Clearing up his surroundings as he closed his eyes, readjusting slowly to the sunlight seeping into the large cave. He was in a cave that seemed to have been formed naturally but was in large net unnaturally, the room he had come from was also dug up. Then he saw a shadow coming closer and closer to him. Looking up, he saw that exact same mask that had looked over him in the past. The same wild and overgrown spiky hair, the same blood-red armor covered by a tattered black cloth. You did a lot better than anticipated. You lasted around five hours even. With this type of determination, you are bound to go far above ordinary. Ken's voice sounded out, this time his tone wasn't cold or uncaring, which shocked Tasho, instead, it was warm, prideful even. Tasho smiled widely when feeling the odd warmth in Ken's words, before finally passing out in the warmth of the sun. Ken simply let out a sigh as he looked at his trainee. A lot better than I expected. He actually surpassed my expectations a lot. He was quite resourceful too. I guess my judgment was right this time around. Ken shook his head in the end. Retracting that last thought as another one replaced it. Can't say his success has anything to do with me though. He was the one to motivate himself and break his limits. In that manner, Ken gained a newfound sense of respect for his trainee. I should probably get to bandaging him though, don't want him dying on me. POV narration, 3 weeks. That was all it took for Tasho to completely respect his new master slash teacher, who he now knew was named Ken. Tasho felt odd about addressing a child with such titles at first. But one thing became clear after a while. Ken certainly had the skill to be called those things. He also had the temperament and mentality of a teacher. If he didn't know any better, he would have thought Ken was actually a lot older than him. But he could tell Ken's age rather easily, especially after spending so much time with him. The biggest indicators came in when Ken was relaxed. Which was only whenever he took a 3-4 to four hour nap. Tasho somehow could tell that Ken was still alert even then, but when his body was relaxed, he looked about as normal as a child could be. Well, without the red armor, mask and swords. Ken's voice was still somewhat hoarse, but the hint of youthfulness in it was a lot more pronounced now that he had a bit more practice with social interactions. The masked child also didn't bother to change his tone or even hide it in any way. He simply couldn't care less. Tasho actually learned that Ken was actually using his age as a weapon against others. People will drop their guard more when they see their opponent as a child, even when child soldiers are common. 
Since everyone was once a child soldier, adults tend to have more confidence as they also tend to think they have more experience. Tasho sweated a bit when hearing that explanation. Well, they do have more experience? Normally, adult shinobi had a lot more practice and experience than any academy child. Tasho could somehow tell that this wasn't the case with Ken. Maybe it was a gut feeling? Maybe it was somehow related to the fact that Ken had decapitated a bear and sheathed his blade in the blink of an eye. Regardless, at that point, Tasho was well aware that sticking around with Ken was for his own benefit. In those three weeks, Ken had trained him daily. And at that point, he was a lot more proficient at dodging hits while in the dark. Although he still got hit often. Tasho was satisfied though, as he had made a lot of progress in an extremely short time. His reflexes also got sharpened quite a bit. He had lashed out to Ken at some point early into their training. As he found it particularly harsh and he couldn't quite see how it helped him at the time. Ken didn't even answer him, he simply swung his sheathed sword towards him, and out of reflex, Tasho actually blocked it, his eyes widening but as his body had almost reacted instinctively. Even if your mind has some catching up to do, your body has already learnt a lot. That moment had somewhat humbled Tasho once again. As he decided to stop questioning Ken altogether. Then he learned about Ken's condition. He found out in a strange way, as Ken simply took off his mask to eat some meat. Usually, Ken would have just moved it slightly to the side, and eaten like that, but now he decided to take it off completely. This had most likely because he had gotten a bit more comfortable around Tasho, who was basically his student at that point. That was the first time Tasho had gotten a good look at his teacher's face. It was a bit stomach churning. It certainly wasn't what he had been expecting. So a conversation started. H have you always been like that? Tasho asked while scratching the back of his head, unsure if Ken's condition was a taboo subject or not. Surprisingly for him, Ken didn't seem bothered by that question. Since I was born. I guess I was just unlucky in this aspect. Though, my luck manifested in different ways. Ken couldn't deny the fact that he was lucky. He was lucky to have been born with a special body, even if blind. He was lucky to have been rescued and raised by his real family, the samurai. He was only alive thanks to that luck of his. Otherwise, he would have died not long after his birth. I see. I mean, I understand. Tasho seemed to be somewhat unsure of what words to use, which made Ken chuckle a bit. Don't bother mincing words with me, recruit. His voice sounded serious for one moment, sending a shiver up Tasho's spine as he muttered back. Why yes, sir. Sir Dash, I'll be honest with you. Ken continued to speak, making Tasho stop his unneeded apologies. You are the first of many? You are to be a leading figure for the group that I plan to build in the future, a teacher and a mentor. Tasho's eyes widened when he heard that, he immediately felt flattered at being given that opportunity. He still considered himself a washed up genin after all. T thank you. I will do my best to meet your expectations. He kneeled before Ken this time, showing his loyalty as well as his desire to grow stronger. No need for that. Needless posturing won't get you far. Ken's words caused Tasho to awkwardly get up, but he still appreciated that Ken didn't ask him to lower himself. The organization will be my eyes, my ears, my nose. And my sword if I so desire. Ken said as he leaned on the long blade he carried with him. I understand. Do you plan to compete with the hidden villages? Tasho still wanted to know more, since he was meant to be a leading figure, he needed to at least know the forces they'd be facing in the future. I've no gripe with the villages. We will mainly collect bounties from the bingo book, which will be our main source of income. Tasho nodded when hearing that, somewhat glad that they weren't going to be gunning after the hidden villages. No organization made in a few years could take down a hidden village after all. They had too much power in the form of unique bloodlines and decades of experience. Tasho didn't even want to think about the number of soldiers the villages had. Thousands died constantly in their wars, yet they seemed to be able to throw more and more shinobi on the front lines as they competed with one another. The hidden villages were a frightful existence, and that was just what Tasho knew on the surface. Ken didn't bother explaining more than that, and the two of them continued to train. This time, Tasho also took his duty more seriously, and eventually, Ken finally felt that he could be trusted enough to help him with reading the techniques. Tasho was elated to be trusted with such an important duty. I am still in training, yet I am already tasked to be the eyes of this person. He's already helped me change my fate, I owe him at least this much. With Tasho's help, Ken was able to find out that three of the scrolls he had gathered were actually just mission details. One of them was a scroll on equipment storage seals, which Ken was immediately interested in. Tasho remembered them from his life as a shinobi. They are basically pockets of space created through basic fuenjutsu, 
This particular one only stores inorganic objects. Ken instantly decided to learn them after finding out that tapping them and applying chakra was all that was needed to take out the weapon. Finally, a way to hide my weapons while traveling. Shinobi arts are truly a wonder. The other jutsus written down on the scrolls were rather rudimentary. One was a fire release, great fireball jutsu, it was considered a rather powerful C-rank jutsu that could go up to B-rank if one was willing to spend enough chakra on it. Another was Earth Release, Earth Style Wall, which was actually a B-rank jutsu that the Jonin had used. And the last one, the most promising one besides the equipment storage seals, is Lightning Release, Lightning Clone Technique. It was a B-rank technique that the Jonin Ken had killed used. It required quite a bit of chakra, and it seemed to also require one to have really advanced control of their chakra, as well as to have the lightning attribute. Thankfully, Ken fit into both categories, so he decided that the clone technique was a must for him. Those were the only scrolls with any techniques, and Ken decided to actually learn all of them in the end, he had also given Tasho free reign on which he wanted to learn. From Ken's perspective, the more tricks they had up their sleeves the better things were for them. And so, the training continued. This time Ken also practiced Jutsu seriously for once. Underscore POV narration, and so, Ken and Tasho trained earnestly, for the following year and a half. In and out of that cave, sometimes venturing out and finding more scrolls and equipment. Ken's luck was quite good, and his stealth skills were also impeccable, regardless of how many times he entered enemy territory, he always left it unscathed and undetected. Most of his actions would be written off as attacks of enemy shinobi. The time of war made it easy for Ken to cover his tracks perfectly, and he knew to take advantage of that. He didn't just attack one place though, he traveled a bit more, sometimes being gone for weeks on end in order to acquire more diverse techniques. At some point, a few months into their training, Tasho became accustomed to it, and Ken was able to notice it as well. Instead of waiting to be hit, he now was able to anticipate attacks. Blocking, dodging, and even hitting back at times. It was clear that his instincts had improved greatly, showing that he wasn't exactly lacking talent before, just willpower. So, Ken took his training to the next level. No longer giving him an auditory clue, and just hitting him. It took Tasho a while to get used to that, but he was able to. During that time, he had also mastered some jutsu, and he started using them effectively even in training. Ken had no problems with that, as he allowed Tasho to use everything he had at his disposal to either dodge, block or make him retreat. The rules were that there were no rules. Well, with one exception. Fire jutsus were a bit of a no-go, as Ken usually hit him harder when using them, and once even ended the training early. Ken's explanation for that? Using fire-style jutsu in an enclosed space is beyond stupid. Fire burns oxygen, which is the main component of the very air you breathe. Ken always sealed off the cave they trained in perfectly, to prevent even a speck of light from getting in. So running out of oxygen was a possibility inside there. The cave was large, large enough to sustain them for a few hours of regular training. The fire burned through that very quickly though. Ken made sure also to give him a thorough explanation of some basic scientific concepts after that incident. Tasho was like a sponge, he absorbed as much knowledge as he could, and he seemed to be eager to learn more at all times. And, after an entire year of struggling, Tasho was now able to cross blades with Ken in a spar. He wasn't as strong physically, and he wasn't as fast, but his reflexes were trained to an insane point, which allowed him to keep up in a short spar using only Kenjutsu, sword fighting, and Taijutsu, fisticuffs. Ken always managed to overwhelm him with only skill though, as he was always holding back physically during their spars unless it was to prove a point and show Tasho that he still had a long way to go. Tasho growing complacent and thinking he was too powerful was the last thing Ken needed, so he made sure to beat any thought even similar to that out of his head. Overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer. Was a quote that Ken remembered from somewhere, and that perfectly applied to his line of work. Being overconfident meant not taking things seriously, and not taking things seriously was just a way to die quickly. Now, Ken had grown a lot during that year, and he was slowly approaching his 10th birthday at that point. He was already tall for his age, standing at around 1.55 meters, 5.08 feet. And his muscles were also becoming more and more well-defined. No one was to mistake him for a child anymore, not that many had in the past. Tasha was also loyal to him at this point, seeing Ken as the only reason he now had a chance to live a better life. Now, Tasha no longer looked as he did before. No longer the same skinny waste of life he had been before. Now he was a lean and fit assassin, likely stronger than the vast majority of Chunnin, even possibly at the level of a Jonin. 
At that point, in Ken's eyes, Tasho only lacked a few more advanced jutsu that one would need to be called a jonin, but his taijutsu was definitely on par. Tasho's progress mirrored his renewed passion, his power growing exponentially as he underwent Ken's hellish training. And, after reaching this point in his training, he was also given a uniform. A coat that covered his body completely, black and completely discreet and with plenty of pouches that contained throwables. He received a large straw hat, which covered his head completely, and had white strips of clothing going downwards and covering each side of his head. But, the most important part of the outfit had to be the mask. It was very similar to Ken's own mask. But instead of a dot in the middle, it only had one, somewhat thick, red line. Ken made it so that the ranking in the organization he was building would depend on the masks to some extent. Tasha was to be the only one with a single line. The first blade, after him would come two more blades, and after that would just be the numbered. Ken was looking forward to developing the organization, and it was about time he started doing so. Currently, Ken wanted to expand his influence, to become stronger before poking the proverbial wasp's nest that was the Mist Village. Ken found out more about the Seven Swordsmen during the one year he had been training Tasho. They were basically the cornerstone for the Mist Village, their swords being akin to national treasures to them. And Ken had no plans to just hand them over to the Mist Village after killing the swordsmen wielding them. They were rightfully his spoils of war. So he needed to prepare to face the entire village if needed. Though he assumed he'd just be able to hide from them if needed. As long as I kill them covertly I won't even have to worry about the mist. But killing the seven of them without making any noise whatsoever will be impossible. So, Ken decided to start developing his organization. And to do that, he needed money, a lot of money. Resources, a proper base, it would all take time, which he had, but money, which he'd need to acquire. He and Tasho theorized a bit on where to get that money and who exactly they could recruit. They reached a rather straightforward conclusion. Tasho would handle recruitment and finding a proper base. And Ken would handle the gathering of money for the entire operation. Ken did make sure to put a rule in place for their recruitment. We are not allowed to force regular people to join us, and we must avoid getting them involved in any conflict we encounter at all costs. Ken truly didn't care about any shinobi or samurai, as soldiers were always prepared to die but he didn't want the same fate to befall civilians. Tasha was quite fine with that, as he wasn't exactly planning to recruit civilians in the first place. He was to start building a few homes for new recruits, there were plenty of trees in the forest thankfully, so they didn't need to spend any money on that. But he would use the rest of their savings for tools and other building materials. Now, Ken was to earn money. And he had found the perfect tool to do so. The Bingo Book. The book contained all wanted shinobi and criminals with information on their bounties and where to collect them. The bingo book also gave some information regarding the abilities of these people. Giving them ratings and being constantly updated. So, Ken left the cave with a stack of papers, handwritten by Tasho, and he was to hunt down all of them. And so Ken started making his way through the forest, dressed in his usual red armor and black coat similar to that of Tasho. He didn't bother wearing a hat though, as he didn't care about it too much. He also didn't have any backpack or blades on his body. Instead of bandages, his wrists now had leather guards with storage sigils on them. Allowing for easy transportation for both his weapons and his supplies. It was about time I embarked on a long journey anyway. I've yet to feel a lot of this world. Who knows? Maybe I'll even visit the hidden villages? POV narration, Ken wandered the land, jumping from tree to tree as he mapped out the areas he traveled in his mind. Many of his targets were Ru Shinobi, and he only had a rough estimation of where they could be. Tasho had done his best to help him memorize some locations on the map, even going as far as to draw him a map of the continent with a pen. Ken was able to easily feel the location of certain landmarks and roads from the imprints of that drawing, but that didn't mean he was easily able to tell where exactly he was on it. That was his main issue, even with his hyper-enhanced senses, he still had quite a bit of trouble navigating around. Even when he somehow, through a miracle, managed to pinpoint where exactly he was on the map, the second he moved he would somewhat lose that position after a while, which got him back to square one. The only good thing was that he was able to at least find a good direction to walk towards after a few stops. He started hunting down a random criminal. Renowned killer and rapist, someone going by the name of Seza Toyanso. Ken only knew about him a bit, that he hanged around the Land of Lightning and that he was well known for kidnapping young Kunoichi for obvious reasons considering his reported crimes. His crimes weren't really the only noteworthy thing about him though. An S-rank missing shinobi was able to escape the encirclement of three different jonin at some point in the past. The full scope of his abilities, unknown. Ken figured he'd just be able to deal with him anyway. Which made him think back to reading about his crimes. 
I guess beasts like him are common in every world. Ken wasn't exactly outright impressed by what he was reading. He knew plenty of similar people from his past life. War zones were fought with soldiers taking advantage of locals, it was almost a tradition for war zones at that point. But he didn't think much of them besides the fact that their desires were a lot stranger than his. He thought that he was just as disgusting as they were, so he had no right to judge them at that time. Now he saw things in a different light. I may still kill, but I am a changed man when it comes to mentality at this point. I refuse to compare myself to these beasts any longer. He decided that he'd kill any beast he came by if the opportunity arose. But he otherwise still didn't feel the need to hunt down criminals specifically. He wasn't planning on becoming some righteous crusader, nor did he really have any right to. The first few days of wandering the land of lightning were quite uneventful, Ken even managed to set up camp and make a fire. I'm not here to attack any shinobi, so I couldn't care less if they find me. His intentions were different, and so were his actions. There was now no reason for him to really hide. He was actually aiding the land of lightning by hunting down a criminal for them. Ken didn't bother to rest for long, he was young and full of energy. The natural energy revolving around him almost didn't want him to rest. And so, the blind swordsman decided to take it a bit slower, scout out the terrains. I'm unlikely to just run into the criminal if I run around at high speeds everywhere. In truth, Ken also wanted to take a few moments to appreciate the fresh air around him. Appreciating nature is something I've only taken to during this lifetime. I guess I was too focused on other things to appreciate small things like this. Ken continued walking slowly through the forest for a few hours, not bothering himself with hiding his presence like he usually would. He only stopped himself when he noticed that he was encircled. He wasn't exactly worried though. He wasn't approaching the people of the Land of Lightning as an enemy, after all, he didn't have anything to hide. But he also had no reason to pretend that he couldn't feel them around him. The four of you can come out now. I can tell you've been tracking me for a while now. Ken's voice rang out clearly as he stood tall in that clearing. He noticed that four people were basically encircling him in the middle of that clearing. He could tell that they were a team of Jenin most likely, with a Jonin leading them. Quite perceptive for a random traveler, the Jonin was the first one to speak up, Ken could tell from the amount of chakra flowing inside her body. The team seemed to be led by a woman by what Ken's ears were picking up. He sniffed the air a bit, he could tell rather quickly that two boys and a girl were part of that team. I'm not exactly a regular traveler, miss? How should I call you exactly? Not exactly of importance. But I'll play along. My name is Mabui. Obviously a shinobi of Cloud Village, something you should be aware of, you are in our territory after all. The woman seemed to take out a kunai as she spoke, seemingly preparing in case Ken proved to be less than friendly. The genin around her did the same. Now, now. No need for hostilities. I am not involved with any of the hidden villages, your wars don't concern me much. Ken raised his palms in a defensive manner, not wanting to start up a fight with people that weren't even his target. Target, who? Ken took a closer look at the people around him. The female Jonin seemed to have a relatively attractive form. Ken could feel the wind bending around her figure, he smiled as he came to a realization. She seems like prime bait. Though our resident degenerate might rather aim for that Jenin girl. No, regardless of who he aims for, this entire group is good bait. But I should make sure they don't have any important mission. I don't want to get involved in conflicts between villages now. And we're supposed to take your words at face value? When you don't even show us your face? Haha, <laughs> nice joke. One of the genin said, the boy then quickly looked away as his jonin teacher slash handled gave him a stare down. Although my pupil was rather rude, I would still have to ask you to take your mask off. I don't know how accustomed you are to shinobi ways, but those that wear masks always have something to hide. Mabui said as she narrowed her eyes at Ken. Although her tone was more polite, her accusation was about as obvious as her pupils, maybe less pointed and gruff. Ken frowned a bit, but ended up slapping the back of his head in frustration. I guess wearing masks is associated more with the secret operations unit of villages, the Umbu, was it? They may not be voicing that specifically, but they're certainly thinking about it. Tasho did tell me a bit about them, but I didn't think much of it at the time, Q, I don't mind taking off my mask, but I must warn you. It is no pretty sight. Ken said as he slowly started taking off his mask, a small smile rising on his lips as he did so. He wasn't scared of showing his face to others at all. If it wasn't for the mask being a gift from his loved ones, he wouldn't even bother wearing one. He also somewhat liked the design, so he mostly wore it. There was no denying the fact that his appearance would stir some reactions in others as well, so there were really few reasons for him to take it off most of the time. Now however, it only seemed sensible. 
The four shinobi around him seemed to be preparing for something as Ken's mask was taken off. An ambush or anything. Umbu went by an extremely strict code, they were to never unmask themselves, not even to allies. So if Ken was to actually be an enemy, then he likely would throw a smoke screen and attack them before they even caught a glimpse of his face. Their doubts fell off when seeing Ken's face though. Eyeless, mangled beyond any recognition. It was absolutely impossible to accurately pinpoint his age, but Mabui could still tell that he was relatively young. Either late teenager or young adult if she went using her intuition. It was clear that Ken was either highly trained or malnutritioned, she could see no excess fat on his sunken cheeks at all. I would say he's trained. No one would keep their composure in such a situation otherwise. For a second, Mabui even thought that he was using some type of Jinjutsu to hide his face. But as a Jonin, she wasn't able to feel anything. There was always the question of who exactly trained Ken, but at the very least he didn't seem aggressive. We're still on a mission, I would question him more under normal circumstances, but I guess this should suffice for now. Mabui nodded. Sorry about that, traveler. Some questions are still in order, but I can tell that you didn't come here to make enemies at least. If he planned to attack us, he wouldn't have shown his face, nor would he be so deep into our territory while doing so, our reinforcements would quite literally appear in seconds. Ken then put his mask back on, ignoring the reactions of the people around him as he sighed and continued to talk. No apologies needed. You're just doing your job. Now, I'll stop speaking in circles. My name is Ken, I am a ronin, wandering samurai if you will, though you can likely tell from my armor. I am also a bounty hunter, it's how I make my bread. I am here tracking one says a Toyinsen. A missing Nien last spotted around the land of lightning. Ken's voice rang out confidently in that clearing, confident and unshaken. Mabui ended up sighing, not exactly sure what to think of this bounty hunter. On one hand, it did make a lot of sense, as he did seem strong, and he didn't seem hostile at all. But now she actually felt a bit guilty about technically forcing him to take his mask off. So you're hunting down that animal? I should warn you, he's pretty strong. A squad of jonin from our side is already trying to track him though. Mabui said as she finally put down her weapon and crossed her arms. Her pupils followed her motion of putting down their weapons, making Ken sigh a bit at the almost mechanical way the child soldiers were moving. It is understandable that more would be after him. But I do happen to want his bounty. So I don't plan on giving up on it. Ken's confident tone didn't waver one bit though. Oh? So you're saying you're going to go against the Cloud Village and compete for his bounty? Mabui seemed quite amused at the notion, her pupils also seemed to raise an eyebrow at Ken's arrogance. Well, I have my ways. Anyway, I'll be seeing you people, maybe we'll even end up going after the same bounty one day. Ken then started walking off, waving at the group as he made his way through the forest. Mabui was about to say something, before she stopped in her tracks, realizing that the second she blinked, Ken was completely out of sight. Even as a sensory type, she couldn't sense him anywhere in the forests nearby. Maybe it's better that we avoided a fight with that one. POV narration, teacher. What was that guy's deal? The young girl Jenin asked as she jumped from tree to tree alongside her jonin handler Mabui. Mabui herself was still contemplating that strange meeting. It's strange that I've never heard of someone like him before. He's far too strong to not have a reputation. Unless he's just starting. Igriagadia. He looked really creepy. One of the other Jenin muttered as he looked ahead with a slightly scared gaze. It's unbecoming of a shinobi to be startled by the appearance of another. Especially out in the field, where each second counts and the lives of your teammates are on the line. Mabui said, as she stopped in the middle of a clearing, signaling her disciples to stop as well. But I can't deny that his appearance is unusual. His strength was also rather hard to pinpoint, he's likely not an enemy the four of us could have faced. She continued while looking at her students with a sharp gaze. It was better for them to learn how to discern dangerous people like Ken when out in the world. All it took was showing disrespect to some bloodthirsty bounty hunter, and they'd likely end up dead if they were lucky. I don't know about that. He seemed pretty young, I don't think you'd have any issue facing him, teacher. One of the genin said with utmost confidence, making Mabui simply sigh. The other genin also nodded, seemingly agreeing with their teammate's assessment. I am disappointed in you. I thought you were told this in the academy already. You can't judge people merely based on appearance. Just from his chakra reserves, he had an advantage over me. And from the way he left, he also has an advantage when it comes to speed and stealth. It's hard to judge his sword skills, but I doubt they'd be any less. Mabui shook her head at her disciples. The genin were a bit shocked, not one of them had managed to truly notice just how big of a threat Ken was. W what about his jutsu? It's unlikely he practices any. 
He said he was a samurai, not a stray shinobi or missing mean. While it's not good to take his words at face value, he had no real reason to lie to us. Especially since he likely could have killed us. The genin wanted to ask a few more questions. Boom. But all of them were interrupted by a huge explosion, the forest and trees around them shook in the wind as all of them covered their faces. A fight? Mabui was shocked. This was supposed to be just a small patrol mission, we aren't even that far off from the village. Who would dare get this close? Ganbu. Send a message to the village and follow us after. Hikari, Chiburu. Both of you, come with me. The genin quickly nodded and followed orders. One of them quickly summoned a small bird and started writing a message, while the other two followed behind their teacher as they quickly went to check things out. Mabui and the other two genin advanced without any fear, though the jonin was feeling quite stressed at that moment. This, the feeling was only exacerbated when she caught a glimpse of a corpse. Or what remained of it. A blackened and charred body. From the headband's location, she quickly guessed who that person was, though. A former colleague of hers, and a jonin, just like her. This is bad. She quickly stopped in her tracks then, as she saw two other figures struggling against another man. She immediately went white when seeing who that man was. Says a Toyanso? Shit. So you're telling me three fully-fledged jonin aren't enough? The two of you, quickly go back and regroup with Ganbu. Retreat to the village. This isn't a fight where you are able to help. Mabui whispered as she crouched down and prepared to approach the fight silently. The genin listened and turned around, fleeing the scene, only sometimes looking back in fear at their teacher's back. Now, Mabui needed to think of her next move carefully. A sneak attack's my only chance to turn things around. She was a sensory type, but she was still a jonin, she would be able to turn the tables if she managed to land a good attack. And she was going to use her strongest jutsu in order to do so. Earth release, swamp of the underworld. Mabui muttered under her breath, finishing her hand sings and tapping both of her palms on the ground with a grunt. The ground underneath Seza, their resident murderer, quickly turned into mud, his feet sinking into it as he was stopped in his tracks by its stickiness. Seza immediately turned his head towards the one responsible for that. Eyeing Mabui up for a second. A somewhat busty woman with darker skin and white hair, wearing a standard black jonin uniform. The murderer licked his lips when seeing that, making Mabui scowl at him. The jutsu allowed Mabui to somewhat seal off his mobility, as he sunk a bit deeper into the mud pit. The other two jonin immediately took advantage of that, one of them quickly took some distance and started forming some hand signs, while the other slashed at the missing Nin with a lightning-covered sword. Seza looked at them with a smile for a second, before he immediately exploded into a large mass of lightning, Mabui covered her eyes with a grunt. A clone? When she looked at the situation again, she could clearly see that the closest jonin to that clone was shocked unconscious, while the other managed to completely dodge the attack. Shit! Mabui sensed a presence appear at her side, she only managed to slightly turn her head to the side before she got kicked into a tree. She could only spit out some blood as she looked at Seza with a hateful glare. The tall, middle-aged shinobi only looked back at her with a cocky smile. Upon taking a closer look at him, Mabui could see a few scars littering his bald head. He was also wearing a jonin uniform, although his was bloody, presumably stolen off of some corpse. He purposefully didn't kill me. Shit. She was mad, but at least now she had another chance to take him down. The other jonin was also still alive, so she still had some hope left in her. Fire release, fire dragon flame bullet. The jonin in question finished his hangings, shooting six smaller fire dragons towards Seza, who scoffed a bit. Jonin are always a pain in the ass. Seza's hands moved far faster than that of his enemy, becoming a blur as he finished his jutsu by pressing his hands on the ground. Earth release, earth style wall. A gigantic wall of dirt rose from the ground in front of him, and the fire dragons blasted it apart quite quickly, but it still gave Seza more than enough time to do something. Hiding behind a piece of the wall, his hands turned into a blur once more. Lightning release, shadow clone technique. The shadow clone was a technique he had stolen off one of his jonin victims at some point. With his lightning release, it formed a clone made completely out of lighting. That technique was the whole reason why he was able to become as powerful as he had become. Although taxing, the technique was extremely powerful, and the murderer was already completely used to the drain it had on him, as well as the many uses it could have. Seza quickly ran out of hiding and started throwing kunai and paper bombs towards the jonin. Earth release, hiding like a mole technique, the clone silently dove into the ground as Seza distracted the jonin. Mabui took notice of that, although injured, she wasn't about to let that type of thing go. She quickly started doing her hand signs. Earth release, tearing earth turning palm. 
just as she was about to tap her palm on the ground when she noticed that a paper bomb was already in front of her. Mabui only got to cover her face before she was blown away, and Seza scowled a bit. I don't like how many resources I am using in this fight. Better end it quickly. Fire release, fire dragon wall. The Jonin shouted as a ring of flames rose around him, capturing Seza inside. Oh no. What am I to do? Seza said smugly as he threw another kunai towards the Jonin, who simply scoffed and tilted his body to the side. That very second, the earth to the side he had dodged into shifted, a tanto stabbing through his torso in that very instant, charged with lightning as it fried some of his organs. Shit. The Jonin forced his body to move, kicking the clone, which only caused it to explode and take him out of the fight for good. Ha. Huh. Good riddance. Seza patted his shoulders as he started walking over to the only enemy he really cared about. Time to have some fun. He licked his lips once more when seeing the Kunoichi getting up from the ground, her hands hanging limply by her sides, as she had just used them to block an explosion. Shit. This isn't good. I hope my students got to call reinforcements in time. If I can hold this monster here for long enough, maybe there is at least hope for him to pay for what he's done. She had mostly given up hope of winning the fight. She would normally simply kill herself, as she was trained to do in case of capture, but this time there was still hope for reinforcements to come. So she decided to try and hold him there for longer. Says a Toyanso. You despicable scum. That didn't mean she'd have to pretend to like her situation though. Heh. It'll be great to hear your squeals, the S-rank missing Neen rubbed his hands together as he spoke, a creepy expression rising on his face. To think I'd end up like this? Mabui was ashamed, that was for sure. Not much could be done about it, though? At least that was what she thought at first. Her eyes widened though when she saw a very familiar masked man creeping behind Seza. A brooding figure covered in a black coat, only a small part of his chest was visible through it, showcasing a blood-red samurai armor. She couldn't see his hands, but his long hair flowed in the wind, and his mask was just as recognizable as before. It's him? Still, her reaction did give his position away, as Seza turned instantly and jumped backwards, dodging a Senbo which was aimed at his neck. The Senbo landed right above Mabui, who simply sweated a bit as she realized her mistake. A critical one at that. To think I am lacking to this extent? There was also another thought in her mind. Will Ken even be able to win here? Seza is a lot stronger than reported. I need to warn him at least. She opened her mouth to speak, but Ken's own words interrupted her. It would be nice if you could just die quietly. But Ken didn't seem bothered in the least. Not that one could tell by looking at him. His tone did give it away though. He sounded bored, almost disinterested. It was so disconnected from the situation that Mabui was flabbergasted for one second. As if. Seza quickly jumped backwards once more and started making hand signs, his speed was impressive to Mabui. Shit. I spent too much time here. This guy is likely a big shot umbu. I need to create some diversion and escape. At that point, he didn't bother himself with Mabui anymore, not about to lay his life down for a piece of ass. His plan was simple, use a large-range jutsu, forcing the umbu to try and rescue the injured jonin nearby and allowing him to escape. He was extremely confident in his speed, to him, there was no jonin faster than him when it came to hand signs. Many had tried to take him on, and just as many had died. At the end of the day, that was his greatest talent, his dexterity. But when he got to the third hand sign of his jutsu, he simply stopped, as his eyes widened. Mabui was confused for a split second, and then blood squirted out of Seza's shoulder, and one of his hands fell off. Ken was right in front of him, his two fingers coming out of his large coat, exuding a large blade of chakra from them. You aren't really worth using a blade. Ken said as he pointed his fingers at his target. Seza was completely white at that point, realizing that he had bitten far more than he could chew. W.I. Seza opened his mouth once more, about to plead for his life most likely, but Ken simply swiped his hand, and his head flew off swiftly, not one more syllable coming out of his mouth. Mabui was simply petrified at that scene. A shinobi that she had seen three fully-fledged jonin lose against was taken down in a split second. She could only gulp, as the speed he had showcased far surpassed anything she had seen before. Well, all but one person. Only Lord Rakage can surpass his speed. Ken simply took out a scroll and grabbed Seza's head, not even letting it fall on the ground as he stored it inside the scroll. First bounty acquired. POV narration, Mabui stood there for a while, contemplating the logistics of meeting and talking to an actual Kage-level samurai, who also happened to be a bounty hunter. Now, saying that Ken was Kage-level might have been a bit much, but Mabui really had no good frame of reference on anything in between Jonin and Akage. 
The criminal that Ken had just decapitated was also in between a high jonin and a low kage level of strength, but he was far from being called an actual kage. Sure, most kage would have been able to kill the criminal with just as much ease. But there were plenty of others that might have been able to do the same. The title of kage was only reserved for the strongest in the village usually, but that didn't mean the title didn't have a number of contenders in each village. As a jonin, she should have had a bit more information regarding that, sure, but she was still relatively young, and she had yet to witness the change of a kage in her time as a shinobi. She was unaware of the power struggle that ensued when a village was to change leadership, that was the time when all the hidden powers made themselves known, vying for control. Most people would scoff at Mabui for comparing a vagabond samurai with the leaders of established clans of powerful shinobi, even if she did so unknowingly. But Mabui wasn't ignorant, and she was well aware of the fact that there were many stronger than her in the world. But she was also well aware that when it came to speed, there were few that could ever boast of being anywhere near as fast as what Ken had shown off. And currently, all of those people were masters of some movement technique, either secret technique or regular mastery over basics coupled with great talent. She had seen plenty of them, and their rakage was considered to be the fastest at that time. In speed alone, without any established technique, Ken was already near the top. And that wasn't all of it. His techniques were something else entirely, she had no actual knowledge of them, but Mabui could surmise that they were a lot more complex than what she was accustomed to. Controlling everything from his breathing to his body temperature. Absolute control over one's body, being able to blend perfectly with one's surroundings. Whoever created this technique must have been either a genius or a madman. She had heard of people being capable of controlling their bodies to sickening degrees, but none were actually able to do so and hide their chakra signature as well. The blind samurai in front of her was able to do just that. Ken then proceeded to search the criminal's body for a while, finding a few scrolls and storing them on the same scroll as the head. That gave Mabui a bit more time to calm down and regain her bearings. She had thankfully met a kage or two before, so she knew how to carry herself. She was to treat him with respect befitting his strength, for as long as he didn't bear his fangs towards their village. Even without a village backing him, an individual with his strength can prove a worthy enemy for any hidden village. As she was further contemplating that, the Kage-level bounty hunter simply turned around and started walking into the forest. W wait. Mabui said instinctually, wanting to at least thank Ken for saving her. But at the same time, it had downed on her, how convenient the situation was. Ken just happened to start walking out of the woods as soon as the criminal was distracted by her. Wait. Was he using me as bait? He must have known the criminal's tendencies and likely location. I guess he's been tracking us ever since we met? Oh? Apologies for using you as bait. In truth, Ken didn't even bother to hide it either. Why would he? Anyone with a brain and some foresight would have been able to come to that conclusion, let alone people that were part of the shinobi world. I was going to thank you. But I guess we did use each other to some extent. Indeed, you owe me nothing. Nor do I owe you anything. That apology was mostly out of politeness. Ken said as he continued walking into the forest. Mabui at that point also got up, but she didn't pursue him in any way. Not like I could keep up with him. Though I'm sure Lord Rakage would have loved to meet him. Ken then stopped suddenly, turning his head in one direction and tilting slightly in a confused manner. Hum, boom. An explosion could be heard in the distance, and Mabui's eyes widened as well when hearing where exactly it had come from. Shit. My students. She quickly got up and dashed in that direction, ignoring her tiredness as she passed by Ken, who was still standing there with a bit of confusion present in his mannerisms. The genin are in danger? The criminal is dead, that much I am quite sure about. Would enemy shinobi attack this close to a hidden village? Isn't this a bit too brazen for them? With a bit of curiosity, Ken decided to scout out the situation a bit more. He immediately became a blur, as his speed carried him through the wind, stepping from leaf to leaf and reaching the source of the explosion. He actually arrived there quite a bit sooner than Mabui, as his speed far exceeded hers. The scene he saw was about what he had expected. The genin were mostly unconscious, with the two boys suffering from burns on their bodies. The only one still conscious was the girl, and she was being held up by the neck, and Ken could only raise an eyebrow when sensing the person that was holding her up. Didn't I just kill him? Was that a clone? No, his aura is slightly different, not weaker, but different. Then it simply ticked for Ken. It was a rather easy conclusion to come to as well. A hidden twin brother, huh? That would explain how the criminal always managed to escape from every situation. Even if Seza was a bit better than some jonin, he still shouldn't have been able to give an entire village that much trouble. Hikari! Mabui shouted as she finally arrived at the scene, 
She immediately looked at the genin being held up by the neck. Huh? Did you escape from Big Brother? I guess he does have a soft spot for hot women. The twin brother spoke out with a grin. My type's more like this one here. He then dropped the genin on the ground, allowing the little girl to finally get a breath of fresh hair, but he didn't allow her to get much time to relax, he immediately grabbed her by the hair, and put a kunai to her throat. Well, you might as well look since you're here. T teacher. Help me. Mabui could only tremble for a few seconds, realizing that if she moved, then her student was likely going to die. But then she simply stood still, all of her worries disappearing in an instant. Of course, he'd still be nearby. Behind the criminal stood another figure, squatting slightly with a palm on his cheek as he seemingly waited for the twin to notice him. After the man started trying to undress the genin, Ken somewhat realized that the man had no intention of looking around himself. Therefore, he decided to simply end the man's miserable life. With a swipe of his hand, the twin's head was cut into four different pieces. Splattering blood on the grass in front of him as the pieces flew off a few meters away from the rest of the body. Hikari, the genin, quickly dashed away when she felt the hold on her loosen. Stumbling as she did so and doing a roll in order to regain her balance. Only when she turned around, did she notice the black-haired samurai from earlier squatting over the headless body of her previous assailant. There's no wanted poster for this one. How peculiar. Ken said as he started searching the man's body for anything useful, well, anything that could remotely resemble a scroll. There was no report of this on our side either. They do look alike. Mabui spoke as she started tending to the injuries that the other genin had sustained. Hikari was still a bit too shocked to move. It would have been a traumatizing experience for most girls, but as a shinobi, she was trained for everything already. So she recovered quickly and went to assist her teachers, only muttering a few words of gratitude to the samurai that was still inspecting the criminal's body. Possibly twins, their bodies are also the exact same shape. Ken said, as he ran his hands through all the pockets, he could sense. To think there was no record of this. It can't be helped, he wasn't worth anything either, he was also weaker. It's hard to tell which one was the one with a bounty on his head, but I doubt anyone will be able to tell the difference. Ken eventually found only one scroll on his body and proceeded to store it away. Thank you for your help, Mabui said, bowing a bit towards the wandering bounty hunter. Don't bother, I still get paid, and I did use you all as bait. Though, I'd advise you to have more caution in the future. Something like this was bound to happen regardless of my actions. At least I was here to take care of things this time. Next time though. Ken then waved his hand and turned to leave. I'll keep that in mind. Mabui said as she sighed and continued to tend to her wounded students. This time, Ken didn't stop, nor did any explosion interrupt his departure. Instead, his back disappeared into the forests. Neither Mabui nor Hikari did anything to stop him, not like they could. I guess teacher was right. He really was a lot more dangerous than he let on. Hikari thought to herself as she continued to tend to her wounded teammates. POV Ken. Such an odd turn of events. I can't really blame Tasho for this either, as it wasn't exactly his job to gather intel on my targets. We were basically just relying on the bingo book records. It's annoying, not being able to read normal books. I'll have to gather information in different ways. Now, to give Tasho the bounty. The process we surmised is rather simple. A summoning jutsu. The perfect way to instantly transfer both information and the bounties I collect. This is something that Tasho thankfully already knew. His former Jonin teacher had gotten to help him learn this trick, though it took a while for him to remember it. The contract was also rather simple. All I had to do to sign it was feed a random turtle on my travels. Odd condition, but I am not one to judge. All I have to do is make a few quick hand signs, bite my finger and tap the ground. I could sense my chakra spreading out, forming a summoning circle out of sigils. POV narration in an instant, it was almost as if a small smoke bomb went off, and a large turtle with a gigantic green shell appeared in front of the blind swordsman. It was easily twice the size of a regular adult. Its limbs were thicker than tree trunks. Overall, it was a sturdy summon. Ken. The turtle spoke slowly. It wasn't exactly the energetic type, nor was it a summon that could be used in combat against anything other than Genin. Donatello. Ken's voice was also slow, his tone calm, not giving off any emotions. Stop calling me that. My name is Akira. The turtle's tone was still slow, it was also obviously feminine now that it spoke a bit more. And it was also clearly offended. Donatello, I need you to deliver this to Toshi. Ken held out the scroll storing all of the loot from his bounty hunt. Akira looked at Ken with lazy eyes, blinking slowly as she then took the scroll in her mouth. 
Please stop calling me and my family strange names, Akira spoke with a bit of desperation in her slow tone. Thanks. Talk to you later, Donatello. The turtle simply shook her head. Her eyes looked downcast, slightly disappointed as she then proceeded to disappear in a puff of smoke, undoing the transformation and taking the scroll with her. Tasho is to do a summoning at least once a week. So he'll get this scroll soon enough. Then, Ken simply continued jumping from tree to tree. On to the next bounty then. POV narration A, the third rakage, smiled as he read through the reports on his desk. His sharp teeth munched on some sweets as he found out more and more about the bounty hunter he had been constantly hearing so much about. It had already been a few months since the rakage had first heard of the Red Dot being in his territory. That was his actual first appearance for the shinobi world in general. Mabui, one of the jonin at the scene, did manage to give him quite a few extra details on the assassin, like his basic background and what she managed to observe from his character. In the shinobi world, he was known as an elusive figure, but also extremely dangerous, to his targets at least. When he appeared, it usually meant that someone in the area was going to die. And he had yet to fail even once in collecting the bounty that he was after. He was someone strong enough to decapitate a jonin from a hundred meters away with nothing more than a small knife. The rakage found that fact quite impressive. A reliable assassin that worked independently of the villages and hunted down criminals that could also prove to be annoyances for said villages. The red dot was also damn near untraceable, not leaving a single footprint behind as he walked. His gait was said to be swifter than that of a cat and even more silent. A tad uncharacteristic for one with a samurai's background, but A wasn't one to judge. Still, despite his skill, running into him was not exactly an uncommon thing. The bounty hunter really didn't bother to hide from non-targets, or even from actual targets. Sometimes even camping and grilling meat openly, confident that nothing could really hurt him. The rakage remembered actually laughing out loud when first hearing about that. He could appreciate a man with such confidence. Of course, the rakage only appreciated him because he had the strength to back his confidence. He was not a sheep, he was no innocent peddler or merchant, he was a carnivore, a true predator. One that had already consumed the lives of dozens high-profile criminals in the short span of a few months. He had no reason to hide, no one to hide from really. He could confidently stand out without any fear and without any worry. But when he truly hid, no one could sense him, no matter their rank. Sure, no Kage had gone after him, but that didn't make it any less impressive. Those that did manage to run into him discovered that he was an extremely professional individual, extremely polite as well. He was basically anything that the shinobi world wasn't used to. A professional bounty hunter that wasn't a sleazy backpacker looking to score some easy money by fighting a few weak bandits. The rakage also noticed that the assassin was smart enough to never go after any ninja related to any of the hidden villages, clearly keeping a neutral stance in their war and not caring much for it at all. It was a strategy that allowed him to freely travel around each territory, and in his profession, it was the smartest thing he could have done. Now, the rakage actually knew the red dot by another name. Ken, a simple name, short, and quite descriptive. The kanji for, blade. Extremely fitting for him. Now, the rakage had already tried to recruit Ken once, but his umbu were unable to make Ken meet with him. I was truly not offended, it was simply in line with Ken's modus operandi, M.O. Always extremely careful not to take any sides or associate himself with any hidden village. And while frustrated, A couldn't quite blame the bounty hunter for his abstinence when it came to their bloody conflicts and power struggles. Still, if he is to bear his fangs at my village, I won't hesitate to fight him. Hell, it might actually be fun. Ken's epithet, or nickname, was now, The Red Dot. He was not known by any other name publicly, and the nickname obviously came from the mask that he donned. The epithet had now earned a meaning of its own. At least going by the authors of the bingo book. Think of someone's life as a sentence. A sentence always naturally ends with a black dot at the end of it. The red dot is more akin to ending a sentence that could have still continued, or putting a stop to a sentence right in the middle of it. Now, the rakage found the nickname and description to be a bit ridiculous. All shinobi killed, after all, not just Ken. Still, the rakage didn't think it was wholly unfitting. Ken's way of killing was oftentimes a lot more terrifying than the methods they were used to. As most of the time, his victims would die before they even knew that they were being hunted in the first place. Sure, that was technically what all of them should have been able to do as shinobi. But actually pulling that type of thing off against high-ranked jonin constantly was not something that even the kage could boast about. Besides, the description sure was somewhat poetic in a sense, not that A was a great admirer of the literary arts. The description was likely just the bingo book writers trying to find some type of meaning in Ken's appearance or actions. 
He was after all an S-rank Rujnin. The S-rank was usually reserved for extremely powerful shinobi, the major villages mostly gave that rank to Kage-level shinobi. There were exceptions though, a few high-level jonin and umbu with especially heinous crimes sometimes made it to S-rank, but they were mostly ranked up so they would be hunted down quicker. In Ken's case, all of the daimyo of the elemental nation saw it fit to give him that rank universally in all of their bingo books. Each village also had its very own version of the bingo book. They were usually made up of high-profile targets of the village. People that put the stability of the village at risk or that harmed its interests. The bingo book that Ken seemed to be using was the one issued by the Land of Iron. His bounties were seemingly being cashed in there as well. I wonder if I can convince him to hunt down some criminals that pose a threat to our village. Even if I can't get him to join me, I can at least hire his services. And the rakage wasn't the only one thinking about things of that nature. Every nation took notice of the sudden appearance of a powerful third party, especially since they were in times of war. The red dot was brazen, confident, but most importantly, powerful and reliable. The assassin had already acted and killed enemies of just about every village. Many had already decided that they needed to either make him join. Or kill him. It was inevitable that some would think of assassinating him, to eliminate a potential threat in case he joined another village. But killing a Kage-level fighter was easier said than done. I was much of the same thought. Though he decided not to outright hunt the bounty hunter down or make him a wanted criminal. Doing so seemed counterintuitive to the rakage. For once, he felt like taking a methodical, calculated approach, and simply trying to hire Ken. To post a few bounties and catch his attention. Still, at that point, it became a race against the clock. Who can make the red dot join them first? And, whilst that was happening, Ken wasn't exactly unaware or ignorant of the thoughts and intentions of the hidden villages. He was swiftly preparing for the future conflicts that awaited him. He was smart enough to understand that the villages would want him, and he was also smart enough to understand that some were bound to want to get rid of him. I could have collected bounties silently, sure. But disappearing criminals would have still caught everyone's attention at some point. Especially since I still need to cash in the bounties. Besides, I've already built up my reputation. When I eventually start my organization people will already know of me and of its authenticity. Now that Ken was expecting invites from every village possible, he decided to tone down his public appearances and barbecue parties with random shinobi. He could easily reject them constantly, but that would eventually invite the ire of some of them, which would just hasten the inevitable of assassins being sent after him. Tasho has been able to find and recruit 10 people already. But they're nowhere near strong enough to actually take on any meaningful quests. 10 people recruited in the short span of a few months was a relatively good result. Especially considering the fact that Ken prohibited any and all unconventional recruitment methods, like kidnapping slash what he did to Tasho. Tasho was basically stuck collecting children and beggars on the street. It was a slow process, as not everyone wanted to give up their lives and join a random organization. Still, a few were willing to join after learning more about the organization itself. A bounty hunting clan. Nameless still, but Tasho is already training the first batch of recruits. I really lucked out when finding him. Having him be the first blade in the organization certainly made things much easier for me. The blind swordsman sighed as he thought about the organization a bit more. I really need a proper name for this. Well, I could always just call it, the guild. I'll just think about this after the mission, I guess. Ken was currently somewhere in the land of earth, on the outskirts of its southern border with the land of grass. Where the village of Kuzagakir, village hidden in the grass, resided. The blind assassin slowly finished his preparations. Extremely thin metal wires were strung around trees, almost invisible to the naked eye. He made a clear path for his target, slowly but surely stalking all the way to the target's campfire. Akira, S-rank criminal and former Chunin. Managed to train himself into a Jonin, pretty talented. But still a wanted man and murderer. His most recent crime is the noteworthy one though. And the one that placed him on the radar, giving him his rank. Killing the Kuzakage, the leader of Kuzagakir. The clans in that little place put up quite a great deal of money for someone to deal with him. They even contacted me specifically. They also added a special clause. But I'll think about it after I test a few things out a bit, to see if it's even possible to complete the mission properly. Ken mused in his thoughts as he silently stalked his victim. Recounting as much information as he could before acting. Setting up traps was necessary, as he was dealing with someone capable of killing a Kage. Granted, it was one of a weaker hidden village and not one of the great nations, but it was still a noteworthy achievement. Being careful always paid off in his profession. Oh, if only Ken had learned that while he was still an assassin in his past life. 
Had he learned it back then, then he would never have been caught and executed in the first place. Ken studied the criminal, who was merely wearing civilian clothing by what Ken could feel, there was no armor he would commonly feel on regular shinobi. Akira only had a large backpack for accessories, it seemed that he wasn't much for fashion. The backpack itself was filled with what Ken assumed were pilfered items from other shinobi. Akira was entirely unaware of the reality that was his impending demise. To him, it was a day like any other, eat, sleep, and train. He was going about his business, cooking some meat from a small rabbit that he had hunted. For a Kage killer, he sure is careless. Maybe I should wake him up a bit, remind him that he isn't exactly safe tonight. Out of nowhere, Akira seemed to gulp, dropping the meat in the fire in front of him as his hands shook. A sensation washed over him, making his spine tremble slightly. He recognized it, after years as a shinobi there was no way he couldn't have. Yet it still caught him off guard. Such an open and concentrated killing intent. Akira's head snapped in the direction from which that sensation flooded into his small camp. Looking at the forest, he couldn't spot any glowing eyes in the night. His sensory ability didn't tell him of anyone being there, the traps and strings that he had placed around the camp were also completely untouched. But it was still there. That feeling of being watched. The killing intent was also still there, he could still feel it, almost as if small knives were constantly stabbing into his skin. Then, the clouds above shifted a bit, and moonlight hit the trees around him reflecting slightly off of a few falling leaves. Now, Akira's eyes widened instantly as he spotted the source of his fears. And he was certainly right to be afraid. A slightly vivid red blood dot, shone slightly in the moonlight right in front of him, not even bothering to hide. Instead, simply, staring at him. Immediately, Akira turned and ran. Not stumbling one bit as he dashed off in the exact opposite direction. His instincts had been warning him to do so ever since that killing intent materialized. But only now did he decide to listen to said instincts. Why the fuck is the red dot after me? Was I too catchy when in the last village? Shit. I knew stealing from the Kage was a bad idea. Ken was right behind him, walking at the perfect pace to keep up with the Kage murderer. One thing was for sure though. This guy is certainly fast. Probably the fastest I've met yet? Ken mused to himself as they slowly approached the traps he had set up. Akira looked behind him once, hoping to have lost the red dot but he almost collapsed in fear when he realized that the masked man was a few meters behind him. How fucking fast is this guy? I thought there was no one faster than me besides the rakage. Due to that carelessness, he got too close to the trap, and he felt a metal string cutting at his torso, at the speed he was going, he knew that it was impossible to avoid getting injured. With a quick hand sign, Akira's chest seemed to puff out slightly, he ignored the feeling of that metal string cut through his chest as he shot an air bullet in front of him, killing off his momentum. He rolled backwards, and immediately his leg was snagged, a rope pulled him up and hung him upside down. Akira scoffed as he quickly prepared to break himself free, but then electrified wires entangled his body, paralyzing him instantly. He struggled a bit before passing out, wrapped in what looked like a cocoon of electrified wire. Capturing people alive will always be more of a bother than outright killing them. But the reward is double if I deliver him alive to them. Ah, might as well. Ken did happen to be in need of money, as his organization was still in its beginning stages, the more they had saved up the better. Besides, not like a quick trip to Kuzugakir would hurt, right? POV narration, Ken didn't waste much time in tying the man he had just knocked out. It had been easy, surprisingly so. Ken had admittedly expected to have quite a bit of trouble taking on a supposed Kage killer. For such a highly valued target, he sure was a letdown. Though his speed took me by surprise, it wasn't that great compared to my own. Akira's speed was greater than anything Ken had actually seen before. But it was still nothing too shocking or impressive, especially since Akria didn't seem to have anything to back up that speed. How the hell did this guy kill Akage? I would understand it if he had impressive stealth and assassination skills, but he doesn't seem to be all that special in that regard. Ken had already judged Akira's skills from what had been displayed earlier. A skilled shinobi and a trained assassin would have been a lot harder to take by surprise, even if Ken could sneak up on them, they would be alert at all times, making sneak attacks a bit tougher. Akira was not that alert, even though he had set up a camp right outside Kuzugakir's territory. To Ken, that just made the situation sound a lot worse. Perhaps interrogating him before handing him over to the grass village would be a better move. Ken then dragged Akira's unconscious body and tied him to a tree. Now, while I wait for him to wake up. Might as well see what other belongings he has on him. Ken searched Akira and managed to find a few scrolls. Once he couldn't quite read. With a sigh, Ken made a few quick hand signs, bit his finger, and pressed his palm on the ground. Summoning Jutsu, 
His bored voice came out as a small puff of smoke appeared near his hand. The smoke cleared quickly, revealing a small turtle, lazily looking up at Ken. What? The turtle asked in a small, somewhat low-pitched tone. Despite its size, its wrinkly skin showed that the small turtle was quite old. At least older than Donatello, Akira, who Ken had summoned before. I need you to read some stuff for me. Ken said as he crossed his arms and tilted his head at the tiny creature in front of him. You know we don't like reading things for you. The small turtle said as it slowly blinked a few times. Yes yes, you and your kind have the habit of not being particularly useful. Ken said as he waved his hand around, and the old small turtle only looked at him without any expression. Just because not all of us are particularly literate doesn't mean you can make fun of us. The small turtle said as it hit Ken's shoe with its head. Though its actions expressed some anger or frustration, its tone and expression both remained completely blank. The fact that most of you aren't literate isn't an issue. The fact that asking for your assistance requires a large supply of fish is annoying. We have to spend quite a good chunk of cash on your annoyingly expensive services. Why can't you guys settle for fruits and berries like regular turtles? Heh. We all have our tastes, Ken. I doubt you have any fish on you, but I'll assist you for now, since you are truly the only sage our species has ever been contracted to. I thought that was the exact reason why you don't want to do stuff for free. Like regular contracts would. Ken would have rolled his eyes if he had any. He didn't specifically know what a sage was, but it wasn't like the turtles were willing to answer. The turtles were the only animals that he could talk to, and almost all of the ones he had summoned had called him a sage. Upon asking them what that actually meant, most seemed to avoid answering, or outright change the subject. It all happened because of his first summon. When he had somehow managed to summon the oldest one among them. He had told him something rather interesting. Though you are one with nature, you seem to ignore its will and disregard its rules. You are not a turtle sage, nor are you a toad sage. What type of sage you are, I can't even discern. Even you don't seem aware of what you are. All the signs indicate that you are a monster far greater than I had anticipated. It was at that point that Ken's contract with the turtles had somewhat strained. With the elder one not wanting to associate with Ken at all. Thankfully, Ken was able to sway them somehow. They reached the agreement that the turtles would only help him under the pretense that they were being paid. Donatello, Akira, was the one tasked with delivering bounties, and Tasho handled the payment when he got the bounties. To Ken, it was an annoying system and a waste of resources for something that should have otherwise been free. But it was undeniable that their contract was what made his bounty gathering journey a possibility, and therefore the building of his organization. So Ken was somewhat forced to keep them on his payroll. He also didn't have any other summons he could rely on, so he managed with what he had. The small turtle that Ken didn't bother to learn the name of read out a few things from that scroll, albeit slowly and in a bored tone. And thanks to it, Ken gained a bit of perspective. The Grass Style Secret Technique Manual. The blind swordsman could somewhat guess that the scroll belonged to the Kuzagakir. Did he steal it? Is this related to why the hidden village wants him alive? Ken could only speculate on that point, but it seemed to make sense. Ken undid the summoning as he pondered on a few things. He proceeded to sit down on the grass and waited for his target to wake up. Any question that I have, this man can answer. Ken waited for around 20 minutes in that stance, sitting on the ground with his legs crossed. The tall grass around him made it hard for him to be spotted from a distance, but he stood directly in front of the target, somewhat giving away his position, though he doubted anyone would manage to sense him regardless. It was normal for Ken to think about ways that enemies would be able to approach him, even though he usually allowed others to come near him. After all, having his target tied to a tree right in front of him certainly made him a bit less welcoming to visitors. After all, it wasn't specified whether or not the Kage killer had any allies or accomplices. And Ken surmised that he did after judging his strength, but all of his questions were to be answered soon, as he felt Akira's breath pattern change, his heartbeat returned to a more active state. Ken smiled as he patiently waited for his prisoner to open his eyes. He waited like that for another two minutes, before scowling a bit. Does he think he can pretend to be asleep around me? How exactly do you plan to check your surroundings without opening your eyes? You don't seem much like a sensory type to me. Ken said as he slowly stood up. The blind swordsman then tapped his wrist, a regular katana appearing in his hand with a puff of smoke. Within the time it took for a fly to flap its wings five times, the blade was embedded into the tree right beside Akira's head slightly grazing his cheek with immaculate precision. It made the captive flinch and tilt his head slightly in the other direction. After that, the jig was obviously up, the Kage killer opened his eyes, sweat filling his forehead as he stared at the masked man in front of him. It just had to be him, 
Akira grit his teeth at that thought. Out of everyone trying to collect his bounty, it just had to be the elusive red dot. One that had already reached legendary status in the eyes of many. His reputation, as well as his nickname, both managed to bring a question to Akira's mind though. But why hasn't he killed me yet? Ken's long and unruly hair flowed in the wind as he tilted his head slightly. I can somewhat guess what you're confused about. No one has really lived this long after facing me, with the exception of the Seven Swordsmen, I guess, but their clock is ticking. What do you want from me? Akira said as he struggled a bit against the ropes that bound him. I am. Confused? Do you even know why you are being hunted? Ken asked, his head still tilted as he grabbed his katana and placed it back into the seal on his wrist, the blade disappearing in a puff of smoke. Obviously because of my bounty. Why else would someone like you seek me out? Akira had somewhat accepted the fact that he was going to die. He wasn't about to try and beg for his life, he didn't want his last moments to look pathetic. Ken could somewhat respect that. It was certainly more respectful than the grown men he had seen cry and beg to be spared with snot dribbling all over the place. Bounty is one thing. But your crime is what granted you that bounty. Crime? Obviously, because I stole that stupid fucking scroll. I was carrying it on me, so you should have it already. Akira said with a scowl. I see. He's either playing dumb and trying to stall for something, or he hasn't actually killed the Kuzakage. Ken pondered on that for a second before he decided to judge Akira's reaction by giving him a bit more information. You stand accused of having killed the leader of Kuzagakir. What the hell are you talking about? Akira's voice sounded absolutely shocked, but Ken could feel something else. With his keen senses, Ken managed to notice the heightened heartbeat and the hair rising on the back of his neck. Akira was mostly feeling scared, hiding his fear behind a facade of bravery. T this doesn't make any sense. I swear I didn't kill him. I only sneaked in and stole that scroll. An anonymous buyer was going to pay a premium for it. Akira's voice was shaking, his tone betraying his brave facade from earlier as the reality of the situation was starting to sink in. Being hunted down as a killer was a lot worse than being hunted down as a thief. It went from potentially losing his arm to simply losing his life. Though now it somewhat made sense why someone like the Red Dot was after him. I have no reason to make this up. I do not find pleasure in belittling my targets. From your reaction, I can guess that you've been set up. Ken rubbed his chin for a few seconds as he tried to think more about how to handle the situation. For one, lying to Ken was near impossible. Unless one could perfectly control their heartbeat and body functions, lies were easy to discern for Ken. Well, that was only the case for regular people. Ken's lie detector didn't work on complete psychopaths that could lie without blinking an eye. But something told the blind swordsman that Akira was far from a master manipulator. This matter has just become a lot more troublesome than I had anticipated. Though I can only blame myself, there were plenty of red flags with this situation. For a fraction of a second, the thought of simply killing Akira and collecting the bounty appeared in Ken's mind. But there was something irking him. Is this guy even a shinobi? Can I be sure of any information I had at this point? Are you a thief by profession? Ken asked as he still contemplated if getting involved in the situation further could benefit him in any way. Yeep! I've been doing it since I was a kid. Picked up a few tricks along the way. Akira smiled with a hint of pride, somewhat forgetting his possible demise for a few seconds. You're telling me this guy is self-taught? He's faster than any jonin I've faced up until now. How old are you actually? Ken said as he stroked his chin once more. His intentions were rather plain. He seems quite talented. Recruiting him might actually be a worthwhile venture. I'm 19 this year. Why are you asking me all this? Akira said as he continued to try and move while held by his bindings. I would obviously want to know more about you. This situation is quite unusual after all. The reports I had called you a former Chunin. Were you ever affiliated with any hidden village? Ken decided to continue his interrogation for the time being. Though it became rather clear that basically none of the information he was given seemed to reflect reality. Akira was a bit weirded out by the line of questioning. But he was honestly glad to answer as long as it meant he got to live a bit longer. I've never been a shinobi. Well, I did steal a few techniques from shinobi, but I was never actually taught by a hidden village. Akira's words came out as he shook his head once more. At that point, Ken was getting somewhat angry. To think they'd go as far as to trick me into hunting down a random thief and treating him like a murderer. I need to pay more attention to how I choose my targets in the future. Ken then sighed, and with a flick of the wrist, the rope binding Akira was immediately severed. Akira was scared at first when seeing the red dot's hand move, but he relaxed a bit when he felt the rope that bound him get cut. Unfortunately, that relaxation led to him face-planting into the dirt in front of Ken. 
T thanks. Akira said as he immediately stood up, still in a kneeling position as he looked up at Ken with a dumb smile on his face. Thank me later, you are still in a huge mess. Ken shook his head as he turned his head and looked around the forest. More and more people are gathering. They are quite far from here, but they've certainly spotted Akira already. W well, I'm confident that I'll be able to run away. Akira said as he slowly got up, finally standing at full height, a bit taller than Ken himself. Doubtful. This place has already been surrounded. Ken said as he let his hands fall to the side, preparing to meet the newcomers that were still waiting to make their presence known. W what? Akira said as he immediately became alert as well, gulping as he reached for his belt, to take out a kunai, only to not feel any weapons on him at all. Ken had obviously stripped him of sharp objects, as one would usually do to a prisoner. The blind swordsman didn't see any reason to treat Akira as a prisoner though, he instead gave the thief his pouch back, allowing him to arm himself, just in case. How good are you at fighting? Ken asked as he crossed his arms and continued to look around. W well, I'd say I'm average enough? Ken could only shake his head at the not-so-confident response he had gotten. Great. Let's see if these people are willing to talk things out. I'd rather avoid massacring them if possible. POV narration Akira's hands trembled a bit as he prepared to defend himself, he figured the situation was quite dire if the red dot was claiming he wouldn't be able to escape. In his anxiety, he somewhat missed the part where Ken said he wanted to avoid massacring them, so he now thought that they were going to have a difficult fight on their hands. Let's hope we can reason with them. Don't get your hopes up about diplomacy, Akira. When someone pursues you like this it's likely they've made up their mind long before spotting you. Ken said in his usual calm and collected tone. How the hell is it so easy for him to stay calm? I'm assuming strong shinobi were sent after me since my crime is so high profile, so even a jonin would likely be unable to escape in this situation. In their history, there was never any precedent for assassinating the leader of a hidden village and getting away with it. Even if Akira didn't assassinate the Kage, he was still accused of it, which meant that his chances of survival had decreased drastically. Well, at least they were in his mind. At the very least he didn't die to Ken, right? His talent was the one thing that actually saved his life completely though, as Ken had already decided to take him in and train him. Well well well, if it isn't the red dot? One person stepped forward, with dozens of eyes peering into the clearing from all sides, all looking down at Ken and Akira from the cover of the trees. Their cover didn't mean anything to Ken though. The one speaking feels a bit strange, but around us, there are 10 jonin level shinobi, around 30 chunin. The chunin are here just for the numbers, glorified cannon fodder, all of them seem to be adults or in their late teens. Average at best. Still, their numbers meant that they weren't just random bounty hunters. That made Ken reconsider the situation for a bit, leading to a prolonged silence to set onto the clearing, as the shinobi seemed to be getting more and more anxious with each second that passed by. Silent, eh? I guess we've caught you by surprise. Don't worry, we may spare you if you help us take care of that guy behind you. Surprise? Sorry, but you are a few decades off from being able to take me by surprise. Of course, only if your talent even allows you to grow that much. Ken said in a dead tone, not bothering to act friendly. He was willing to strike a deal if possible, but he didn't have a lot of money on him, nor was he actually willing to pay them off. Arrogant huh? I guess your reputation did go to your head. Regardless, our mission has nothing to do with you. The strange man jumped in front of Ken, his arms moving oddly as he did so. You lot seem rather organized. Not some random bounty hunters, that's for sure. You also smell like grass, you know that? Ken said as he stood in front of the jonin. The Kusagakir got involved after all. I guess it can't be helped, they were likely tracking Akira by themselves even before I started laying down my traps. Ken was rather quick to surmise that Kusagakir had actually sent 10 teams led by jonin after Akira. For a large village, such a move would have been rather small, but for a small village like the Kusagakir, it was a rather good chunk of their trained forces. Huh? You're certainly perceptive. Don't get involved further in this mess, it is none of your concern. We are just here to capture the one that killed our leader. The Jonin said as he extended a palm to Ken, obviously acting as if he was hoping to avoid a fight with the elusive red dot. It made sense, but something about the situation still felt off to Ken. If we take both of them on, we are certainly going to incur some losses. Why is neither of them even injured? The Jonin thought to himself as he signaled his troops to prepare for battle. Ken obviously noticed that some of them were taking their stances and preparing hand signs. He wasn't exactly pleased. As you can see, he is already with me. I assure you that I'll bring him to your village, as per our agreement. That was our next destination actually. 
The blind swordsman said as he tapped the ground with the tip of his shoes. Ken didn't even flinch when lying, nor did his heartbeat change in any way. Even if it was unlikely that the shinobi had any ability similar to his lie detector, the blind swordsman preferred to be careful. Hmm, well, I can't notice any restraints on him. How come he even has his weapons? The jonin said as the atmosphere around him started getting tense. I have no reason to be afraid of my prisoner just because he's armed. I assure you that he is no less harmless to me now than he would have been while tied to a tree. The jonin scoffed a bit when hearing that, obviously not believing the red dot one bit. The rumors paint the red dot to be quite powerful. At least above the level of most jonin. But he seems quite composed even in this situation. He can't truly be at the level of a kage. The grass village was currently going through quite a few changes, but none of the people present was kept up to speed on what was truly happening. Though a sizable force, they were all tools to the village's true leaders, the clans. To them, they were only tasked with a few things. Their mission was actually rather cut and dry. Kill the one that murdered the Kage and bring his body back intact, and kill the Red Dot. They had managed to stalk Akira for a bit, staying a great distance away even when Ken had arrived. The plan was simple. Wait for the two of them to deal with the other. We'll pick off the straggler and complete our mission. Ken had already gained a bounty of his own in some circles after rejecting a few invitations. And he was specifically contacted for Akira's bounty so that this exact scenario would play out. Unfortunately, the situation shifted completely, as they had all severely underestimated Ken. The blind swordsman was still unaware that he was also a target, but from the reaction of the people around him, he was getting a rather large hint. You were never willing to let either one of us walk out of here alive, were you? Ken asked as he stepped forward, standing face to face with the special shinobi as he clenched his fists. Tisk! The shinobi quickly jumped back, taking out a large, football-sized, metallic ball tied to a chain from a scroll on his belt, which seemed to be his weapon of choice. Ken simply grit his teeth as he felt all of the other shinobi around start moving as well. So it's a massacre after all? I'd advise anyone that's weak to simply leave. I don't feel like killing too many of you today. Ken decided to stop trying to reason with them as well. Instead, he started releasing his killing intent, which managed to freeze most of the shinobi in their tracks. His chakra and nature energy both flared up, and combined with his murderous intent, it ended up creating a strange and baleful aura that spread out all around him, most of the shinobi beside the jonin all turned completely white. The tall grass around Ken was swaying, trembling in fear as Ken's aura seemed to push it away constantly, creating a wind of its own. Ken took out his blade, slowly unsheathing it as a deadly silence spread out all around them, with most of the shinobi frozen. The only sound heard was Ken's long blade coming out of its scabbard, as Ken threw the long sheath to the side with a swing. Kume. That was all that Ken said, in the next instant, for Jonin were already on to him, with more coming behind them. They had already done quite a few hand signs while Ken was taking out his blade, and was already spitting fire towards Ken. A large wave of fire was formed, as four different Jonin used varying fire jutsu in an attempt to kill off Ken instantly. Useless. Was all that they could hear, as the blind swordsman's long blade cut through the wave of fire, blasting it back as the trees all around them swayed to match the raging firestorm that was coming right back at them. The jonin managed to dodge away in time, either substituting away or entering the ground. The few chunin that were behind them weren't quite as lucky. Ending up being blown away by the wind and getting burnt by the flames. Ken was about to sigh, but he stopped himself from resting as he raised the hilt of his blade, covering the side of his face with it. A ball and chain broke through the black smoke, hitting the hilt of his blade almost instantly, bouncing away with a metallic clang as Ken felt his hand shift, being moved by the force behind that blow. He's certainly stronger than most. He is actually a bit stronger than me as well. Ken was not delusional to think there were none stronger than him, he was still only 10 at that point, so he had a lot of room for growth. He expected to meet quite a few people better than him in many aspects. But that didn't mean he was unable to fight back against them. Akira, duck. Ken didn't resist the movement of the ball and chain, using the momentum it gave him to swing his sword behind him, where a few shinobi were already trying to ambush him. They barely had the time to react, as Ken's blade immediately became covered in the aura and released a flying slash. Akira had thankfully gotten the message and was already face-planted into the ground. The entire forest around him was cut in half, all the smoke being blown away, and every shinobi that Akira was trying to hold off either lost a limb or was forced to retreat. The cannon fodder was the first to be incapacitated, at least a good chunk of them, as Ken had yet to feel even one of the jonin die to him. Still, plenty of chunin were still hanging on, hiding among the trees and waiting for an opportunity. 
they were after all decently powerful shinobi. Akira, run away for now. Ken said as he turned his head towards the thief who was still hugging the ground and looking at the trees falling around him. Why yes. For a second, Akira had contemplated remaining to try and aid the blind swordsman, but he wasn't stupid. He could tell that he was holding Ken back with his presence there. So, using his superior speed he immediately dashed in a random direction behind him, the Chunin had no chance of even getting close to him, as the surrounding trees didn't even get to fall properly before his back disappeared into the forest. Shit! The special Jonin said as he turned and looked at a few of the Jonin around him. They immediately nodded and started dashing after Akira. Ken turned to them, swinging his blade once more, sending a flying slash in their path. This time, it seemed that the shinobi had predicted his move. Two other jonin and a dozen chunin stepped in front of the flying slash and rose twelve thick earth barriers between him and the people chasing after Akira. The walls shook as most of the people behind them were blown away, but the flying slash was still stopped effectively. TSK. Ken couldn't help but scowl a bit at the almost perfect coordination of the shinobi. Individually, they didn't really match up to him, but together they were still annoying to deal with. They can try to run after Akira, not one of them is fast enough to catch up with him. With that, Ken was left with only around 21 Chunin and 7 Jonin to deal with, including that special, one. I don't remember ever making an enemy out of Kuzugakir. Ken said as he spun his blade with one hand at blinding speeds and deflected dozens of projectiles with ease. Such chatter is unneeded, bounty hunter. Don't think you can just act freely in the shinobi world. One of the Jonin said as he sent another fireball Ken's way. This time, he was joined in by half of the Chunin and a few more Jonin. They formed yet another large wave of flames, much bigger than the last, spanning hundreds of meters and burning the forest and collapsed trees in front of them without any care. Combined jutsus are more annoying than I expected. Ken only had a few milliseconds to ponder on his next move. He immediately decided on taking the obvious route of avoiding the torrent of flames by jumping over it. He leapt far into the air, dozens of meters above the ground as he flipped with his blade a few times, batting away all of the shurikens that came near him with terrifying momentum. He spun and spun, batting away more and more projectiles as he sent flying slashes all over the place, creating a small tornado above the raging flames. The flame torrent came and went, but the fire was still present, as the trees had already dried up and started burning with rage, Ken scowled as he realized that landing would be annoying, thankfully he wasn't exactly afraid of getting a bit burnt. The blind swordsman's flying slashes had cut through the cover of many shinobi, both injuring and dismembering many, including one of the jonin, who lost an arm and a leg, forcing him out of the fight among many others. Ken's momentum was almost forced to a stop, as a large chain seemed to rush at him and twirl around his blade, attempting to pull him to a stop, the special jonin pulled with all of his might and dug his feet into the ground, but he could only be dragged forward by Ken's momentum. That was when a few others joined in and grabbed onto the chain, their combined force being enough to pull Ken from the air and slam him towards the ground. The masked swordsman only had enough time to let go of his sword and roll as soon as he hit the ground, dampening most of the damage and using the momentum to roll away from yet another torrent of fireballs. Eventually, he ended up hitting his back on a burning log. He had felt it there, but he didn't really have any other paths to retreat. He could feel pieces of his armor falling off, as the heat also slightly burnt his skin. But they were all small injuries, the type that he knew he could heal instantly if he so wanted. Three short blades popped out of the wood behind him, forcing him to roll away once more, right into a torrent of kunai and a few fireballs. Ken scowled as his hands moved like lightning, forming a few hand signs and striking the ground with his palm. Earth style, Great Earth Wall Jutsu. A slightly modified version of a technique he had once stolen, a gigantic wall of earth rose in front of him instantly, blocking off the projectiles easily. Unfortunately, the techniques were harder to block, Ken could feel his wall breaking apart with each fire and earth dragon that hit it. Eventually, the combination of jutsus caused the wall to collapse entirely, the earth blew like shrapnel towards the blind swordsman, who managed to jump away in time. As he landed once more, a few earthen hands rose from the ground and grasped at his legs and torso, making him come to a halt immediately, as he also slowly started to sink into the ground. Heh. Even Akage would have lost to our encirclement, you fought well, but you're still no match for us. The special shinobi said as he grabbed Ken's sword and studied it with a smile. Your coordination is quite nice. I don't know about it being able to kill an actual Kage, but I guess I can stop playing around now. In the first place, trying not to kill you all was a mistake on my part. Ken's voice sounded calm, despite his situation he didn't seem to even feel an emotion. This managed to unnerve the shinobi that had gathered around him. 
The special shinobi simply scowled not affected by the atmosphere, instead, he held onto Ken's blade and approached the currently captured blind swordsman. Going out with your own blade. A fitting end for a samurai, right? The special jonin smiled as he spoke, rising the blade above his head and preparing to decapitate Ken in one swing. The blind swordsman only sighed, the blade cut through his head with ease. Lightning spread around the sword and immediately paralyzed the special jonin, as his eyes widened slightly in shock. A lightning clone? Then, his eyes widened even more, as he noticed a backpack filled with paper bombs right in front of him. Release. A voice was heard from behind them all as the shinobi finally noticed Ken calmly sitting on a log, his hand making a simple sign. Two jonin quickly went to assist their leader, trying to help raise a wall between him and the bombs, but they clearly weren't going to make it. The special jonin wanted to do something as well, to make a hand sign and substitute himself, but it was far too quick for his paralyzed muscles to react. Boom. A large explosion engulfed the entire clearing their fight had created, blowing away every shinobi nearby and killing both the special jonin, and the two that had tried to assist him. So much for not getting involved with villages, huh? Ken said as he felt his coat blow backwards in the wind. His armor was still missing pieces, but his body was intact, he was fully healed. Many shinobi were discouraged by that explosion, but that didn't mean they planned to stop chasing their target. Fourteen shinobi in total dashed at Ken all at once. The blind swordsman sighed, as time seemed to slow down for him. He flexed his muscles, his skin started turning a different color as scales started appearing on it. A long tail sprouting out of his back broke the hands holding him with ease, as his muscles continued to expand more and more. Veins appeared on his hands as his nails grew into shape claws, his tails growing a large spike on the end of it at the same time. From here on out? None of you will survive. Alas, you knew what you were getting into, from the start? POV narration, Akira dashed through the forest with great speed, he had been followed, but his pursuers were left in the dust, unable to keep up with him. The thief looked back a few times before he finally came to a stop and hid in a tree. What do I do now? Do I go back and try to help him out? I mean, I doubt I can do much there, it's why I ran away in the first place. But maybe I can be of more help from the sidelines? Akira was well aware that he had left Ken alone against what was essentially a small army of shinobi. Escaping seven jonin and a few dozen chunin was not something any regular shinobi was able to do. Even if the red dot was supposedly stronger than most jonin. Akira was already too far away to observe the situation, so he had decided to try and make an inventory of what he still had on him. Um, the red dot gave me all of my shuriken and kunai back, but he kept all of my paper bombs. The thief felt like crying at that moment, as paper bombs were a lot more expensive than kunai and shuriken, and he had amassed quite a few of them to use in dire situations. Another thing that Akira realized he was missing was the scroll he had pilfered from the Kuzugakir. At least I got away with my life. I'm sure the red dot can handle himself well enough. It was at that moment that Akira felt his spine tremble, he immediately jumped away from the tree, which was promptly crushed by three earth dragons. Shit, they were still following me. Akira quickly turned around a few times in the air, only to notice that the jonin had already anticipated his movements. One jonin had already completed his hand signs, he immediately started spitting flame bullets in Akira's trajectory. The thief tried to dodge, but his lack of mobility in midair made that impossible. Three of the flame bullets hit him and exploded, sending him tumbling to the ground where another had already prepared another jutsu. Earth release, bottomless swamp. The jonin targeted the area where Akira was to land, using a weaker version of the swamp of the underworld. It was a similar jutsu, but it only caused the target to sink, it didn't stick them to it unlike the latter, so this was mostly just a diversion as the last one was preparing one last jutsu to finish their target off. Akira was well aware of that, he knew that he was caught in a bad position. I got careless. Maybe I can still salvage this though. He didn't have any hopes of being able to escape, he did manage to turn in the air though, landing on his feet and trying to dash away instantly, unfortunately, the jonin were already expecting that, with one of them slashing him across the chest with a kunai. You're not getting away, assassin. The jonin said as he stood in front of Akira. The thief scowled, taking out a kunai and throwing it at the jonin. That action had little to no effect, as the jonin simply batted it away. Earth release, dust storm. Akira didn't even get the time to think about his next move, as the jonin from before was already done with his hand signs. The ground in front of the jonin broke and shifted, creating a torrent of mud and dirt that flowed towards Akira like a river. The thief now only had one option left. Without even blinking, he disappeared from his previous position, 
the torrent of dirt and mud demolishing a good chunk of the forest as Akira ran in the opposite direction he had been running in previously. The Jonin smiled when seeing that, as the now injured target was forced to return towards the battlefield. They quickly gave chase though, managing to keep up with the injured Akira and tagging along right behind him. Then they all heard it, a large explosion rumbled the forest, the trees shook and the winds churned, even from a distance, they could see the smoke rising from the battlefield. Akira also gulped as he realized that he couldn't quite stop and change his course, nor could he avoid the battle in front of him. I just hope the red dot managed to take care of enough of them. The Jonin had the exact opposite thoughts though, they instead hoped to see Ken dead by the time they got there. The leader should have already managed to do him in, right? What had happened on that battlefield was well beyond the expectations of either side though. As they arrived, they noticed just how destroyed the surroundings were, no tree was intact in the radius of a few hundred meters. Some parts were burnt to a crisp, other parts seemed inundated, and some had dried up and cracked earth. But that wasn't really shocking, such a scene wasn't exactly uncommon in times of war. The more shocking part was the person that stood in the middle of the battlefield. The red dot was the only one still standing. His mask was bloodied, but the crimson dot in the middle was still very much visible. His fingers sunken deep into the neck of one of the jonin that he had been fighting, corpses piled up at his feet as blood pooled on the ground, dying at a deep red. There was no one alive, the silence was just as deafening as the explosion they had heard earlier. Oh? You're all back. You sure took your time? Ken's voice was the one that broke the silence. It was calm, unervingly composed for such a situation. His tone didn't shake one bit, he was speaking as if he had just finished frying some meat on the grill. The shinobi and thief all couldn't help but gulp a bit. There were many nut jobs in the shinobi world, but few were as powerful and demented as the red dot appeared to them at that moment. As they stared, they also caught a glimpse of the blind swordsman's body. As he dropped the mangled corpse of the shinobi he had been holding to the ground, adding one more to the pile. The usual red armor he had been wearing was no longer there, likely broken off during the battle. His body was only covered by a tattered cloak, loose pants and black sandals. The scariest part about that scene? The one that had massacred everyone was completely uninjured. Not even a mark was visible on his skin. No injury or burn, despite the destruction that surrounded him. From the way things looked, it wouldn't be surprising to anyone to find out that none of the blood staining the ground belonged to Ken. It hadn't even been a full minute from that explosion when they all figured the fight was still going on, yet now everything was basically over. The three Jonin immediately thought of turning their tail and running away at full speed, knowing full well that the fight was lost at that point. Still, before running, they could at least complete one of their objectives. So that they could say they hadn't wasted all of those lives pointlessly. They immediately tried to kill Akira, the closest one to him took out a tanto and sliced towards the thief's neck, aiming to chop his head clean off. Akira took notice of that, and rolled away, dodging the slash and dashing towards Ken's position. The jonin was about to give chase, but the others behind him urged him to retreat, as Ken's figure completely vanished from the middle of the battlefield. The jonin only blinked, and all he could see was a mask, a bloodied white mask with a large red dot in the middle was all that he could see. And it also ended up being the last thing he would see, as Ken's fingers dug into his chest and cleanly pulled out his heart. His hands moved swiftly then, twisting his head around and breaking it as the blind swordsman continued to dash towards the other two jonin. Akira stopped and looked back, almost terrified, as the jonin that had been trying to kill him a second ago had already had his neck twisted and his heart gouged out. The thief's spine trembled a bit when he saw just how quickly Ken had caught up to the other two. The jonin tried their best, using various jutsu to try and fend off the masked killer. From a flame wall to yet another, bottomless swamp. But neither did anything to Ken, who simply stepped on the swamp without any issue and dashed through the fire without any regard for his own safety. Akira couldn't see what happened behind that wall of fire, but he could hear a few muffled yelps before the fire died down. Both jonin were lying on the ground, their heads twisted, and Ken was simply walking back towards him. Akira gulped, as he noticed the massive burns on Ken's abdominal region. He got a bit careless there at the end dash, he didn't even get to complete that thought, as he noticed Ken's flesh shifting unnaturally and mending itself at a quick rate as the masked murderer continued walking towards him. What the hell? Akira was simply speechless at that point. He had never heard of a shinobi being able to instantly heal all of their wounds in that manner. And, in truth, there really were none at that point. Tsunade, who was to become a Sanin, had yet to create her technique, which could lead to similar effects. Seems you were a bit injured. Unfortunately, I don't have much knowledge of medical ninjutsu, so some bandages and salve will have to do for now. 
Ken spoke calmly, his voice unbothered by the smell of blood and burnt bodies that surrounded them. Akira wasn't quite as unbothered, he had seen death in the past, but he wasn't quite used to such a gruesome scene. So he was a bit too shocked and scared to speak to Ken for a few minutes, leading to a rather long pause. Ken didn't just sit around and wait during that time, he went around and looked for anything useful on the shinobi that had fallen to him. The fight hadn't lasted long after he had started taking things seriously. More specifically, he moved too fast for any of them to react accordingly while in that transformed mode. Ken had also decided to give that transformation a name, as he didn't see why he wouldn't be able to consider it a fully-fledged technique. Scaled Sage Mode was what he decided to call it, taking after what the turtles had called him. While in that state, the jutsu of the Jonin and Chunin were basically useless against him. The fire only served to warm him up a bit, the lighting jutsu seemed to bounce off his scales, and the earth bullets hitting him felt more like gentle taps. Jinjutsu was a joke to Ken in the first place, so no one could really do anything to him from that point forward. Kunai and Shuriken couldn't even scratch his thick scales, so the shinobi were really just sitting ducks. It was a mode that granted him overwhelming power. Ken still felt that it wasn't enough, but he wasn't exactly stressing out about it. He still had a lot of room for growth after all. That special shinobi, the one leading them all, didn't turn out to be much. He died relatively quickly. Well, whatever. At least he gave me a bit of information. I should pay the Kuzugakura a visit, I'll make it clear that what happened here today is not acceptable, set a precedent for the other hidden villages as well. After finding a few scrolls and manuals, he went back to Akira, who was sitting on a log and still looking quite shaken. Get your head out of the gutter, Akira, Ken said as he slapped the teenager across the head. Akira was immediately taken out of his trance. The thief was certainly not used to that type of scene, but it seemed a slap did help him compose himself. Eh sorry. Akira muttered as he took a better look at Ken's body. The blind swordsman was still very young, his musculature was already too pronounced for anyone to guess his age. Maybe Ken's body simply matured differently due to his mutation? Maybe it was just because of the excessive training he had been subjecting himself to from a young age. At that point, not even Ken himself had any way of knowing for sure. Still, Akira could see that muscles weren't the only aspects that were well-defined on Ken's body. He was also filled with scars. It seemed the wounds that healed would still remain there for a while. Patches of skin still looked off from the burns he had received earlier, and some cuts were present here and there. You probably have a lot of questions, and you're definitely tired. But this doesn't seem like the type of place to stop and ponder things. The blind swordsman threw a few bandages on Akira's lap. The thief nodded, already treating Ken as an authoritative figure as he started treating his own wounds. Ken then went and collected his large sword, finding its sheath underneath a few fallen trees and allowing it to disappear in a puff of smoke as he tapped its hilt on his wrist. His arm guards were still intact, so his weapon scrolls were still safe as well. Let's go. We'll find you a cave to rest quietly. Then I'll head off to the grass village. You plan to go after them for this? You're certainly strong, but all hidden villages are prepared for invasions. I don't think this is a good idea. Akira instantly was against the idea of Ken going off to the grass village. Even if Ken somewhat scared him now, he had said those words almost instinctively. Why do you suddenly care? Ken simply tilted his head. His tone wasn't aggressive, nor was it pointed in any way. He simply seemed curious. The thief was rather flabbergasted by that question. He stopped and blinked a few times. W well, you did help me out. I wouldn't want the life of my savior to end so abruptly. Akira coughed a bit as he crossed his arms and looked down at the short masked man in front of him. Fair. But you don't have to worry about me, I can still escape even if I can't fight an entire village by myself. The confident tone that Ken used managed to somewhat sway Akira for a second. It certainly helped that Akira had already seen Ken do something he had thought impossible. Maybe he really can just waltz into a hidden village. Well, even I was able to sneak into this one, but something tells me that the red dot plans to do a bit more than that. Well, the fact that I was able to go in and out unnoticed is also a bit suspicious. After what I learned today, someone inside the village likely wanted me to escape successfully and unnoticed. Fine. We should really get moving though. I think you were right, hanging around here can't lead to anything good. The young thief got up and dusted himself, his torso already bandaged. He clutched at his abdomen a bit and sighed. He quickly straightened up and dashed further into the forest. Ken followed suit, keeping up with Akira without any issues. I can't wait to have a chat with the elders of that village. The blind swordsman thought to himself as he felt the wind bend around him with every step. POV narration, finding shelter did not take long, 
there were plenty of places one could use to hide near the border of Kuzugakir's territory. Akira was the only one that needed rest, as Ken was neither injured nor tired from the previous fight. When it came to endurance, he was already unmatched. The thief didn't seem to have any issues with waiting for Ken in that cave. But it was made rather clear that he wouldn't be waiting for more than one day there. For one, it wasn't safe for him, a wanted criminal, to stay in one place for too long. Especially since they were still relatively close to Kuzugakir. Now, Ken did make a good point in the fact that the hidden village was highly unlikely to send any more shinobi after Akira after 10 jonin squads were entirely wiped out in one go. It was a relatively big blow to their overall forces. Moving that many people in the first place was likely some sort of power move. In a sense, Ken figured they were simply trying to not underestimate him and sent numerous people trained to fight together. Unfortunately, they had no way of knowing he was damn near impossible to kill as long as he had enough nature energy around him. Simply put, Ken was constantly drawing in his energy from the surroundings subconsciously. His reserves were rather difficult to deplete. It was a bold move on their part, going after me. The more that the blind swordsman thought about the situation the more impressed he got. In the first place, Akira was likely nothing more than a tool they had used to draw him in. The entire conspiracy with the death of Akage was also weird, but Ken could always just chalk that up to village politics. The clans in the village likely wanted to elect one of their own, and they saw Akira's visit as an opportunity to assassinate the Kage and blame it on someone else, subsequently also using Akira as bait to draw in the elusive Red Dot. Still, Ken was merely hypothesizing, he didn't have enough knowledge, nor did he know why Kuzugakir wanted Akira alive. Time to check things out? And as he started making his way towards the hidden village, the elders had already received a report about the failed mission. It was explicitly delivered by their most trusted shinobi, their village's umbu captain, the Straman Saburo. He was standing on one knee, hand on his chest as he stared at the ground. His uncovered short black hair was silked backwards, the lower part of his face covered by a mask. His black eyes were completely visible, his white scara had a strange yellowish tint to it. He was wearing dark umbu garb, regular issue, his belt strapped with a few scrolls, giving everyone the details of the situation after scouting out the battlefield. He had gone there a bit after Ken and Akira had left. He would have been able to track them, but decided against it when seeing the state of their men. POV Saburo. There I stood, kneeling in front of the council and explaining to them the pathetic state of the team that was sent in our latest mission. All of them died you say? The one at the head of the table spoke with disdain. His tone is annoying, but he is one of the more influential people here. The most influential elder actually, he is technically the village's new leader. The one to become Kuzakage will most likely be his direct subordinate. Yes, Lord Yu, Uehara Yu, the one that spearheaded the assassination plot of our former village leader, and the one that decided it would be a good idea to try and hunt down the Red Dot. And even one of your straw clones was killed off. A Jonin one at that. One of the other elders decided to comment on my failure as well. It was my mistake to underestimate the enemy this time around, I was charged with this task, and I was the one to plan everything out essentially. I should have moved more of my clones to deal with the situation. It is shameful to have failed even after being given so many resources. Who would have thought that the red dot was that strong? I will recover it eventually. Your straw clones are recoverable, yet our trained shinobi are still just corpses scattered around the battlefield. These old fucks are really starting to get on my nerves. I get that I made a mistake, but most of these elders haven't done anything to help me either. It's their fault the most important scroll in our village got stolen in the first place. No, more specifically, it's all the fault of Lord Yu. Whatever he's planning, it's starting to look less and less like it will do any good for our village. Ha. Huh. Regrettable indeed, however, we should still be able to train more, newer generations are born each year. I can at least try to reassure the elders a bit, even if most of them don't seem too convinced. TSK. If this keeps on, we will never enter the ranks of the five great hidden villages. Another clan leader spoke up, one of the minor clans in the area. His clan has only recently attained some wealth, and now he has the gall to come here and run his mouth. Someone like him has no clue just how much power the five great villages hold. Ignorant old fuck. Now now gentlemen. Thankfully, Lord Yu is still here to hold everything together. It is true that we are facing a rather unexpected conundrum, but our village is not in any danger as of right now. Indeed, Lord Yu, while we have suffered some losses, we have also learnt more about our enemy. I believe the Red Dot was still injured quite a bit during that altercation, so I at least have some understanding of his strength. Though I was unable to see the rest of the fight after my straw clone was killed off. 
I remember the red dot was burnt quite severely during that fight while my clone was still there. And by the way, things looked when I visited the battlefield, he probably received quite a few injuries even after my clone died. I guess he isn't quite up there with the five Kage as some rumors portrayed him then. A great thing to point out Lord Yu, not like our village could afford to face off or offend a Kage in its current state. The only Jonin that are capable enough to survive an attack from an actual Kage are mostly indisposed at the moment. Not like we have more than four anyway. The former Kuzakage was decently powerful about as powerful as I am with all of my clones. But he was nowhere close to matching up to people like the third Hokage, or the third Rakage. The five great villages are the places where the real monsters are born and thrive, they actually have several figures at the level of an actual Kage. Kanahagakur currently has the White Fang, for example. And the Kumogakure has the sons of the current Rakage, who I heard are quite formidable, all of them learning the lightning release chakra mode. All of the large villages also have several Jinchuriki, which makes the power balance even more skewed. It's basically impossible for a village like ours to match up to them, yet the elders here are still dreaming about useless stuff like that. At least Lord Yu is more realistic and is only trying to profit for himself in these situations. After all, a small village like ours will get killed off if even one of these Kage level figures was to be tasked with its destruction. And while I can fend off most attacks by myself with my clones, I am bound to lose a lot of them against an actual Kage. I'd likely just have to flee, the village would still be doomed. It's no use for us to try and compete with the five villages, it's much better to just suck up to them. This is why I can understand Lord Yu's attempt at assassinating the Red Dot. One of the five villages seemed to be rather keen to see him dead, if we were able to claim his bounty, things would have been looking up for us. Well, I'll now have to look into killing the Red Dot myself after this meeting. I'm sure I can still track him, and with all of my clones, it should be rather simple to kill him as he is still injured. All in all, this village is lucky that I am still on their side. Yet I still have to put up with the bullshit of these stupid elders. Alas, they are also the ones to provide me with enough people to perform my rituals on. They are the most accommodating and ask the least questions, so I can't complain now, can I? Well, I guess this gives our village some time to recuperate. Still, an assassin like him will certainly come after our heads once he does recover. Another elder just felt the need to add that. Couldn't have had a more positive atmosphere, after all. I guess Lord you will always have his detractors. It can't be helped. Though I'm guessing they won't be alive for very long if they're willing to voice out dissatisfaction like this. I doubt we need to worry. Our barrier will tell us whenever anyone gets too close to the village, no matter how well they can hide their presence. We will be able to prepare ourselves accordingly. We still have the home field advantage after all. That is also true. This being our territory means we know it better than any outsider. The red dot isn't as big of a threat here, especially since he'll be detected when he gets too close anyway. The barrier surrounding our village is made with advanced fuingitus. The only reason such a thing is available to us is that we manage to befriend the Leaf Village during the reign of their second Hokage. No matter how good the Red Dot is, he won't be able to overcome something set up by Fuinjutsu masters back in the day. Right? POV narration, there were plenty of people stationed inside the array room of the largest building in Kuzagakure. Jonin that were there to both protect the array slash formation and to watch over it. A large glowing map stood in the middle of the room, a large transparent circle surrounded it, the layer that made up their formation. The core was in that very room, and the transparent circle would ripple every time someone with a certain level of chakra passed through. One would only be able to not trigger the alarm by carrying a specific seal while passing through it. That seal was usually hidden in their headbands, so all of their shinobi was safe to pass through. Each rank of shinobi was given a different seal, as the formation reacted differently to the amount of churka a person could have. Their defenses were quite good, and their secrets were well kept, so they had nothing to worry about. They also didn't have to worry about not noticing something, as the ripples in the array were large even when an unrecognized genin passed through it. There was no way for any such action to go unnoticed. Ken stepped into their territory without making any noise, his legs touching the grass soundlessly and weightlessly. He stopped just short of a small line in the tall grass in front of him. One centimeter of earth where there was no blade of grass, a line that likely surrounded the entire village. It was impossible to notice with the naked eye, but someone like Ken could sense it regardless. He felt the formation in front of him, he had already expected something like that from a hidden village, so he wasn't exactly shocked. Ken's knowledge of seals and formations was not that great, but he was aware of what could be achieved using them thanks to some scrolls he found, including the weapon storage seals he was using. To him, seals were an extremely complex and amazing art. It was something he absolutely wished to master if given the chance. 
Thinking logically, he started theorizing about how the formation worked. If a regular shinobi's thought process is anything to go by, this formation is likely just an alarm system. If it triggered every time a regular person passed through, it would be very messy. So this is likely only here to detect actual threats. People with a certain level of chakra. How it goes around not constantly detecting their own shinobi is something I can only guess right now. This doesn't feel all that complex though. At least nowhere near as much as I expected. Ken simply tilted his head at that thought. After all, if that was truly the case, then the formation was truly quite flawed. Not the type of work he'd expect from trained master assassins. But he was not attacking any large village at the end of the day. This was just a small village, quite weak in the grand scheme of things. I guess I can try to go in undetected. With a deep breath, Ken's form started shifting once more, his skin visibly turning to scales as he pushed out all of the chakra in his body. I don't know if they can detect nature energy. I've yet to meet someone else using it, so I'll just hazard a guess that they can't detect it as easily. Ken used his tail to dig up a small hole, creating a small hill right near the barrier's edge. And so, Ken walked up in front of the barrier and sat down on that small dirt mound, sitting on his side with his tail wrapped around his body. I didn't think I'd be doing something like this to get into a hidden village undetected. Ken pushed out the small remainder of his chakra next, turning into a statue that next instant, instantly becoming petrified and rolling off into the formation. Inside the array room, the jonin in charge yawned as he kept his eyes fixed upon the translucent barrier around their large map. Not one ripple appeared as Ken's statue rolled through their barrier and into their territory. It was as if someone had just thrown a rock towards their village which didn't trigger any response from their barrier. The blind swordsman stayed as a statue for a few minutes, cracks started appearing on the surface as soon as he started regaining some chakra. Ken then proceeded to crawl further away from the array, his tail slithering behind him as he slowly stood up. I wonder if this formation helps them keep watch on who is inside it as well. Well, I've done whatever I could to come in undetected at this point. If they have further countermeasures then I'll just have to deal with them as they come. Ken then turned back into his regular form, still controlling his body and suppressing his chakra to the maximum as he walked through the tall grass while not disturbing it in any meaningful way. Time to see what this village is truly made out of. I'll try to avoid harming any of the civilians here. I just hope the other shinobi have similar thoughts. POV narration, Ken blended into the shadows, his black cloak covering his body, his white mask being the only thing that was standing out. But he was smart enough to keep away from anyone capable of spotting him, he crept into the shadows, flying past their village's small walls with a single leap. Since they've not intercepted me yet, I can safely assume they have no way of tracking me if I didn't trigger the alarm. With that, Ken became a lot more confident, knowing that he otherwise could hardly be noticed by sensor types. He glided through the night, dashing from wall to wall and getting closer and closer to the largest building in the village. The Kage Building. Before heading there, however, Ken scouted out the village a bit more, looking for other areas of interest and checking if anything valuable was there. Funds were always an issue, so finding money was not a bad thing. Ken managed to successfully borrow some money, jewelry and scrolls from the clans in the village. It was surprisingly a lot more than he had managed to gather through his bounty hunting over the past few months. Damn. Making enemies out of a hidden village isn't nice, but they sure have money to spare. The security was surprisingly lax, at least for someone like Ken. But it seemed that wasn't the case for the entire village. More specifically, all of the shinobi seemed to be guarding the Kage building, where Ken assumed a meeting with all of the important people in the village was taking place. The closer he got to the Kage building, the tighter the security was around him, and the more questions appeared in his head. How the hell did Akira even get close to that building? It was obvious at that point, that Akira was likely just allowed to stroll in there. Even Ken was having issues sneaking around all of that security, Akira shouldn't even have been able to get close to the village without getting spotted. Now, the majority of patrolling shinobi were merely Jenin and Chunin, but that didn't mean they didn't have eyes. The Kage building had no blind spots from what Ken could feel. It somewhat made sense for a hidden village to be that well guarded, but that didn't mean Ken had to like it. I can't just sneak in there by the looks of it. Too many eyes on all entrances, even windows on the higher stories. It's impossible to not get spotted if I do try something. A meeting is certainly going on in there from what I can sense. Wait. Isn't that the leader of the team sent after me and Akira? Ken could sense his signature, Saburo's signature to be more exact. And Ken remembered quite clearly that there were just a few chunks of flesh left of him. If it was a clone, then there shouldn't have been anything left of it. It's pretty weird, a lot of people feel like him nearby. I should probably look into this. 
Ken then decided to look for some type of disguise to get inside quietly. He could always just attack it, but that was likely going to affect quite a few of the civilians inside the village. If I can get in there, I'll just force the entire fight to happen inside. I doubt they'll be willing to destroy that building anyway, so it should be fine. Ken went around a few buildings for the following minutes, keeping an ear on the pulse of the situation, keeping track of the people around him and trying to decide who would be the best disguise. In the end, he managed to spot a masked figure, wearing a cloak similar to his own, probably of the same color as Shinobi didn't like standing out. The blind swordsman immediately assumed that the man was an umbu. It wasn't exactly a difficult conclusion to come to. It seemed that he was the most obvious choice at the end of the day. Ken only needed to transform himself slightly to match the other person's hair. There was one issue though. What color is his hair color, I wonder? It wasn't like the wind beating in his ears was going to whisper the colors of things around him. He also couldn't just summon a turtle to help as it was bound to give away his position. Alas, it doesn't have to be the perfect disguise. I just need to get in unbothered, I must only fool a few people, not the entire village. Ken stalked that masked man a bit, it seemed that he was also heading for the building that housed the grass council. He was able to successfully predict the umbu's trajectory and rushed into an alley in front of him. The umbu jumped from building to building without noticing anything awry, he had no clue that he was being tracked. And when he jumped over a certain alleyway, he felt something grab his leg, stopping him instantly. He looked down at his foot, only to notice a clawed hand covered in dark scales clutching his leg tightly. He was about to scream, but a tail immediately clutched his neck tightly and dragged him down. Ken dropped into the alleyway, his tail crushing the umbu's neck as he landed. The blind swordsman wasted no time in taking off his mask and coat, putting them in the seal on his wrist, he then took the dead umbu's mask and coat, putting them on quickly. He judged the other man's haircut for a moment and used the transformation jutsu to minimally alter the size of his hair. He didn't bother altering the color as there was no point in trying to guess it. They were also of similar size, so Ken didn't need to bother with altering his height or build in any way. It was a lot better like that, the less a transformation changed the harder it was to spot at the end of the day. Ken then contemplated what to do with the body, before sighing and taking out a scroll from the seal on his wrist. I can't leave this here. It's one good way of raising the alarm and allowing things to go to shit. Thankfully it didn't take long to put the body in the scroll and store the scroll back into his wrist. Ken then continued the umbu's journey, not bothering to hide his presence as much and allowing quite a bit of chakra to be felt from him. He tried his best to match the other man's chakra levels, which was a bit above most chunin by the feel of it, but not quite close to being a jonin. The blind swordsman continued on the umbu's path, he could tell that he was spotted by quite a few people, but it seemed that his disguise had done its job. Ken managed to enter the building without anyone stopping him, which was a great success in his mind. Wait a moment. Ken froze in place, a few steps from the doorway when he heard a voice call out to him. Reindeer, are you already reporting? How was your patrol? Another umbu stood there, looking at him through his mask. Ken pondered on how to answer for a few seconds. He didn't know what voice he could use, and he didn't know if Reindeer was even his codename. Is he testing me? If that's the case, then I should prepare to kill him quickly. Ken waited for a few seconds, pondering whether or not to try and keep up his disguise using a rough voice. That was when the umbu in front of him made a small mistake, showing a slight tint of hostility. Ken immediately picked up on that and noticed that the man was on high alert. Shit. My cover's been blown already. Immediately he stepped toward the umbu, who only got to take a step back as Ken's hand was covered in scales and impaled his chest. The blind swordsman had aimed for the heart, alas, thanks to his alert state of mind, the shinobi was able to slightly shift his body and avoid getting his heart gouged out. Ken then turned around, claws still digging into the man's lung, and kicked the umbu's face with unrelenting force, his body bent at an odd angle as he did so. The umbu's mask seemed to crack, as he vanished in a puff of smoke, Ken felt him fleeing, swapping places with a log, as Ken's clawed hand embedded itself into the log as well. The substitution was far from successful though, as the umbu had still been severely injured. Ken then proceeded to throw the log outside using all of the speed he could muster, causing it to fly like a bullet right into a few shinobi right before it exploded. Explosive tags at the ready? He was preparing to attack me, good thing I acted first. Ken then proceeded to return his body to normal, allowing his chakra to recover as he started rushing towards the meeting room. He ran through the hallways, a few umbu tried stopping him, this time Ken took out a katana to deal with them, cutting through their limbs before they even got to finish performing any jutsu. They were left with missing limbs on the ground, as Ken didn't even stop to finish them off properly. Ken immediately hid his presence and threw off his umbu mask, 
He could feel all of the shinobi in the village mobilizing, but he knew that they hadn't spotted him. He had the time to put his own mask back on and change back into his usual cloak. The people in the conference room were already aware of what was happening outside, it seemed that the commotion had already alerted them of an intruder. All of the people inside, bar the elders that represented the villagers, were already up from their seats, with their hand signs finished, prepared to unleash a flurry of jutsu at the door. Ken could feel that some of the people inside were above most jonin in strength, they were likely the heads of the few clans that resided in the grass village. The blind swordsman wasn't at all discouraged by the surplus of people inside, but he wasn't about to just walk in front of their jutsus. There were also plenty of other people inside, Umbu hiding in the room and protecting the elders. Coming through the door was not a good move in that situation, so Ken instead went to an adjacent room, that shared a wall with the meeting room, and took out his blade. He grasped his large blade with both of his hands, swinging it and severing the wall in front of him. A flying slash extended and killed most of the people near that wall, the others in the room seemed to have the time to duck, but Ken's surprise attack did manage to kill three elders. Through the dust of the destroyed wall, everyone in the room caught a glimpse of Ken's mask, making their spines shudder. A famed bounty hunter coming after their heads. It was a bit absurd for him to attack an entire village alone, but seeing as three elders were already dead. Sufficient to say, Ken certainly had the skill to kill them, even in that situation. Saburo was just as shocked to see the red dot. But he wasn't afraid, all of his clones were nearby after all. Now! The strawman gave a command instantly, and Umbu dropped from the ceiling, all unleashing a flurry of flame and water towards Ken. The remaining elders also did the same with only one of them doing something other than a fireball, wind bullet, or water wave. Grass style, grasping rose bush. The elder tapped the floor with his hand, a loud thud resounding throughout the large room as Ken felt the floor underneath him creak. The blind swordsman moved instantly, dodging a few jutsu as he did, and tried to rush towards some of the other elders in the room, only for a few tendrils to rise from the floor in front of him and stop him in his tracks. Ken was about to cut through the rose thorns in front of him, but then his legs were also rooted in place, as the bush rose from the ground and entangled his feet. Spiked tendrils rose from the ground and dug into Ken's legs, forcing him in place as he turned to the attacks coming his way, preparing to at least block the jutsus coming his way. Grass style? I guess the founding clan of this village has that Kekiai Genkai. What an annoying bunch. Ken spun his blade in front of him at great speeds, creating a whirlwind in front of him as he did his best to cancel out the attacks coming his way. It seemed to work, for the most part, the majority of flames that came in contact with the spinning blade seemed to get dispersed, the blind swordsman could however feel his arms getting more and more burnt as more fire came his way. Each wind bullet slowed him down slightly, and each water jet seemed to force him back a bit, as the thorns in his legs still ripped at his flesh. But Ken was able to hold on perfectly, the pain was nothing to him, and the injuries were still negligible. Eventually, two large dragons came his way, one made out of fire, and another made out of earth. Ken's blade wasn't able to turn and cut them in time, so the blind swordsman was hit head on. The blind swordsman dug his feet into the ground and prepared to block the earth dragon with his blade, keeping it in front of him and bracing for impact. The earth dragon immediately crashed into him, causing him to skid backwards a few meters before coming to a stop. It managed to rip the thorns that had been keeping him in place and injured his legs even more. The fire dragon came in right after, Ken turned and managed to only get halfway through a swing as the dragon came in. The blind swordsman only got to shift his body to the side slightly, only losing his arm to the gigantic fire dragon. Ken wasn't at all panicked though, as he allowed his legs to heal already, and the thorns that had been stuck in him fell to the ground. It was impossible to tell if Ken's legs were healed because of the sheer amount of blood pooling at his feet. The blind swordsman also cut off the burnt-off parts of his now charcoal arm that still remained on his body, in order to properly heal it later. To be expected of a hidden village, huh? Decisive enough to destroy their own buildings to kill me. Interesting. I didn't think you would have the guts to come to us directly. You were already injured enough. Saburo walked forward, and the umbu around him followed in an almost mechanical manner. You're the interesting one here. Say, have I killed you before? Ken asked as he stood straight without even a hint of fear. The umbu caption found the red dot's endurance to be quite impressive, even shocking. But the result of the fight was still clear in his eyes. You did kill one of my clones. They are a bit special, as I'm sure you've realized. Not that any of this matters to you, you're still going to die here. Saburo shrugged a bit as he signaled to the umbu behind him. It feels quite weird. Are all of these umbu also your clones? Ken really struggled to understand the jutsu that Saburo was using for a moment, but he was still sharp enough to notice that. 
The Umbu all seemed to have different chakra reserves, it was rather odd. Ken felt as if he was sensing different versions of the same person, instead of clones. You sure are chatty for a corpse. Saburo then raised his hand, and the clones behind him all prepared one last jutsu, to finish off the elusive red dot. I guess I wanted to test the waters a bit, my bad for underestimating you all. Ken's body then slowly shifted underneath his cloak, his muscles expanded as his body once again filled with scales. Saburo's eyes widened in horror as he watched Ken's previously missing hand reappear, veins bludging on his muscles as the arm just reappeared into existence. I hope you have a few aces hidden up your sleeve, otherwise you are all going to die here. Ken grasped his blade in one hand, wielding it effortlessly as his other hand grew a sharp set of claws. POV narration, how can someone heal so quickly? Saburo and the elders that had witnessed that scene were all flabbergasted. But they weren't scared, at least not yet. All of the shinobi in the village were already gathering towards the Kage building, so it didn't matter how fast Ken could heal, he'd still die at the end of the day. But those scales are unnerving. Something tells me that I should at least flee with my main body. Saburo's instincts were a bit better though, he could feel his spine shudder at the sight of Ken's transformation. He could also feel the aura in the room had become a lot more suffocating, that type of pressure would definitely make it harder for less experienced shinobi to concentrate. He could feel everything that his straw clones were feeling, so he felt Ken's aura a lot better than most would. He could also see Ken from every angle essentially, but that didn't make him any more ready for what was to come. The red dot started moving at speeds that simply couldn't be tracked by any regular shinobi. The strawman could only sweat as he watched four of his straw clones lose their heads instantly. Ken stopped and touched one of the heads of the dead clones, his claws dug a bit into it and he shook it after noticing something strange. A layer of straw seemed to fall apart and revealed the head of a completely different man. Possibly a former shinobi. Interesting. Some sort of possession and transformation technique. I can safely assume that not one of the people in front of me is the real one, as they all feel the same. Your technique. Seems a bit sadistic. The blind swordsman said, slowly turning his head towards the strawman's clones. It is a cutthroat world. No one has any right to judge me. You especially. One of Saburo's clones said as it looked at Ken's scaled body with visible fear. Oh, I wasn't judging you. Ken stepped on the floor heavily, fracturing it and causing a lot of it to fly from the sheer force of his step. The blind swordsman appeared in front of that clone, his clawed hand digging through its head with ease. It was just an observation. I would also call it quite impressive. Ken said as he looked at one of Saburo's clones that was trying to stab him with a tanto. The blade snapped completely when coming in contact with the blind swordsman's back. Saburo's eyes widened, and he gulped a bit as he responded. That is high praise coming from somebody like you. Fuck sake. The only one I know of that may be able to fight this monster is the Rakage, maybe some of the other five kages of the large villages could, but this small village is doomed. Saburo had already completely given up on the grass village. The other elders were still willing to fight though. Grass style, overgrown weeds. The floor underneath Ken seemed to shift and grass started growing out of it uncontrollably, the blind swordsman jumped and grabbed onto the ceiling, digging his tail into it to avoid the attack that tried to grab and entangle his entire body. The grass seemed to keep growing, expanding toward him regardless of his elevation, so Ken was forced to his tail to push himself into a different part of the meeting room. He spun in the air, and a few of Saburo's clones managed to get out of the way, allowing Ken's tail to cleave through one of the elders, the other one substituting with a wooden log in time. There were now only three elders left, Saburo's clones were still numerous, but Ken wasn't exactly afraid of them. Yu, the strongest and most influential elder was still willing to fight with his life on the line. Despite the clear difference in skill. He won't be able to keep up that form for long. Whittle him down, keep him here until the others arrive. The elder shouted with authority in his voice, waking up the others around him and rallying them again. You then tried to perform another grass-style jutsu, hoping to at least distract the monstrous bounty hunter that was bent on slaughtering them all. Shit. I need to escape by myself at the very least. As long as I live our village does as well. The influential elder looked around as he watched Ken cut through Saburo's clones with ease, dried up body parts flying throughout the room as the carnage continued. We can't fight him in an enclosed space. The other two elders looked at each other, quickly performing a few hand signs and finishing their jutsu and tapping on the ground. Dotan, Rikuja Shugekeha no Jutsu. Earth release, ground shockwave technique, their combination made it feel as if an earthquake was breaking through the entire building. The floor made out of wood and dirt was deformed and everyone was forced to jump from one piece of rubble to another as the building fell apart right underneath them. 
Anyone that had been on the lower levels was doomed to be crushed by the debris, but the elders didn't seem to particularly care. All of the shinobi of their village were already gathered around the collapsed Kage building, and the elders were the first ones to jump out of the rubble and stand amongst them. Good. Let's show this bounty hunter why you must never mess with a hidden village. Yu was a bit mad that the other elders had acted without consulting him and destroyed the building, but he was glad to be amongst the other shinobi of their village. The strawman also jumped out of the collapsed building in time, along with a few clones. He stared at the collapsed building with a scowl on his face. Well, on most of his faces. As if that's going to injure him. I already tried stabbing him with every weapon in this stupid village, my clones weren't even able to put a scratch on his scales. As Saburo had expected, the next person to come out of the rubble was Ken. All of the shinobi presents shuddered when they saw the rubble being blown apart in all directions. Ken walked out of it uninjured and uncaring, his masked face was simply facing everyone without even flinching. He let his long sword sink into the ground, tilting his head slightly as he seemingly glared at all of the shinobi through his mask. Not that Ken could glare at anyone per se, but they didn't have any way of knowing that, now did they? All of the shinobi presents were looking at him with sneers and cursing at him loudly. Asking how he had dared to attack a village by himself. The three elders still alive also helped rile everyone on, as they added to the fire by promising great rewards for the one to bring down the red dot. Saburo scowled when seeing that. He was the only one smart enough to know that there was really no winning in that situation. Even if we manage to beat him, many people are bound to die here today. The standing of this hidden village will fall exponentially, and it will likely just be swallowed by another one. The strawman ultimately couldn't care less about the village itself, but he would be forced to look for a new hideout. And right when my supply of clones is going down the shitter? Saburo couldn't help but curse under his breath. All of you are noisy. Would you mind shutting up a bit? The blind monster tilted his head as he spoke, the same baleful aura from earlier spread throughout the battlefield, unnerving all of the people present. It didn't get a large reaction out of trained shinobi, but it was at least enough to make them quiet. You were the ones that decided to make an enemy out of me in the first place. You can only blame yourselves for all that will happen today. Ken's voice reverberated throughout the clearing created by the collapsed Kage building. Big words for someone that's surrounded. Do you think you have what it takes to escape from here? Elder Yu said with a cocky smile on his face, his eyes narrowing at Ken's appearance. He is a lot stronger than the reports say. No one said anything about scales either. It's good that everyone got here quickly, or I might have gotten killed earlier. Although cocky on the outside, he was quite worried inwardly. Their lack of understanding when it came to the Red Dot's abilities was the main cause of that worry. It couldn't be helped, after all, they had just watched Ken kill quite a few of Saburo's clones with ease, and most of the clan leaders in the village were also dead. Escaping isn't a problem. I'll leave when I feel I've done enough to send a message. Ken's tail swayed a bit, the spiked end trailing on the ground a bit and cutting through it with ease. Some of the shinobi presents couldn't help but flinch, but they were all prepared for a fight, and they decided to rush in at the same time. Ken also took off, the debris underneath him breaking instantly as Ken dashed in between the shinobi. Saburo sweated a bit when he saw that. Leaving his blade behind, he's not even using Kenjutsu. This means he's not even taking this seriously. This village is well and truly doomed. Saburo sneakily sent some of his stronger clones away. No use losing more of my strength on this village. I'll just pretend to help them a bit then flee. Then, Saburo and the weaker clones that remained all dashed in as well, preparing for a harsh battle. Might as well say goodbye to the rest of my clones. I want to at least try and damage him slightly, repay this stupid village a bit for all of the test subjects they provided. Unfortunately, the Taijutsu bout didn't go exactly as the grass shinobi had planned, as Ken's tail and claws cleaved through their weapons with ease. Ken swung his claws at a shinobi cleaving him in two while three blades broke on his back, cutting into his cloak and shredding it further. The shinobi were simply flabbergasted, looking at their broken weapons with scared eyes, only for two of them to be decapitated by a tail swipe. The third one managed to crouch in time and avoid losing his head, but Ken's leg whipped out and kicked him square in the chest. The shinobi immediately felt his ribs shattering into fragments and shooting into his lungs, he was sent flying into the crowd, half dead. As that was happening, more and more people gathered around Ken, stabbing at him with spears and all types of weaponry, trying to score in more and more hits and whittle him down, as instructed by the elders. Ken turned and grabbed two of the spears, using his superior strength he yanked them out of the hands of their wielders. He then grabbed both of them with one hand, slightly crushing the wooden parts of both as he started swinging them around madly, cutting into the shinobi with extended reach. Many fell to his swings, while their weapons, barely left a scratch on him. 
One lucky shinobi managed to attack him with a weapon covered in lightning chakra, it left a red line across the red dot's back. The shinobi wasn't lucky enough to escape though, his head was pierced through by Ken's tail at blinding speeds. And the wound he had created was nothing more than a scratch that healed up in seconds. At that point, many realized that getting close to Ken wasn't optimal, so they started bombarding him with kunai, shuriken, and senbo. They didn't seem to be that effective on the blind monster scales, harmlessly bouncing off as more and more weapons pooled at his feet. Some tried to aim for his eyes, but Ken made sure to shield his mask, so in the end, they weren't able to do much. Ken smiled a bit as he felt the weapons pool at his feet, he immediately blasted his tail into the ground, causing hundreds of kunai and shuriken to slingshot back at the shinobi. More started falling, being pierced by weapons as fear spread throughout the battlefield. Some tried spitting fire at Ken, but the fire seemed to be ineffective, wind bullets also didn't even seem to make him flinch. Useless fools. They're just like a bunch of cattle waiting to be slaughtered, can't adapt to their opponent at all. All of them would have been more useful as clones. Elder Yu scowled when he saw the way things were moving. He immediately started commanding everyone in a more direct manner, taking control of the situation and spouting orders loudly. He tried grasping Ken in grass, but the blind monster was able to just rip them out of the ground with ease and continue throwing back Kanai and Shuriken with his tail. Saburo also scorned them loudly, as he instructed all of his remaining clones to scatter and encircle Ken, he immediately started setting up paper bombs and throwing them towards Ken. Ken felt them coming, and immediately swung his tail and spun around in a circular motion, bouncing dozens of explosive Kanai back towards the crowd just as they started glowing. Explosions rang all around Ken, and he scowled a bit at the way they overloaded his senses. The charred smell of burnt-up bodies and the ringing of the explosions managed to blind his senses momentarily. But he didn't panic at all, he could still easily feel the way that people moved around him, the way their auras manifested. From the way they were revolving, it seemed that they had created a larger clearing around him, clearly preparing for a large-scale combination jutsu of sorts. They're probably taking the opportunity of me being a bit stunted to prepare something big. I don't really have chakra to perform any jutsu to defend myself in this form, so I guess I'll just have to tank it. Ken then slapped his tail on the ground, creating a shockwave large enough that all of the smoke around him was blown away, revealing all of the blown up body parts and burnt corpses that littered the scorched ground surrounding him. I can't go and heal from large wounds constantly, regrowing my arm was enough to tire me out. I'm still far from being able to recover from such wounds at no cost. It might be time to flee from this place soon. Alas, the damage was already done, in that short bout, the village had lost at least a hundred able-bodied shinobi of different ranks. Meanwhile, Ken was just tired. He had his scales to thank for that, as he would have been dead had he tried to take on that many people in his base form. He was only able to ignore hits and fight recklessly because he knew that he was durable. If he needed to dodge around constantly, then the damage he could have dealt would have been far less. The shinobi around him seemed to have already prepared something nice for him. And Ken turned and smiled a bit under his cracked mask. Fire release cooperation technique, Garuda. Dozens of shinobi finished their seals and started spitting out gouts of fire. The breaths of many combined into only a few gigantic flame dragons. Ken felt that he was surrounded on all sides, but he didn't panic. Instead, he punched at the ground with all of his force, causing the earth around him to crack and raise up, creating a makeshift shield around him just as the dragons were about to reach him. The combination jutsu blasted apart earth around Ken, but it wasn't like he was forced to take the hit. The blind swordsman used the few seconds that the earth shield had bought him to jump over the fire dragons, avoiding the raging explosions with ease. One of the dragons followed him in the air, but Ken managed to cut it apart with a swing of his tail, using the momentum of his jump and spinning around fast enough to cut through anything that came close to him. He could feel more of his cloak burn up, and some small bits of his mask falling apart as it broke further. It was only around his mouth though, and Ken wasn't worried much about it, as he could still fix it. Still, the high temperatures did boil the blood in his veins and heat up his organs, making him use more and more energy to heal up. He was constantly absorbing nature's energy, but that didn't mean he wasn't going to run out eventually. His consumption at that point was far greater than his absorption, so he had to be careful. But he was still relatively safe, he then landed on the ground with a loud thud, slapping it with his tail a few times and blasting away the fire that was around him. Ninja Art, for Flames Formation. Just as Ken landed, the shinobi acted once more. For Umbu tapped their hands on the ground simultaneously, and a violet slightly transparent barrier spread out all around them entrapping Ken in a large formation. Oh? A prison of sorts. How thoughtful, giving me time to rest. Ken laughed a bit at their struggle. 
He was already planning on fleeing, as he felt he had already done more than enough damage, and he didn't feel like he could keep up much longer. The shinobi didn't seem to be in any mood to joke around anymore. Any mocking laughter or gaze was completely gone, they were all desperate, tired, and scared from what Ken could feel. So his attack had already met its intended purpose. Most of the fight was kept in the clearing of the collapsed Kage building, so no civilians were affected at the very least. Hee hee hee. More like giving us some time to rest. One other person was there in the formation with him. One of Saburo's clones, the one that acted as an Umbu captain. Heh. I guess you're still in the mood for jokes since you're not in any danger. Ken smiled widely under his cracked mask, somewhat amused at the little care Saburo was showing for the village he technically represented. Indeed, this village is spent, you've already killed around half of our forces in a few minutes. We obviously give up at this point, I'm not even sure this formation can hold you here honestly. Saburo raised his hands with a wry smile as he spoke about the hidden village essentially surrendering to a bounty hunter. The strawman really couldn't care less, at the very least he didn't lose that many of his clones. The only troubling part was they would likely have to find a new hideout. None of the five hidden villages was likely to accept him either, so things were bound to get a bit more difficult for him. So you guys want me to leave, huh? Ken tilted his head as he spoke, smiling a bit under his mask. Essentially, yes. The elders have reached the conclusion that they can't go on any longer. You've won is what we're saying. The village surrenders. Saburo waved his hand around a bit as he explained a few things to Ken. You on the side looked at Ken with absolute hate. He wanted to keep going, but since Ken was not showing any signs of slowing down or being tired, and there was no injury on him, continuing to fight simply felt irresponsible to him. We've already lost too much today. We need to get back on our feet, recuperate our strength, and get much stronger than before if we want to even approach this monster again. We'll have to survive against the other hidden villages first. Heh. <laughs> Alright then, if you want me to leave you'll have to give me a few things. Ken immediately started negotiating, realizing that the village was basically begging him to leave them alone. Might as well take them for all they've got, right? POV narration The very concept of an entire hidden village surrendering to a bounty hunter was unheard of. And that was with good reason. Even the grass village, one of the weakest ones, had around 350 shinobi. Around 40 of them were just Saburo's clones. Even if the majority of them were genin, they made up a force large enough to make other villages wary of them. The grass village was by no means strong, but they were stable enough, especially since it once had the support of the leaf village. Village politics were still a difficult thing, and a hidden village would never stick its head out for another unless the situation was dire. So Elder Yu was well aware that the Red Dot would get away scot-free even after killing so many of their shinobi. There were only around 270 shinobi in the village when Ken attacked, the rest were either away on mission or dead. Now, only around 156 of them were alive and in fighting condition. And Ken didn't even seem phased by the fight that had been happening up to that point. That was why the elders, with you at the helm, decided that it would be better to call the entire fight off. If I had known he was this powerful I wouldn't have gone after him in the first place. You was quite annoyed by the situation, but the fact was already consummated, their losses already materialized. They sent Saburo to speak to him, as the Umbu captain, he was the most powerful in their village. They hoped the formation would be able to hold Ken there, but even if he was held there they wouldn't be able to do much to him. The formation would fall apart when the shinobi forming it ran out of chakra anyway, so they couldn't hold him there forever. How much is your village willing to give exactly? You could hear Ken's voice from inside the formation, as the masked monster crossed his arms and tilted his head at Saburo. Well, at this point, I am sure you'd be able to talk the elders into giving you anything. Saburo's response was a bit grating for you to hear, but they'd surely get to speak about that later. Money. This village is willing to pay you a good sum if you agree to leave without taking any more lives. As a bounty hunter, you surely appreciate wealth. You interjected from the side, knowing that Saburo wasn't going to say anything to benefit their village. I am not interested in your wealth. More like, I've already stolen most of it. I want techniques, jutsu, as many as you can give me, including this formation. The red dot spoke out with a grin. A bounty hunter doesn't want money. You was completely flabbergasted by that fact alone. Ken requesting techniques off of them was even more insulting. Our jutsu and techniques are our bread and butter. We can't afford to give all of our secrets to a bounty hunter. We've not even managed to recover our secret techniques from that stupid thief. Yu was feeling livid at that point, but he couldn't snap at Ken either, as they truly didn't have any leverage over the bounty hunter. As much as you hated it, Saburo was completely right when saying the elders would give him anything to just leave them alone. Jutsuhu? 
Sounds manageable, but you obviously won't get all of the ones in this village. Saburo smiled calmly, clearly not bothered by the situation at all. Let's make this simple, I want at least 2 S rank, at least 20 A rank, and of the rest, I want at least 30 to 40 each. Ken's words immediately serve to give you a brain aneurysm. That's outrageous. A bounty hunter asking for this many techniques. Plenty of voices around seemed shocked and livid at Ken's request. Many were also confused, but in truth, no one really dared to refuse Ken's requests at that point. Saburo simply narrowed his eyes. So you're building an organization, huh? His voice was lower than before, only Ken managing to catch it. You'll find out soon. How does my request sound though? Ken's long hair danced in the wind along with his burnt and tattered cloak. Well, the village can provide you with copies for a few techniques. There aren't that many S-rank techniques in this village, so you won't be able to pick and choose. But I'm guessing you aren't requesting specific techniques. Saburo stroked his chin, trying to think more about Ken's words. I'll find out soon, huh? This does sound promising. Saburo was already looking to cut ties with the already collapsing grass village. Getting a ticket to join an organization headed by a person on the level or close to the level of the five kages sounded great to the strawman. It was certainly going to be easier than trying to convince another small hidden village to accept him in their ranks. Indeed, as long as they have practicality I don't care what type of technique I get. The blind swordsman nodded as his body started transforming back into that of a human. Saburo raised an eyebrow when noticing that change, and smirked as he noticed that Ken was indeed not injured in any way. At least we managed to de-escalate the situation. Saburo was also quite glad that he didn't have to lose any more of his clones. The elders could also finally heave a sigh of relief when seeing him change back into a more human form. For one second, the thought of trying to kill Ken while his guard was down appeared in Yu's mind, but he wasn't willing to risk it and anger him again. Their losses were already substantial. Is that all, Red Dot? Saburo said as he smiled at the bounty hunter. For now. I will state any further requests after seeing this one fulfilled. Ken crossed his arms as he looked at the barrier surrounding him. Might as well take this down, since we're now on negotiating terms. Also, bring me my blade, I left it somewhere near the rubble. The blind swordsman tapped his leg on the ground a few times as he wondered how far he could push the village with his requests. It was clear that if he asked for too much they'd just try to kill him again. At that point, the shinobi were trying to get rid of him and cut their losses while they could still recover from them. They thankfully didn't know that he had already visited all of the clan bases and stolen all the money that he could find, otherwise, they would have fought to the death. Ken watched as the shinobi scrambled on the orders of the elders, some going to the library, while others looked for his blade. They were still unwilling to get close to him, but they did stop the formation. In the end, one shinboy came and brought Ken his blade. Yet another one of Saburo's clones. It only took around 10 minutes for the others to come back with a few dozen scrolls and manuals, it was clear that they were trying to just make Ken leave as quickly as possible. Saburo watched on as the grass village struggled to grant Ken's request. He could only sigh in disappointment at the pathetic state of the village he had been working with. He figured the village would try something, like placing a chakra tracking seal on some of the scrolls, but at the end of the day, it wouldn't help them in any way. Even if they tracked the red dot, he'd still just kill whoever they send after him. All in all, Saburo considered the situation quite shocking to witness. But he didn't show any of his emotions outwardly. After Ken placed all of the scrolls and manuals in a sealing scroll of his own and stored everything in the seal on his wrist, he looked back at Saburo, who just smiled. So he won't even look over them, huh? I guess he doesn't care what techniques he gets from us, a bit irresponsible, but he may have his reasons. So, is there anything else you need, or are you prepared to leave? Saburo said with that same smile on his face. Ken could almost hear the teeth of Elder Yu filing against each other. The Elder was looking pointedly at Saburo, almost wanting to stab him with his gaze. Why the hell would you ask if he needs anything else? Just tell him to leave. Alas, it was already too late for him to interject, as Ken started speaking while he was still busy ripping out what little hair he had left. One last request. I want you to either join me or give me your technique. Ken smiled widely as he spoke, making Saburo narrow his eyes once more. The strawman couldn't help but raise an eyebrow at how forward the bounty hunter was, though he didn't really mind. A leader should have at least this much confidence. Unfortunately, my technique requires a specific bloodline limit to work. Only members of my already extinct clan would be able to use it. The strawman shrugged a bit, not bothering to lie to the bounty hunter, his technique was something specific to him, and he was neither willing nor able to share it. This is not acceptable. Asking for our umbu captain to join you is overstepping your boundaries. 
You from the side immediately protested, not willing to part with the only failsafe their village had left in case they got attacked. Saburo was far too valuable for them to just part ways with easily. Unfortunately for them, Saburo was far from loyal to their village. I am willing to follow you as long as you are able to provide me with the proper resources to continue my studies and rituals. Saburo surprisingly agreed with Ken's requests without much hesitation. Of course, you will have plenty of resources, of that I assure you. Even more so than in this village. Ken simply nodded, quite pleased with the answer. The elders and nearby shinobi were flabbergasted to hear that. Their morale was already low, now it was just reaching rock bottom. Saburo? What is the meaning of this? You asked loudly as his throat turned red, his voice bubbling with rage and frustration. A man must know when to cut his losses, elder you. No reason for someone that isn't the captain or related to him to hang around a sinking ship. Saburo didn't seem to care about the morale of the village's shinobi at all anymore, Ken couldn't help but chuckle a bit when hearing how cruel he was. But that cruelty helped the blind swordsman assess the strawman's character a bit better. This will be a purely business relationship. This man has no loyalty to give. Alas, I don't need loyalty from him, I just need his services and expertise. The grass village refuses this offer. The elder stared hatefully at Ken and Saburo now, his eyes turning bloodshot from rage as his pulse pounded audibly. At least for Ken. Hmm? Well then, I guess I'll just cut ties with the grass village directly. Saburo simply shrugged, nonchalantly betraying the village and annoying the elder further. Ambu captain. Please reconsider. After everything the village has done for you. Plenty of shinobi started doing their best to urge the strawman to remain. Former friends and acquaintances pleaded with him to remain, to not leave their village in such dire straits. But Saburo knew of no friendship, to him the grass village was just a means to an end. And now that mean was looking like it wouldn't be able to help him achieve his end anymore. Elder Yu was well aware of that. He wasn't stupid enough to think that someone like Saburo treated the friendship and camaraderie they instilled into their child soldiers seriously. You aren't allowed to leave. All troops, capture Saburo and his Umbu SQU dash, Yu was quick to try and give an order, but he was immediately surrounded by four different masked shinobi, all of them holding blades to his throat and arms, close enough to cut the skin. The close proximity prevented him from performing any jutsu, and it also made the other shinobi present unable to interfere, as they were milliseconds away from killing one of the few elders left in their village. One wrong move and you die here. One of the shinobi spoke in a cold tone, pressing his blade close to the elder's neck without any hesitation. You simply gulped a bit as he cursed the carelessness of his troops. Alas, they had no way of knowing that Saburo's squad was just filled with clones. Only a small percentage of shinobi were privy to that knowledge, and most of them were either dead or injured at that point. Yes, all four of the shinobi were Saburo's clones, the rest of the clones rushed into the center of the shinobi encirclement and formed another smaller circle, shielding Saburo and Ken. To the others, it looked like Saburo's Umbu squad was also defecting with him. There seemed to be around 24 of them left, but Ken did notice Saburo sending a few of them away during the fight, so their number was likely a bit bigger than that. Confusion and outrage spread throughout the grass shinobi. And Yu was sweating heavily, the veins on his forehead had already popped as the clone seemed to be intent on stopping him from acting. I will be taking my squad and leaving. I don't want to kill any of my former comrades, so don't follow me. Saburo narrowed his eyes as he looked at the surrounding shinobi. The strawman tugged at the heartstrings of the grass shinobi, Ken was a bit impressed by the level of bullshit that Saburo was spewing. Comrades? Bah! Didn't know this guy was also a comedian. Although Ken found it funny, that was just because he had already figured Saburo to be a shrewd and opportunistic sociopath. The other shinobi were still coming to terms with his departure, so they were seemingly hesitant. Saburo didn't look at any of them as he walked past, the grass shinobi seemed to just stand there and look at each other with despair in their eyes. In the end, they could only make way for Ken and Saburo's clones to leave the village. You are quite decent at manipulating others. Ken said in a low tone as he continued to walk, just making conversation with his new member. Hmm? I'll take that as a compliment. Saburo simply nodded, a calm smile on his face as all of his clones followed suit. It was a compliment, Ken said as he and the clone stepped out of the front gate of the village. The four clones that were holding the elder hostage also tried to flee after Ken and the rest of the clones managed to depart from the village. But the elder wasn't about to just let them leave. The enraged elder you immediately trapped them all in overgrown grass and thorny vines, his teeth cracking in anger as he started barking orders again. Kill them! The elder shouted, taking out his rage on the clones that had almost taken his life. 
The shinobi around him seemed to look at each other for a few seconds, before listening to his orders and burning all of the clones alive using a few fireballs. The clones stood eerily still, not even bothering to protect themselves as they started burning alive. Such a scene managed to further unnerve the people present. The rest of Saburo's clones didn't even bother to turn around and look at them, as they had already left the village gates. Yu, in the end, was just left with four burnt corpses that had once been Saburo's clones, an extremely demoralized ragtag group of shinobi, and a few buildings to rebuild. The angry elder took a few deep breaths to calm down. He wasn't stupid enough to pursue Saburo outside of the village. Ken was also with him, so it was impossible for their village to attack the strawman. For now, announce to the world that Saburo is a missing mean, he is to be branded a criminal. You spoke in a much calmer voice, he was still confident that the village wouldn't fall, even if they were bound to have to suck up to a higher power. Eh sir? The enemy must have brainwashed Sir Saburo. There's no way he'd do something like th dash and injured Jonin to the side tried to plead for Saburo, it seemed that the poor shinobi was likely fooled by the strawman's act. There were plenty of people like him, Saburo had spent a good decade in that village, so plenty of people were able to get accustomed to him and befriend him. You was hearing none of it though. Don't kid yourself. Saburo is just a criminal now. I don't want to hear anything else. The elder didn't care to explain that they had all been fooled by a sociopath. He only gave them the orders and continued on with his work. At least we still have the funds to rebuild. We need to do a quick inventory of everything and recover everything from the collapsed Kage building. You was quick to get to work. Unfortunately for him, their funds had just happened to disappear. Well, not all of them, a part of their finances was kept in the Kage building, but the bulk of it was spread out throughout all the clans in the village. You ordered everyone to do a quick check on their resources, he now controlled them since all the clan heads were now dead, and he was to manage their finances until new leaders were appointed. He received the report that everything was gone rather quickly. Even the funds from his compound were gone, and he had amassed significant wealth there. The last hair on Yu's head fell out when he heard that report, he was left completely shell-shocked by it. But it didn't take long for him to realize where those funds may have disappeared to. Curse that bounty hunter? Not interested in our wealth my ass. You looked at the wrecked state of their village with empty eyes, his mind wondering how exactly to avoid total destruction. But one thought surfaced in his mind. I won't forget this, Red Dot, Saburo. Both of you will pay for this. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.